Section 0. A Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pinchcliffe. A Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Preface. So far as I am aware, there is no recent general work of a comprehensive kind dealing with the Cetacea in the English language. There are, of course, sections devoted to this group in many natural histories, such as the Royal Natural History of Mr. Lydecker, Castle's Natural History, the Standard Natural History, etc., as well as the long section contained in Sir William Flower and Mr. Lydecker's Mammals Recent and Extinct. I think, therefore, that there is, at present, a distinct gap to fill on behalf of those who would have, in a comparatively small compass, a general account of this group of mammals, and a selection of the voluminous literature which relates to that group. I have attempted to perform this task, and to steer a course between too much exposition of technical facts and a too popular account of whales. I have aimed at producing a solid book tempered by anecdote. It need hardly be pointed out that this book is not a monograph of the Cetacea, but on the other hand, I hope that at least the main facts of structure and mode of life of these creatures will be found in the following pages. Whales are, from many points of view, so interesting and remarkable a group of animals that no apology is, in my opinion, needed for devoting a whole volume to them. It may be suggested, however, that, desirable though a book devoted to whales may be, it has not a place in a series like the Progressive Science series, which is devoted to the exposition of larger subjects than the present appears at first sight to be. It has, however, been my attempt in the present volume to endeavour to illustrate, by means of the group of whales, a very important biological generalisation, the intimate relation between structure and environment. No group shows this in a more striking degree than that with which I have occupied myself. The section on the Delphinidae will, I fear, be found less interesting than those relating to other subdivisions of the whale tribe. They are not, as a rule, sufficiently well known to have accumulated much anecdote, and the structural differences present nothing of importance save to the systematist. However, it is clearly necessary to include them, as they form the bulk of the known cetaceans. Their synonymy, too, is perplexing and far from settled. I have, as will be seen, followed True in the main, adopting some subsequent alterations of his views. As the present volume is not in any sense a catalogue of whales, I have forborne from giving a synonymy in the orthodox way but I have mentioned most of the names which have been at one time or another applied to dolphins. Those who desire to pursue this portion of the subject further can refer to Mr. True's account of the family Delphinidae, which is frequently referred to in the text. I may remark, finally, that a large number of the actual facts have been verified, and that here and there some small details appear which have not been hitherto recorded. This is the end of the preface. Section 1. A Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pinchcliffe. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Introductory. The subject of which the present volume treats is undoubtedly one of interest to the general public, as well as to the naturalist. The huge size of many of these creatures, the rarity of the occurrence of some of them, and the mystery which envelops the habits of the great bulk of the species is attractive. Besides, to many people, the whale is an ingenious paradox, by reason of the fact that it lives in the water and yet is not a fish. At no more remote a date than 1895, thought Professor Huxley, this question of the fish-like nature of whales was not settled for many persons. 
Such persons, however, had on their side the naturalists of the 16th and even the 17th centuries who classified whales with fish. Even so recently as 1818, I quote from Sir William Flower, the current edition of Johnson's Dictionary defined a fish as an animal inhabiting the water, hence a whale, undoubtedly coming under the definition, would be classified by the author of that dictionary as a fish. To the naturalist, the remarkable adaptation to its mode of life with the resultant fish-like form is no less interesting. But no competent zoologist has any longer any doubt of the mammalian character of the cetacea. It is even possible to assert that whales are remote from some of the existing and vanished groups of mammals. But the exact affinities of these creatures is a matter which is still disputed. There is thus a field for speculation, which at present has hardly any limits. In cases of this kind, new and important evidence may be forthcoming at any minute, which lends a particular fascination to the study of this group, much more than to the study of these groups whose affinities are more thoroughly known. The existing knowledge of this group is very far from being complete. From the nature of the case, whales are exceedingly difficult to investigate. The opportunities for dissection are particularly confined to stranded specimens, and the stranding of whales is not an everyday occurrence. Obvious difficulties, moreover, hamper the naturalist, who is so fortunate as to receive timely information of the stranding of a desired specimen. On the other hand, there is much more accumulated knowledge concerning the skeleton of Cetacea. But even here there are many regrettable lacunae, not only by reason of the frequent imperfections of the skeletons, but also because of the sheer lack of material in the case of many forms, particularly among the dolphins. The often fragmentary character of the available Cetacean remains and the consequent and necessary inability to distinguish between what might be fairly regarded as real, specific, or generic differences, and what were mere variations, led the late Dr. Gray to create a vast number of species and genera of whales. Comparatively few of those new forms which he instituted are now allowed by the students of this group. Though doubtless a good many forms remain for identification and establishment, the total number of real species and genera of whales is a comparatively small one. This is itself an inducement to the study of the order, since it is possible to acquire a general knowledge of the whole group. The naturalist, who hopes to have a thorough acquaintance with such an order as that of the Rodentia, has much work before him. The student of the Cetacea, on the other hand, has to deal with not more than 35 genera and, at most, 80 species. It will be attempted to give the bulk of what is known concerning all of these in the present volume. End of introductory. Section 2 of the Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sally Sharp at www.soundsharp.com. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Section 2 A Book of Whales. Chapter 1. The External Form of Whales. Size of Whales. Since the most obvious characteristic of the whale tribe is their large, occasionally colossal bulk, we cannot do better than commence with this salient peculiarity. Whales vary in length from barely four feet, pontoporia, to as much as 80 or 85, balaenoptera, Sibaldi. But their dimensions have been grossly exaggerated by modern writers, as well as by the ancients, for whom there was more excuse. It is an unquestionable fact that no creature known to science ever existed, which was larger than the largest whale. Even the colossal dinosaurs of the secondary epoch, 
fell some feet short of Balaenoptera sibaldi. As a consequence, size is the one thing that is expected of a whale. Actual length measurements have been swollen by taking into account the bulging sides of the Katakians, and with this help some astounding dimensions have received the sanction of not specially credulous persons. One Ochther, a Norwegian, reported to King Alfred that the best whales caught in his own country were as much as fifty yards long. This is some diminution from Pliny, who held that in the Indian Sea the fish called balina or whirlpool is so long and broad as to take up more length and breadth than two acres of ground. Nine hundred feet is another measurement given by the same natural historian, but the size of whales by no means decreased with the advance of the centuries. Olaus Magnus allowed 960 feet in length to certain hirsute whales, but when the latter authority comes down to definite and recorded fact, he is more careful with such measurements. In a section of his well-known work, Olaus Magnus figures a monstrous Pisces, stranded on the northern shores of England in the year 1532, which was naturally regarded as a portent. This animal, or another, seen by the archbishop on the Norwegian shore, was ninety feet in length, a measurement which may conceivably have been accurate, since it seems to have been a balaenoptera, which is known to reach eighty-five feet in length. Apart, however, from all exaggeration, it is evident that whales are not only the largest of living mammals, but the largest of all animals, mammalian or otherwise, which have ever existed. It is interesting to inquire into the reasons for their excess of bulk over the animal world in general. There are various causes which seem to contribute to the acquisition of a mighty frame. In the first place, the medium in which the animal lives must have something to do with it. Aquatic creatures have naturally less difficulty in sustaining a colossal bulk than have animals which live in a less dense medium. We find, in fact, a distinct relation between size and habitat. The blue shark, Carcharius, remarked the late Professor Milnes Marshall, attains a length of 25 feet. Specimens of Carcharodon have been measured over 40 feet in length, while of the genus Rhinodon, examples of 50, 60, or even 70 feet in length have been described. Purely volant animals, bats, birds, and pterodactyls have far greater difficulties in sustaining themselves in the air. Hence, these classes of animals are relatively small. We may believe in Ipiornis, but we cannot accept a flying rock. The middle position is occupied by mammals, which require more muscular effort to stand or crawl than aquatic creatures but not nearly so much as aerial. We find that their size is in correspondence. The mastodon and the great ground sloths were larger than any pterodactyl or bird, but not so large as whales. The dinosaurs are thought by some to have been at least partially aquatic, to have frequented at least marshes and estuaries. But even if they were purely terrestrial, they do not acquire absolutely the same colossal dimensions as do some whales. Not so intelligible as the last reason for enormous growth in size, but apparently to be proved by statistics, is the inference that large size is in proportion to the degree of organization of the creature. The simplest of all living creatures, the protozoa, are at the same time the smallest. 
vertebrates grow to a larger size than invertebrates, and finally mammals, as represented by whales, grow to be the giants of the animal creation. Another favoring circumstance to large increase in size is abundance and easiness of capture of food, as well as freedom from foes. The tiger or lion, at the expense of great expenditure of force, hunts down an antelope or a deer, while the whale gulps in huge mouthfuls of whale food with ease and comfort. Protected by its thick covering of fat, it does not readily fall a victim to any foes. Indeed, the only powerful enemy that it has at all is the killer whale, orca, and it is not always that a Greenland whale succumbs to a shoal of those marine tigers. An ingenious suggestion has been made which covers some of the apparent exaggerations in the dimensions of whales attributed to the ancients. Monsieur Pouchet thinks that, since in old times whales were not hunted, at any rate to the extent that they are now and have been lately, they may possibly have had the opportunity of growing to larger dimensions. The sailor, Nearchus, is quoted by M. Pouchet upon the size of a megaptra of the Persian Gulf. Perhaps the megaptra indica of M. Gervais referred to below. The Greek described it as 48 meters, but another rendering of the text says 23 meters, which, though large, is nearer to what we now regard as the truth. Shape of the Body In their shape, whales present a remarkable uniformity. Indeed, next to bulk, this is perhaps their most salient characteristic in the popular mind. They are all fish-like, with tapering body big flukes, one pair of paddles, no apparent vestiges of hind limbs, no external ear, tiny eyes, and black or black and white coloration. Contrast the state of affairs with what obtains in many other groups of mammals. Compare the sloth and the anteater, near allies in structure to each other. One is tailless, long-limbed, short-snouted, inactive, inconspicuously colored, and with long hooked claws. The other is bushy-tailed, comparatively short-limbed, enormously long-snouted, vigorous in its motions, conspicuous in color, owing to the broad white band upon its black body, and with strong tearing claws. Or, to take an example from another group of animals, what a large difference seems to separate the active, four-legged, brightly colored green lizard from the snake-like, inactive, dully colored blind worm. And yet, they are very closely allied. But one very important reason for diversity in the two examples selected, and for uniformity in the case of the whales, will at once strike the reader. The whales live under like conditions. The other animals lead totally different lives. The sloth never leaves the trees to whose branches it clings by the help of its long curved claws, and upon whose leaves it browses. The anteater digs up with its sharp claws the firmly welded ant hills of tropical America, and licks up with its long tongue the ants which it thus disturbs. Whales, on the other hand, not only all live in the sea or in rivers, but spend a great deal of their time below the surface, and are nearly all animal feeders. Moreover, it seems to be a well-established fact that the majority of whales range freely over wide stretches of ocean, the same species occurring in such widely separated localities as Tasmania and the coast of Britain, e.g. the sperm whale, while some perform regular migrations. Hence, diverse temperatures can have but little effect in producing differences. It is an interesting fact to note 
that those whales which are restricted in their range are at least often more different from their allies. The members of the family Platanistidae are restricted in range and show differences among themselves. No one could confound the Platanista of the Ganges with Inia of the Amazons. Beluga and Monodon are peculiar types, and they are both Arctic in habitat. We cannot, however, push this matter further, since, as is the case with most general statements, there are exceptions. Among those exceptions, we may note the Greenland right whale, which differs but slightly from the widely distributed Belina australis, or Biscayanus, as it is sometimes called. The flukes of the whale, which form its tail, are set, as everyone knows, at right angles to the plane of the body, and not vertically, as in fishes. It has been noticed by several that the two halves of the tail fin have surfaces which are not precisely parallel to each other. They have, in fact, a screw-like form, one half being convex upwards, the other concave, and the use of the flukes seems to imply such a conformation. Captain Scoresby observes of the Greenland whale that it is by means of the tail, principally, that the whale advances through the water. The greatest velocity is produced by powerful strokes against the water, impressed alternately upward and downward, but a slower motion, it is believed, is elegantly produced by cutting the water laterally and obliquely downward in a similar manner as a boat is forced along with a single oar in the operation of sculling. It is the latter motion, of course, that would be brought about by the slightly screw-like form of the tail fin. The tail, however, is also used in balancing, as a whale when dead falls over on its side. They are also of service in turning, and, indeed, as a weapon of offense for striking boats. This seems to be deliberate in the case of the Californian whale. A dissection of the tail shows a beautiful and elaborate complex of tendons which are attached to the muscles of the trunk. These run in all directions and so account for the varied movements of the organ. There are diverse opinions as to the nature of the whale's tail. The late Dr. Gray was strongly of opinion, as are or were some others, that this organ is to be looked upon as the degenerate equivalent of the posterior pair of limbs. It must be admitted that there is a prima facie possibility in favor of this view, which is not unattractive. We should have, on this hypothesis, the whales exhibiting the last term of a series commenced by the sea lions. It has also been pointed out that the backwardly directed rudiments of the bony hind limbs conform to such a way of regarding the matter. It seems as if they had shrunk while the folds of the integument originally connected with them had remained, forming the flukes. There are not wanting analogies to support this theory. It is known, for instance, that there are, as a rule, fewer retrices, tail feathers, in modern birds than in Archaeopteryx, where each of the free caudal vertebrae supported a pair of these strong feathers. In modern birds, the retrices are all attached to the terminal plowshare bone of the tail, which is produced by a fusion of not more than six or seven vertebrae. Now, as there are occasionally more than six or seven pairs of retrices, it looks much as if the epidermal structures had remained, while the corresponding skeletal structures had vanished. Again, to take an example from a widely different class, 
there is a lamprey with a pair of skin folds in the neighborhood of the vent which are believed by some to represent a pair of otherwise missing hind limbs apart from these folds there is no trace of limbs no skeletal elements that is to say plausible though such a derivation of the flukes of the whale may be there are arguments which seem to be absolutely fatal to their entertainment the tale of foncina communis when it first appears is a prolongation of the body sharply marked off from the body and precisely so far like the tail of a typically tailed and terrestrial mammal this tail has at first practically no lateral flanges when these put in an appearance they are obviously lateral expansions of the integument and the tail has a diamond-shaped outline it is indeed not unlike that of a manatee in general shape it is interesting to note this fact for the manatee is clearly an animal whose ancestors were less remotely terrestrial in habit finally the characteristic flukes of the adult are acquired but the argument which seems to conclude the matter is that in this same porpoise coincidentally with the appearance of the lateral flanges of the tail the supposed hind limbs be it remembered distinct traces of those same hind limbs are visible in their proper place that is to say considerably in front of the tail if a further argument in the same direction be wanted it is afforded by the analogy of the ichthyosaurus these aquatic reptiles have been lately discovered to have possessed a dorsal fin not unlike that of the whales and a caudal fork which unlike that of the whales was vertical in direction now the ichthyosaurus had undoubted hind limbs so that there can be no question of any correspondence here the fact therefore that the whale's tail unlike that of the fish is at right angles to the axis of the body and so far resembles the complex tail of the seal is no argument even from analogy in favor of its having a limb-like character the ichthyosaurus has no more right to a tail than the whale save by virtue of its being an aquatic creature the tail is in both a secondary adaptation to the needs of their existence we must look as dr kukenthal remarks to the broad tail of the beaver for an analogy to the flukes of the whale it is however somewhat astonishing to find that the whale unlike the ichthyosaurus which is with equal certainty derived from a terrestrial ancestor has transverse tail fins astonishing since the universality of a vertical fin in fish seems to argue its greater use as a swimming organ the only conclusion to which this question seems to lead is that reptiles that are not so thoroughly modified for an aquatic life as the ichthyosaurus and are yet largely or entirely aquatic such as crocodiles and sea snakes have a vertically compressed tail while among mammals it is generally flattened from above downwards in such forms instances of this being the beaver and the platypus but this is not universal only prevalent for in the west african insectivore otter potamogale we have a vertically compressed tail it is possible that we may be justified in putting the question out of the category of a whale question by adopting the belief that whales have been derived from sirenian like ancestors perhaps the ingenious ray was nearer the truth when he wrote that quote, in catachias fishes the tail hath a different position 
from what it hath in all other fishes for whereas in these it is erected perpendicular to the horizon in them it lies parallel thereto partly to supply the use of the hinder pair of fins which these creatures lack and partly to raise and depress the body at pleasure for it being necessary that these fishes should frequently ascend to the top of the water to breathe or take in and let out the air it was fitting and convenient that they should be provided with an organ to facilitate their ascent and descent as they had occasion End quote. There can indeed be no reasonable doubt but that this is an important function of the whale's tail. It remains under water for a long time, until the air taken in by respiration is exhausted. It must then rapidly ascend to the surface, perhaps from a great depth, to take in a fresh supply. An air-breathing creature must be in touch with the air. A powerful series of strokes with the flukes would cause it to ascend with great rapidity. But the ichthyosaurus was also an air-breathing creature, at least so we must assume from its place in the class of reptiles. It is, of course, conceivable, even probable, that it may have possessed accessory respiratory organs in the shape of vascular fringes, such as certain aquatic tortoises have at the present day but no doubt can exist as to the possession of lungs. Therefore, the extinct fish lizard must also have come to the surface of the Cretaceous seas to spout. But its tail is fish-like in its verticalness, and if we are to suppose that it resembled the whale in its diving and ascending to the surface, it is difficult to understand how it is that the tail is not made after the best pattern for effecting such movements. As a matter of fact, it seems, according to Professor Alborn, that the ichthyosaurus tail was suitable to a life of constant interchange between air and water, but in a different way from that of the whale. Dr. Alborn has remarked in a recent and highly interesting paper that the ichthyosaurus and the shark stand in regard to their tail at the two opposite poles of aquatic creatures. They both possess what is termed in the fish a heterocircle tail. This kind of tail is marked by the fact that the backbone is continued into the edge of the actual tail fin, the upper edge in the case of the shark, the lower edge in the reptile so that in both cases the bulk of the actual fin itself lies either above or below the strengthening bar of bones and cartilages. It is suggested that the epibati or hypobati of the tail corresponds to a different function in the two cases. In the shark, the movements of the body generally and of the tail would tend to move the fish downwards, in the hypobatious tail, the movements of the tail would raise it and thus depress the head, and in consequence the direction of progression would be away from the air, a state of affairs which is precisely what the shark would want. On the other hand, the same movements of the epibatous tail would tend to direct the course of the reptile towards the surface of the water, so that, after all, the ichthyosaurus has a tail which is as useful, or nearly so, for enabling its possessor to get quickly to the top of the water, as are the horizontal flukes of the whale. Dorsal fin Most whales have a fin on the dorsal side of the body, nearer to the posterior than to the anterior end of the body. The resemblance of this fin to the similarly placed dorsal fin of fishes is obvious. It has even been asserted that there are two dorsal fins in some whales, but the existence of a second and of a fish-like anal fin seems to be purely mythical. This fin is especially analogous to the fatty fin of the salmonoid fishes. It is not, however, present in all whales. 
and when present is of very varying size according to kukenthal the fin is not present in the young embryo of those whales which will eventually have a fin but it is represented by a long dorsal fold reaching back to the flukes this structure appears to persist in monodon the series of low irregular humps which take the place of the dorsal fin in the sperm whale may also be ascribable to the retention of an embryonic condition in delphinapterus and neomeris which are finless in the adult condition there is simply a low ridge in the embryo there is an ascending series in length of the dorsal fin when it is fully present as in most delphinidae which culminates in orca where the fin is so large as to sometimes lie over at the top to one side so high and pointed is the dorsal fin of this fierce cetacean that it has been figured as a sharp horn capable of sticking into the body of the whalebone whale which this creature persecutes the function of the dorsal fin seems to be that of a balancing organ and it is important to notice that it is at its largest in the swift and carnivorous orca dr murie is inclined to see in the dorsal fin a representative of the hump or humps of the camels and zebu such evidence as there is of the existence of two dorsal fins consists in the first place of some observations made by messieurs coy and gaimard during the voyage of the french ship Irénie. the testimony of such observers must not be lightly rejected it will be better to leave them to tell their own tale Quote, in the month of october eighteen nineteen going from the sandwich islands to new south wales we saw in latitude five point two eight n a number of dolphins performing their rapid evolutions round the ship everybody on board was surprised to see as we did on the forehead a horn or fin curved backwards similar to that upon the back the size of the animals was about double that of the common porpoise and the upper surface as far as the dorsal fin was spotted black and white we carefully examined these dolphins for the whole time that they accompanied us but although they passed close enough to touch the prow of our corvette having the highest part of the body out of the water their head was so deeply plunged below the surface that monsieur arago the draughtsman of the expedition and we ourselves were unable to distinguish whether the snout was long or short End quote. they called this animal le dauphin rhinoceros the relation of these gentlemen gains support from some observations of raffinesque who recorded a dolphin from the sicilian coast also with two dorsal fins and which he named Monctore. further than this mr couch was informed that a dolphin with two dorsal fins had been observed in april eighteen fifty seven on the coast of cornwall these dolphins or whatever they were must however remain problematical for the time being but there is clearly a case which cannot be absolutely ignored and there is no inherent improbability especially when we remember the series of low humps upon the back of the cachalot end of section two recording by sally sharp of soundssharp dot com section three of the book of whales this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 1, Part 2. 
the pectoral fin. The flippers of the whale correspond, of course, to the anterior pair of limbs in other vertebrates. Whales have only the rudiments of posterior appendages. The limbs vary much in length and shape, being sometimes rounder and sometimes longer and narrower. The tip may or may not be curved round the appendage, in the former case acquiring a falcate form. The limbs of whales do not seem to be much used for progression. They are rather used as balancers, and thus resemble the anterior fins of fishes. Scoresby studied the action of the fins through a telescope, and came to the conclusion that they were balancers, and besides, when a whale is dead, it heals over onto the side, a fact which seems to be a further proof that this is the function of the flippers. The superficial likeness of the whale's flippers to the fish fin has been mentioned. It is excitingly interesting to find that there are deeper seated likenesses. These are, of course, coupled with essential similarities to the hand of the mammalia, and by comparing the two series of facts with each other, and with the fact derived from the study of other aquatic creatures, such as the seals on the one hand, and aquatic reptiles, such as Ichthyosaurus on the other, it seems possible to extricate characters that are due to the aquatic mode of life. It will be necessary, however, to preface the description of the actual facts in the structure of whales, with which we are concerned in the present chapter, with a brief account of the essential likenesses and the essential unlikenesses between the fins of fishes and the limbs of higher vertebrates. The fins of fishes consist of a number of cartilaginous pieces arranged in rows of which the proximal one to four are larger than the rest and articulate with the shoulder girdle or the pelvic girdle as the case may be. The cartilaginous or bony pieces are continued on at their ends by the horny fin rays which extend to the end of the fin. The number and arrangements of these various cartilages or bones is naturally subject to some differences in different fishes. It is not our object, however, here to do more than to call attention to the essential features in which the fins of fishes differ from the limbs of the vertebrates which lie higher on the scale. The fish fin is termed the ichthyopoterygium to distinguish it from the limbs of all vertebrates higher than the fishes which possess what is called the chiropterygium. The actual facts of difference are these. The chiropterygium or hand-like limb always consists of a proximal bone. The humerus or femur which alone articulates with the shoulder girdle or pelvic girdle. This is followed by two bones, the radius and ulna, in the hind limb, the tibia and fibula. After this follows the carpus or tarsus, composed of varying number of small bones or cartilages. Then follow the fingers or toes, composed of varying number of bones there are never more than five fully developed fingers or toes and often there are less but rudiments of one or two additional digits are believed to be represented by certain supplementary bones at the side of the first and of the last digit in the ichthyopterygium or fish fin there is no such clear distinction into the several regions which characterize the chiropterygium. The whole limb is shorter, and often two or more pieces articulate with a limb girdle. The distal cartilages are generally more numerous than five, 
but they are not so much subdivided as they are in the Chiropterygium into a series of pieces following one another. It is not possible in the Ichthyopterygium to recognize clearly the several regions of the Chiropterygium arm, forearm, wrist, digits. Now there are two points in which the whale's hand and arm have come to be slightly modified in the direction of the Ichthyopterygium. In the first place, the distinction between hand and arm is commencing to vanish. The proportions between the bones is not so unequal as in typical mammals. The radius and ulna are short bones, and there is less distinction between the bones of the carpus and ensuing metacarpus than is seen in the terrestrial mammals. This modification, however, has not gone very far. As may be seen from the drawing on page 25, it is still perfectly easy to distinguish the several elements of which the arm is made up. It follows from this that the hand proper is larger in comparison with the arm than it is in terrestrial mammals. This is precisely what is found in the Ichthyopterygium. We may regard, perhaps, the larger cartilages which articulate with the shoulder girdle as corresponding with the humerus, radius, and ulna. The commencing disappearance of marks of distinction between the different elements of the arm is, of course, correlated with the absence of a differentiation of function between its several parts. A broad fin, like that of a fish and of a whale, would be as efficient if there were an absolute similarity between its several cartilages as if there were a differentiation. The second point of likeness is not shown in all whales. In beluga, however, the last finger is divided into two fingers, Incompletely, it is true, but still the division is plain enough. This is a step in the direction of the polydactylus, fin of the fish. In no whale, however, is this feature of resemblance shown to a greater extent. Together with these points of likeness, not numerous or strong, it must be admitted are obvious points of difference. The increased surface of the whale's paddle, desirable in an organ used as a fin, is affected in a different way from the fin of a fish. In the whale, the area is increased not much by multiplication of the fingers, but by their spreading out in a divergent fashion, so as to require a larger skin area, and by the increase of their length caused by the reduplication of the finger bones. The phenomenon known as hyperphalangy is usually in whales. The typical mammalian foot or hand is composed of digits which have but three phalanges, the thumb indeed possessing but two. In whales the number of phalanges may reach so great a number as 17. In the fish fin, on the contrary, The required area is obtained, firstly, by the multiplication of rays, and secondly, by the continuation of the fin as an expansion supported by the horny or calcified fin rays, which have nothing to do with the cartilages of the fin, but are exoskeletal structures. Rarely, as in the batoid fishes, skates, the cartilages of the fins increase and the horny fin rays disappear. The closest analogy with the whales is offered by those extinct aquatic reptiles, the ichthyosauria. Like the whales, they are clearly to be derived from terrestrial reptiles. There is no suggestion that is at all tenable that they have sprung separately on their own account from fishes. Their hand is still further advanced than is that of the whale, but along the same lines. 
There are, it is true, only five fingers, of which the last is split into two, so far resembling the whales, but the number of phalanges is great in all these fingers. Not only is the hyperphalange of the ichthyosaurian manus more pronounced than is that of the cetacea, but the individual elements are less separable by their distinctive characters. A recognizable humerus is followed by a series of bones which can hardly be classified into radius and ulna, carpus and metacarpus, by their position and relations, so much alike are they in general appearance. But it must be noted that the number of phalanges in any given digit is not greater than what is to be met with among the whales. This, observes Professor Kukenthal, is a case of convergence of which no better example could be imagined. In two groups of animals so remote in the vertebrate series as are the whales and ichthyosaurus, we have a modification into a paddle which has proceeded along precisely the same lines only carried further in the reptile than the mammal. It will now be interesting to inquire to what degree the limbs of other aquatic animals that have been derived from terrestrial ancestors resemble the fins of the whales. We naturally turn, first of all, to the Sirenia and to the seals and sea lions. In comparing the pectoral limb of the whales with the ichthyopterygium and with the paddle of the ichthyosaurus, it was unnecessary to point out the absence of nails upon the former, for the presence or absence of these structures does not bear upon the question of comparison in the two cases. But the absence of nails must be mentioned in comparing the whale's flippers with the limbs of the manatees and sea lions. For the more perfect adaptation of the whales to an aquatic existence has led to the total disappearance in the adult of all traces of nails upon the digits. But Dr. Kukenthal has found rudiments of these structures in the fetus, as has also Liebock. These structures consist of thickening of the epidermis, which is situated above the last phalanx. Now, in the sea lions and seals, nails are very well developed, but they do not lie at the extremities of the digits to which they belong. They are situated some way in the front of the point, and the limb is continued beyond them as a cartilaginous rod, not divided up into separate phalanges. It seems, therefore, that this cartilaginous continuation, superadded to the bony phalanges which lie on the proximal side of it, can have nothing to do with the hyperphalange of the whales. But the explanation or attempted explanation of hyperphalangry is a manner which will be treated of presently. As to the manatee, nails are present or absent, evidently, therefore, on the wane, as might be expected in marine or at least aquatic animals, which have been longer denizens of the rivers and sea than have the sea lions. Longer in all probability, that is to say, since their adaptation to the aquatic life is more complete. Manatus inunguis is so named on the account of total absence of nails upon the hands. This has happened noted by several writers, and there can be no doubt about the matter. Now it is precisely in the group of the Sirenia that hyperphalange is also met with, but to a very small extent, nothing like what we find among the whales. Finally, among the amphibia, the same phenomenon is met with, 
so that the occurrence of hyperphalangy may, as it seems, be fairly set down to the need for an increased surface of hand to form a competent paddle. A very singular fact about this hyperphalangy in the whales is the existence of more numerous phalanges in the young than in the adult. Thus, in Phocaena communis, the phalangeal formula of an embryo 7 cm long is 1, 3, 2, 8, 3, 9, 4, 5, 5, 4 of an adult. 2, 8, 6, 4, 2 are the figures. This looks as if the adaptation to an aquatic life had, as it were, at first overshot the mark, the reduction taking place later, that the creatures started with too ample a provision for its needs to be later curtailed. Or, indeed, it seems more likely that the pectoral fin was originally a swimming organ and is now reduced to a mere balancer. The degenerating muscles argue the same way. The hand muscles of Balenoptera musculus are in all four. On the exterior side, i.e. the back of the hand, is a single extensor, the extensor communis digitorum. This has a short muscular head arising between the radius and ulna. It soon passes into tendon, and on the wrist divided into four tendons, one for each finger. On the opposite side of the hand are three muscles. Two of these, the flexor profundis digitorum and the flexor longus pollicis, join together by their tendon and then split up into four tendons for the four digits. The fourth muscle is the flexor carpi ulnaris. It runs from the ulna to the pisiform bone in the wrist. We should therefore consider the pectoral fin as an organ which has undergone a change of function. Originally a paddle, large size, mainly brought about by hyperphalangy, was necessary to it. The assumption of this function by the tail led to a reduction in the hand, which has progressed very much further in some whales than in others. Hind limb. Traces of a hind limb have been found in many whales. It is possibly represented in all, but it has not been discovered in a good many. Of all whales whose structure is known best, the hind limb is less reduced in Balena mystecetus. This is rather a curious fact in view of the usual opinion that the right whale, and indeed the whalebone whales, generally are the most modified of existing cetacea. Nevertheless, in that whale there is a single bone representing the pelvis, and there are in addition small pieces of a bone or cartilage which correspond respectively to the femur and to the tibia. The femur is ossified in some four to nine inches in length. The tibia is only cartilaginous. In the rorquals there is an instructive series of stages in the reduction of the hind limb. In Balenoptera musculus, the femur is represented by a spherical bony nodule, first discovered by Sir William Flower in B. borealis and B. nostrata. No traces of a femur appear to exist. The actual limb itself does not appear to be represented in the toothed whales. It is the general view that the curved bone, which is all that is left of the actual pelvis, is the homologue of only one of three bones, out of which 
each half of the pelvis is formed in terrestrial mammals. It is considered to be equivalent of the ischium mainly on the account of certain muscles which are attached to it. Added to this, stress has been laid on the fact that it ossifies from one center only and not from three, as might have been the case where it the equivalent of three bones, ilium, ischium, and pubis, which constitute the normal mammalian pelvis. Professor Delage has ingeniously argued in favor of the theory that the single bone of the cetacea represents the entire series in the ordinary mammals. The continuity of the partly bony, partly cartilaginous mass is not necessarily fatal to the view, for where there are three separate bones, not to mention the small cotyloid, the cartilage which they replace is at first perfectly continuous mass, and as to the appearance of but one center of ossification in this mass, which gradually invades the whole, or nearly the whole, it may be that prolonged investigation will show that there are other ossifications, and in any case it might be that the whole mass being so reduced had only room, so to speak, for one center of ossification. In any case, there is a considerable superficial similarity between the small pelvis of Balenoptera and the fully developed pelvis of other mammals. There is a forward extension suggestive of an ilium, a downward process which might do duty for a pubis and hollow in the middle of the bone, which is not at all unlike the glenoid cavity. In this, indeed, rudimentary femur is lodged. The question is interesting as a general example of what happens when reduction through degeneration takes place. We shall recur to it presently, and in the meantime deal with one or two other points in the structure of the hind limb. In Balenoptera musculus, the rudimentary femur is attached to the pelvis by two ligaments, one anterior and the other posterior. In these ligaments, rudiments of muscle appear in the shape of a few fibers. The actual correspondence of these muscles with those of terrestrial mammals depends, of course, on what view is taken of the homologies of ischium. If the pelvis is simply an ischium, then the arrangement of the bands of ligament would seem to show that of all femur left is the great trochanter, a process of that bone particularly well developed in many mammals. In Balena mysticetus, there are three recognizable slips of muscle. End of section three. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 4 of the Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 1, Part 3. Hair. One of the most universal definitions of the mammalia is the possession of hairy covering. No other animals have any epidermal structures which are strictly comparable to hairs, and hairs are present in almost all mammals. The whales, indeed, are the only exception to the universality of this statement, and they are, after all, only a partial exception. The white whale, beluga, and the narwhal, monodon, appear never to possess any hairs, 
either as adults or fetuses. But in many other species, hairs have been found to persist in the adult condition, sometimes in diminished numbers. In others, there are hairs in the fetus, but none in the adult animal. These hairs are, however, entirely limited, in every case, to the jaw region, and are so few that they can be, and have been, counted. Thus, in the common porpoise, there are but two on each side in the fetus. The adult Balenoptera borealis has, according to Dr. Collett, 26. Some additional facts will be found below in the systematic part of the present volume. The most noteworthy point, however, about these hairs, next to the scarcity of them, is the fact that they seem to be, in all cases, rudimentary. A careful investigation of the structure of the skin has shown Dr. Kukenthal that the hairs of whales are entirely without those small glands associated with the hairs in other mammals, and secreting an oily matter for the lubrication of the hairs. These sebaceous glands, as they are termed, are not found in Cetacea at all. Their absence clearly denotes a degeneration in the hairs. Now the question arises, is this loss of hair a matter of aquatic life? Is it in any way connected with their aquatic existence, or has it some other explanation? The usual view, of course, is that the hair is absent as not necessary to an aquatic animal. The use of hair is largely that of retaining the heat of the body. The loss of the heat in whales is prevented by the thick covering of blubber as well as by the thickness of the skin itself. Thus a hairy covering would be unnecessary and perhaps even in the way, though this is not so clear. For whales, as a rule, do not swim very fast, and many hairy creatures, like the otter, do swim with considerable rapidity. The whales are the most purely aquatic of all mammals, and they are undoubtedly the least hairy. There seems, therefore, to be some connection between the two facts. But it must be borne in mind that in the seals and sea lions there is an outer coating of fat, and yet the hair is retained, particularly, of course, in the species which furnish the seal skin of commerce, and which possesses a soft, thick underfur, as well as a coating of coarser hairs. Among aquatic mammals, however, there appears to be an undoubted tendency to lose the hairy coverings. Among the sea lions, some do not possess the soft underfur, which makes the pelages of their allies so valuable. The hair is with them apparently becoming reduced. Then we have the Sirenia, Manatee, Dugong, in which the hair has almost disappeared. The Walrus is another case in point, and so is the Hippopotamus but the latter instance is suggestive of another possible reason for the loss of the hairy covering in the whales. There are several ungulate types which have gradually got less hairy in the course of their evolution. The elephants of today contrast by their almost naked skin with the mammoth of the Pleistocene. The modern rhinoceros is hardly more hairy except, indeed, the Sumatran species. While there was contemporary with the mammoth, the hairy rhinoceros. Another division of the ungulates shows the same tendency. In the pig tribe, we have the largely hairless babirusa, as well as the hippopotamus already referred to. It is conceivable, therefore, that we have in the whales an exaggeration, of an angular tendency, and there are some who would derive the whales from an angulate ancestry, as we'll be pointing out in more detail in a future chapter. 
There is yet another possible explanation of the hairless condition of the whale tribe. Whales are at present smooth-skinned animals. A few exceptions will be dealt with on another page. But there is evidence which will be gone into on the page quoted that the ancestors of whales had dermal scutes forming an armature comparable to that of such a creature as the armadillo. Now in that animal the hairs have become reduced. They have been replaced by the scales, and there is no room for them except between the scutes. If the view be correct that the ancestral whales were creatures clothed with scutes, it is easy to see how the nude condition of the modern whales has been arrived at, for the original hairy covering would have been destroyed by the appearance of the scutes, and when these latter disappeared, the hair would not reappear. At any rate, that is a legitimate assumption. It must not, therefore, be assumed offhand that the absence of hairy covering in whales is a simple question of their aquatic life. Dermal Skeleton In smooth-skinned creatures like whales, without anything more than at most a vestige of the original mammalian hairy covering, it may appear at first somewhat unnecessary to devote a section to a subject with such a title as that selected to head the present page. Nevertheless, the interesting fact is true that in two whales, at any rate among living forms, considerable traces of a dermal armature exist, which seems to be fairly interpretable as a remnant of what seems to have been a more extensive armature of a similar kind in certain of the extinct zooglodonts. Some years ago, in 1865, the late Dr. Gray described from the shores of Margate a purpose which he regarded as new, and described under the name Focaena tuberculifera, on account of the fact that it possessed a series of spines on the upper edge of the dorsal fin. Dr. Gray was not then aware that the same character occurs in the common purpose that it had been noted so long ago as Pliny. The common porpoise, in fact, is marked by this character, as is also Phocaena spinipinis of Burmeister, and the allied, if not identical, genus Neomeris phocanoides. The latter animal has a more extensive series of these tubercles, which have been fully described by Dr. Kukenthal. There are several rows of them running along the back, this genus has no dorsal fin. From not far behind the head to a point not remote from the commencement of the tail. In Phocena spinipinis there are more numerous tubercles than in P. communis present on the back as well as on the front margin of the dorsal fin. Dr. Kukenthal has pointed out that these tubercles are especially large comparatively and obvious in the embryos of Neomeris, an important fact in view of the inheritance from a more completely armored ancestor. These tubercles have a form which is indicated in the accompanying figure, that is figure 7. There is more especially roughened area in the center of each. The general outline is squarish. As will be also seen in the figure, these structures are by no means unlike scales. But the term scale is one which is often used in more than one sense. It is necessary to inquire as to what kind of scales these integumental tubercles of the porpoises are to be likened to. The scales of a lizard or a snake are simply horny, thickenings of the epidermis. They are, therefore, not at all comparable to the scales of such a fish 
as the perch or pike, where the scales are calcified plates produced in the dermis lying below the epidermis. In other fishes, such as the sharks and rays, the scales are calcified structures produced by the joint activity of both epidermis and dermis. Professor Kuckenthal discovered that the rudimentary scales of the common porpoise are calcified and that the calcification is only met with in the dermis. It follows, therefore, that the rudimentary dorsal armature of the porpoise is comparable to the skin plates of an armadillo. To compare it with an animal that is nearer to it in the series than any type of reptile or fish. Now, although these structures are much reduced in the common porpoise, they are not really absolutely limited to the anterior margin of the fin as had been thought, for Professor Kuckenthal made the important observation that here and there scattered over the general body surface on the ventral as well as on the dorsal side were similar but rather more rudimentary tubercles. It thus appears a fair conclusion that we have to deal here with a creature which has descended from an armored ancestor such as an armadillo. By this supposition it is of course not meant that the whales are the offspring of creatures exactly like the armadillo or even referable to the same group of mammals, the edentata, which includes that form. It is merely meant to suggest that their ancestors were as completely armored as the armadillo. Nor is this a mere theory. It seems to be an undoubted fact that a fossil whale called by Johannes Müller Delphinopsis freieri has its body covered in many regions with small, closely set tubercles. These tubercles are described as being harder than stone, and they must be comparable to the comparatively feeble tubercles which the descendants of this whale and its allies have retained today. The blowhole. The blowhole or the blowholes where there are two separate orifices of the whale are, of course, its nostrils. They are situated on the top of the head, as a rule, some way behind the front of the head, except in the sperm whale. This is in accordance with the aquatic life. We see such diverse types as the crocodile and the hippopotamus, analogous arrangements of the nostrils, which allow of the animal coming to the surface to breathe and at the same time exposing the minimum of its person to possible enemies. The blowing or spouting of a whale is, of course, the act of expiration. It takes place as the whale reaches the surface or just before, after an immersion more or less prolonged. But the real nature of this process has received more than one false interpretation. Milton wrote, and probably many believe with him at the present day, of the whale who at his gills draws in and at his trunk spouts out a sea. Olaus Magnus figures the spouting of a very large whale as a means of offense. His cut represents what may be a sperm whale, maybe by reason of the teeth in the lower jaw only, a quite unnecessary frill of spines surrounds the head. But there are two sprouts which overwhelm a ship whose bulwarks the whale has seized in his jaws. The physeter, observes the writer, whose Latin we attempt to translate, raises itself above the masts of the ships and belches forth droughts of ocean from its blowholes in such a way that it overwhelms with this rainy cloud even the strongest ships or expose the sailors to the greatest danger. 
The older naturalists, including the Archbishop, from whom we have just quoted, regarded the blowholes as apertures additional to the nostrils. According to Professor Kuckenthal, it was the celebrated anatomist and embryologist Carl von Baer, who in 1826 first showed clearly from anatomical considerations that the whale could not spout forth a volume of sea water. The water which does actually leave the blowhole is simply the breath of the creature condensed, mingled often with a little of the surface water of the sea which the whale disturbs by commencing the act of expiration when still a little way beneath the surface of the water. Rapp, however, deservedly considered an authority upon the cetacea, went back to the earlier view and held that the spouting was a means of getting rid of abundant water taken in with the food. After this date, there were recurrences to the correct view and again lapses therefrom. There is now no doubt about the matter at all. As to the actual structure of the blowholes, there are some important facts which must be dealt with, though briefly. The internal part of the nose in a man and in other mammals serves an olfactory as well as a respiratory function. The sense of smell is there located. In the whales, this sense, as is evinced by the structure of the brain, is rudimentary or absent, and the nostrils, therefore, have but one function to perform, i.e., that of taking in and expelling respiratory air. Mosley, quote, notes of a naturalist on the challenger, unquote, describes the blowing of a humpback which followed the challenger for several days in the South Pacific. The appearance of a whale spout as seen from the level of the sea is very different from that which it has when seen from the deck of a ship. It appears so much higher and shoots up into the air like a fountain discharged from a very fine rose. The whale, of course, in reality, does not discharge water, but only its breath. This, however, in rushing up into the air, hot from the animal's body, has its moisture condensed to form a sort of rain, and the colder the air, just as in the case of our own breath, the more marked the result. When the spout is made with a blowhole clear above the surface of the water, it appears like a sudden jet of steam from a boiler. When effected, as it sometimes is, before the blowhole reaches the surface, a low fountain, as from a street fire plug, is formed, and when the hole is close to the surface, at the moment a little water is sent up with a tall jet of steam. The cloud blown up does not disappear at once, but hangs a little while, and is often seen to drift a short distance with the wind. The expiratory sound is very loud when heard close by, and is a sort of deep bass snort, extremely loud and somewhat prolonged. It might even be compared to the sound produced by the rushing of stream at high pressure from a large pipe. End of section 4. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 5 of The Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 2. Some Internal Structures. Part 1. Vertebral Column. The series of bones which constitute the vertebral column or backbone in the whales offer a number of peculiarities distinctive of the group. Like all other mammals, with inconsiderable exceptions, manatee, sloth, the neck vertebrae are but seven in all. But in the whales, these vertebrae are very generally partially or entirely fused together. 
the degree of fusion also varying from species to species. Hand in hand with this melting together of the vertebrae goes a thinning of the actual vertebrae themselves, so that the neck region of the cetacea is excessively short. They are the shortest necked of all mammals. It is, however, important to emphasize the fact that the mysterious and perfect number seven, which characterizes all mammals, with the very few exceptions already noted, is preserved in these exceedingly short-necked creatures. It is by a reduction of the individual vertebrae, not by a dropping out of one or more in the series, that the neck is reduced in length. At first sight, it is tempting to put down the remarkable consolidation of these neck vertebrae to the necessity for holding up the heavy head of the great whales. And it is undoubtedly a fact that in the right whales and in the huge-headed physeter, these peculiarities are seen in as exaggerated a form as anywhere. On the other hand, we must set against this the fact that in the great rorquals there is usually a freedom between these vertebrae, which in some species is complete. A further consideration of the variations in the degree of fusion between the cervical vertebrae seems to point to the conclusion that the peculiarity is one which is, as it were, gaining ground. For the platanistidae, which some other considerations lead us to regard as among the most primitive of existing cetaceans, have all these vertebrae quite free. Between this extremity and that offered by the right whales are almost every possible step in the fusion of the individual bones. Some, for instance, have two, three, etc. fused and the rest free. In fact, it seems difficult to explain this anomalous state of affairs by any adaptation to a particular need nor is it possible to seek for any explanation of the peculiarity by looking for its occurrence in any possible allies of the whales. If it were suggested that the Cyrenia are creatures which are, so to speak, on the way to become whales, which connect the whales with the terrestrial ungulates, it might be urged that here, at any rate, is a trace of the same fusion of the neck vertebrae, for in the manatee two of these vertebrae are thus fused but we have, on the same hand, the armadillos, where the same thing precisely occurs. And even in another group of vertebrates altogether, the hornbill offers an example of a bird in which two of the cervical vertebrae are fused. We shall deal presently with some facts in which the dugongs and manatees resemble the whales, but this view of the relationships of the whales is not one which at the present day commends itself to naturalists. It is a curious fact, however, that one of the most remarkable peculiarities of one of these Cyrenia, the manatee, i.e., the dropping of one cervical vertebra already referred to, is hinted at in certain whales. The late Dr. Gray used as a specific, and even as a generic, character the fact that in some whales the first rib is a double structure, looking like two ribs melted together and that one part of this double rib is attached to the last cervical vertebra. This looks like a commencing dropping out of the last cervical vertebra from its own proper series. It has been partly, at any rate, transferred to the ensuing dorsal row. Another Cyrenian feature in the cervical vertebrae of the whales is the slenderness of the cervical series. This is seen not in the manatee, but in the recently extinct ritina of Bering Straits, in that animal, however, the vertebrae are not in the least degree fused. In all mammals, with the exception of the whales, the atlas is peculiar, in that its centrum has broken loose and has attached itself to the following vertebrae, the axis or epistopheus, from whose centrum it projects as the odontoid process. In whales, as a rule, this process is entirely wanting, but it is a significant fact that the most considerable rudiments of it exist in platanista, and among the platanistidae, upon whose probably basal position among the cetacea we have already commented. The dorsal vertebrae among these animals are, of course, those which bear ribs, and their number varies much from species to species or from genus to genus. Nine to sixteen are the limits of variation. The curious divergences in the mode of articulation of the ribs serve to divide the cetacea, and under the description of the sperm whale, the Aenea, and some other types, the differences are dealt with. It has been pointed out that the Cetacea differ from the Cyrenia by the fact that the latter have but few lumbar vertebrae, 
while in the cetacea these same vertebrae are very numerous. But in Inea there are only three, a number which is repeated in the manatee. In this connection, it is interesting to recall the fact that in Rytina, the most cetacean of the Cyrenia, the lumbar region has increased to six vertebrae. As the pelvis is so rudimentary a structure, it is not surprising to find that there is no sacrum. No lumbar vertebrae are fused to make the complex and firm massive bone, which in terrestrial creatures supports the arch of the hind limbs. As there is no sacrum, it would seem at first a little difficult to define the commencement of the caudal series of vertebrae. Practically, there is a difficulty owing to the frequent incompleteness of skeletons in museums. But theoretically, there is none, since the first caudal is provided below with a V-shaped appendage of bone, the intercentrum or chevron bone. Professor DeLage has also pointed out that in Balanoptera musculus, at any rate, the lumbar series is defined by the termination opposite to the last one of the abdominal cavity. In terrestrial mammals, there is not, as a rule, much give in the backbone. They cannot wriggle their bodies to any great extent. The reason for this is clearly the desirability of a firm support for the limbs by which locomotion is affected. This is brought about not only by the fusion of the vertebrae in the region of attachment of the hind limbs to form the sacrum already mentioned, but elsewhere in the series the successive vertebrae are locked together by special joints, which, allowing of a certain amount of movement, curtail that movement within very narrow bounds. In some edentate animals, ant-eater, sloth, these usual joints are increased by the presence of supplementary articulations between successive vertebrae, which renders the backbone of the creatures in question a much more rigid rod than it is in the majority of mammals. Now to the whale, an eminently flexible backbone is obviously a desideratum. It moves mainly by powerful strokes of the tail, and of the hind part of the body generally. Hence, we find that the interlocking joints, the zygopophyses as they are technically termed, are much reduced, and indeed do not exist at all in the hinder part of the series, where their presence would interfere with the necessary undulations of body by means of which the whale forces its way through the water. Furthermore, a large development of the discs of fibrous tissue which lie between the centra of the vertebrae adds efficiency to this important part of the whale's skeleton. It is interesting to note that in Platanista, so frequently referred to as an archaic type of cetacean, the interlocking of the vertebrae is much more marked than in other forms. The sternum. All whales possess a sternum or breastbone, but the form of this bone, or series of bones as it actually is in many forms, varies, and the variations concern us in the present chapter, inasmuch as they bear upon the broad lines of modification which these aquatic mammals have undergone in their gradual change and adaptation to a life in the ocean. The typical mammalian breastbone consists of a number of separate pieces of bone, often spoken of as sternobrae, and forming a row along the middle line of the breast. Between each of these separate bones is inserted a rib. The number of pieces out of which the sternum is formed is sometimes very large. As many as 14 elements occur in the sloth, colopus, for example. Among the toothed whales, the sternum shows what we must regard from a comparison with land mammals as the most primitive conditions. In Berardius, for example, this sternum consists of five pieces placed end to end, and these bear facets for six ribs. A very interesting feature of this sternum is to be seen in the fact that it is not only distinctly bifid behind, but that it is also somewhat incomplete in the middle line, gaps being left in the dried skeleton, from which probably pieces of cartilage have dropped out. Now the interest of what seems to be a mere detail of anatomy is this. The sternum of mammals is developed from a fusion between the lower ends of the growing ribs. It is at first in two longitudinal pieces, and the ossification, the conversion into bone, of this cartilage is also double. Paired centers of the deposition of bony matter appearing. Thus, in Berardius and in other forms, distinct traces of the original paired state of affairs are left. In other toothed whales, the number of pieces composing the sternum is reduced. In Mesoplodon, there may be only four, and in the sperm whale there are but three pieces. 
Moreover, in this latter whale, the double character of the sternum is especially obvious. Two of the three pieces out of which it is composed are paired bones, while the last shows some indications of a longitudinal division into two. A further shortening of the sternum is exhibited in the cachalot by the fact that there are only four ribs which reach it. These three types of cetaceans seem to show that there has been a progressive shortening of the sternum. But the facts are not, it is hardly necessary to point out, conclusive, as a demonstration of this probability. More certain evidence is afforded by the actual stages of development of the breastbone of the common porpoise. In this whale, the actual proportions of the sternum during growth to the adult condition have been found to lessen in a marked fashion which leaves no doubt that here, at least, the sternum is a part of the skeleton which is shrinking. The extreme of the shrinkage of the sternum is realized in the whalebone whales, in which we have seen, and shall see, so many grounds for regarding as in many respects the most modified of whales. In these animals, the sternum is reduced to a single piece which is heart-shaped in the balina australis, and sometimes cross-shaped in the rorquals. More generally, it has in these latter cetaceans the form of a T. With the sternum in these whales articulates but one pair of ribs, the first. It is a matter of interest to inquire into the exact nature of this simple bone, which is all that is left of the sternum in the mystacoceti. In many mammals, the sternum in the adult is no more than a single solid bone. But here, the apparent simpleness of the sternum is due to the co-ossification of originally separate elements. The articulation of several pairs of ribs is a clue to the number of these elements. Now, as in the right whale and the rorquals, but one pair of ribs articulates with the small sternum, we should infer that it is the front piece of the sternum, that piece which has been fancifully termed the manubrium, the handle of the sword-shaped sternum. It may be remarked here that the end piece of the sternum is generally called the prosthesis ensiformis or ensiform piece, thus completing the analogy derived from the comparison with the sword. It is extremely important to notice that there is evidence here, too, that the shortening of the sternum has really taken place, and that comparatively recently. In the first place, Sir William Turner found that in that giant among giants, the huge rorqual, Balanoptera sibaldi, a second piece of sternum identified by him with the ensiform cartilage, or xiphus sternum as it is sometimes called, and, in the second place, the well-known cytologist, the late Professor Eskricht of Copenhagen, found in a whalebone whale that a fibrous band arising from the end of the sternum was attached to the second and third ribs. This is clearly a rudiment of a posterior prolongation of the sternum. The question now becomes pressing. Is this shortening of the sternum a character of whales unconnected with anything in particular, or is it related to the aquatic life? The answer to this question is to be derived from two sources. We have first the argument from analogy. We can consider how far, if at all, the same kind of change has gone on in other aquatic creatures. The seals and sea lions do not help us in the very least, but then it must be borne in mind that they are comparatively recent inhabitants of the water. The Cyrenia, on the other hand, offer us a precisely similar series of stages. The Morskaya Korova, Steller's sea cow, or Rytina gigas, had five pairs of ribs reaching the sternum, the dugong of eastern seas but four, while in the manatee the ribs are reduced to three pairs. The sternum, too, in these animals, is naturally reduced in correspondence with the failing attachment of the ribs. But it is somewhat contradictory to bear in mind that the first two genera, the least modified as regards ribs, have a crescentric tail more like that of whales, while in other particulars referred to on other pages, Rytina is more whale-like than either of its congeners. To go to quite another group, to which we have often had occasion to refer in dwelling upon the peculiarities of whales, the Ichthyosaurians were devoid of a sternum, at least of an ossified one, and the same statement holds good for the pleosaurs. There would seem, therefore, to be some connection between the aquatic life and an absent or rudimentary sternum. Dr. Moeller, however, would answer the question, which we asked some lines above, in another fashion. 
He is of the opinion that the whalebone whales breathe more with the thoracic musculature and less with the diaphragm than do the toothed whales. The diaphragm in them is not so purely muscular an organ as it is in those toothed whales in which it has been examined. Hence, the greater part of the exertions requisite for inspiration are thrown upon the muscles of the trunk. The freedom of the ribs and a consequent shortening of the sternum is favorable to this supposed increased activity. It is also ingeniously suggested by the same authority that the whalebone whales, pursuing as they do minute prey instead of the comparatively large cuttlefish eaten by the bulk of the toothed whales, have to remain longer under water before they can obtain a sufficient supply of their food. The freedom of the ribs, etc., not only allows of a greater extensibility of the alimentary canal, but a greater expansion of the lungs, and in consequence, a greater indraft of air. Whatever may be the explanation, however, the facts are as stated. The skull. The most obvious and the most remarkable feature of the whale's skull is its asymmetry in the toothed whales. So unintelligible does this aberration from what is normal in mammals appear to be, that it has even been suggested that the peculiarity was originally a pathological state of affairs caused by injury, and that a one-sided face has been the consequent inheritance. One associates symmetry with vertebrate animals, and so especially with aquatic ones swimming head foremost through the water, that symmetry would seem to be their most necessary attribute. It must be borne in mind, however, that the asymmetry is not nearly so apparent in the head when clothed with flesh. But the sperm whale is markedly asymmetrical in the single S-shaped blowhole. This absence of symmetry in the skull affects especially the premaxillae and the nasals. The latter, indeed, are often reduced to a single very small bone. There is one toothed whale in which the asymmetry of the skull is not so hard to understand. That is, of course, the narwhal, with its one, rarely two, tusk projecting in front. This one-sided development could be readily imagined as having affected to a considerable degree the neighboring parts of the skull. But we cannot assume that other toothed whales are the offspring of narwhal-like forms, though it is certainly true that the narwhal is in some respects a primitive whale. It is easier to say that the asymmetry being as it is chiefly developed in the regions of the blowholes, has something to do with those structures than to find any adequate reason for connecting the two. Footnote. Of course, the unsymmetrical head of the flatfish is not in any way comparable. In those fishes, it is related to the fact that the sides of the body are used as dorsal and ventral surface, respectively. End of footnote. Seen from the ventral surface, the whale's skull is quite symmetrical. This is the case even with Kogia and Physeter, which are the most asymmetrical of whales above. It is important to note that in the fetus, the asymmetry is less marked than in the adult. This leads us to the conclusion that the singular deformity of the head which characterizes the toothed whales is at least comparatively speaking a new development. The whale skull also offers us an excellent instance of how great a departure from the typical appearance of an organ may be produced without any real change in its structure. There are no bones in the skull that are not found in other mammals, and none of the bones found in other mammals are wanting. And yet the skull as a whole departs widely in general appearance from that of other mammals. The brain case proper is relatively small and the snout, the facial portion of the skull, is very elongated, the degree of elongation varying from genus to genus. It is most developed, perhaps, in the extinct Urinodelphus, apparently a platinistid, of which a figure is appended. The toothed whales, in fact, embody the extremes of shortening and elongation of the facial region of the skull. Thus it is very short in Orcella, in Kogia, and in a few others. Several of the individual bones show peculiarities, of which some will be mentioned in the present general account of the whale's skull. The parietals deserve their name, for they are really walls to the skull and not a covering also, as in other mammals. This, at any rate, applies to the majority. In the extinct zooglodonts, which in many other respects conform to a more generalized mammalian condition, these bones are, so to speak, normal. 
but among the toothed whales they do not meet above and the part of the roof of the skull which should be occupied by the parietals is invaded by the huge supraoccipital this does not however apply to the whalebone whales though it appears to do so in these whales the fetus has normal parietals meeting above in the adult the upper portion of the bones is overlaid by the supraoccipitals we have here the first stage in the disappearance of the median portion of the parietals being overlaid by the supraoccipitals their function ceases and in accordance with what is always found in nature being useless they disappear the enormous size of the supraoccipital bone reduces the size of the frontals with which it articulates the latter are very narrow above where they form the forehead and expand below where they protect the small orbit from above the premaxillary bones are remarkable for two peculiarities in the first place they do not except in some of the extinct forms zeuglodonts bear any teeth but in the second place instead of having degenerated in bulk in consequence they are greatly increased they stretch backwards and touch or indeed partly cover the frontals the small size of the nasals which are almost rudimentary in all existing whales and especially so in the odontocetes permits this junction to be effected laterally these premaxillary bones are ensheathed by the maxillae a feature very characteristic of the whales that is to say of existing forms the maxillae also cover over the frontals and in some odontocetes are greatly crested on their dorsal surface a feature which is carried to a maximum in hyperodon and in the gangetic platinista the bones related to the organ of hearing are extremely strong and stony in the whale tribe they are imperfectly attached as a rule to the surrounding portions of the skull and are thus readily detachable they are often found in a fossil condition quite separate the tympanic bone has a shell-like form not unlike a cowrie it is not always firmly attached to the periodic which ensheaths the actual organ of hearing some other peculiarities of the skull bones of cetacea are dealt with under the description of the different families End of section 5. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 6 of The Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bettered. Chapter 2 some internal structures part two the shoulder girdle the shoulder girdle of the whales consists of an apparently single bone which has a highly characteristic form liable to some range of variation the major part of this bone is formed of the scapula while a process directed forward is the coracoid more pronounced in the larger number of whales than in any other among the higher mammalia the scapula is broad and flattened, but both the breadth and the degree of flattening is not by any means uniform. In the sperm whale, the bone is gently concave. It is very much broader, i.e. longer, in an antero-posterior direction in the rorquals than in the right whales. Near to the anterior edge of the blade bone is a ridge, which ends in a particularly long process, the acromion. Only in the megaptera is this process, and also the coracoid process underlying it, markedly reduced. In platinista, there is another abnormality of structure. The acromion coincides absolutely with the anterior margin of the blade bone, so that the ridge of the spine of the scapula is quite absent as a distinct structure. It is worthy of note that in megaptera, which has the longest flippers of all whales, the acromion and the coracoid process should be reduced to a minimum or even practically absent. Organs of respiration. Not only is the influence of a purely aquatic life to be seen in the outward form of whales, the respiratory organs and parts annexed show the same modification. Bearing in mind the peculiar habits of whales, their capacity for remaining a long time under water, and the necessity, therefore, of supplying themselves with a good stock of air for use during those prolonged immersions, we should indeed expect to find that in the vascular, as well as in the respiratory organs, 
there were differences to be seen not found in mammals which are purely terrestrial and this is precisely what we do find but here again it is not always easy to distinguish between adaptational likeness and the real affinity it is that is to say not always clear that structures supposed to be modified owing to the habits of the creature are not marks of likeness to some other family of mammals but we shall consider these points as they arise dr otto muller who has recently and elaborately dealt with this matter has particularly dwelt upon the form of the chest cavity in these aquatic mammals among terrestrial creatures the shape of this cavity is as a rule boat-like in transverse section the cavity narrows below and is wider above furthermore its ventral boundary line is about as long as its dorsal the result of this being that the diaphragm the partly tendinous but chiefly fleshy septum which separates the chest cavity from that in which are lodged the liver intestines and stomach has a vertical direction and stands as it were upright in the body in the whales on the other hand the chest cavity is more barrel shaped oval in section sometimes indeed transversely oval its dorsal boundary is much longer than its ventral and in consequence the diaphragm is distinctly and mostly very oblique in direction it is however one thing to state these differences and quite another to assert that they are modifications connected with the aquatic habit it might be suggested in the first place that these marks of distinction are merely characteristic of whales just as it is characteristic of one division of whales to have a free malar bone a fact which is simply of classificatory significance and has no bearing at least so far as we can see upon any special difference in the mode of life of its possessor furthermore the obliquity of the diaphragm might be associated with the shortening of the sternum which is so marked a character of the whales especially of the whalebone whales a whole series of facts however upset these at first sight reasonable objections and seem to prove the contrary i e that the modifications in question are really connected with the aquatic life and with nothing else in the otter and still more in the seal which are examples of two stages in the literally downward progress of a land animal toward an aquatic existence these several characters are seen in a condition intermediate to that which obtains in the purely land animal on the one hand and in the purely aquatic whales on the other and furthermore in the manatee which if it be an ally of the whale can hardly be regarded as an ally of the carnivora to which group of course the otter and the seal belong there is the same obliquity of the diaphragm thus in three types the whale the manatee and the seal we have the same series of modifications existing if the whale is a relative of the manatee it is not of the seal so that any renewed attempt to urge the argument from affinity fails as to the obliquity of the diaphragm being due to the reduction of the sternum this is disproved by several instances among the whales in beluga the diaphragm is attached to the sternum before its end in hyperodon the same is the case while in balanoptera the attachment is altogether behind the sternum there is thus no special relation to be observed between the end of the sternum and the ventral insertion of the diaphragm moreover as showing that it is a modification of a recent kind it is interesting to notice that in the porpoise of the youngest stage that has been observed the relative proportions of the ventral and the dorsal line of the thoracic cavity are as one to one point seventy five while in the adult the same proportions are as one to two point twenty five thus these peculiarities are developed quite late showing that they are a recent acquisition and tending therefore to prove that they are developed in consequence of altered habitat the lungs themselves are characterized by their simple form in the mammalia generally the lungs are more complex they are divided into a number of separate lobes the practical result of which is to increase the lung surface without any corresponding need for an enlarged chest cavity to contain them in the same result is brought about in the whale by the increased length of the lungs themselves as already mentioned the chest cavity is proportionately larger than in terrestrial mammals therefore it follows that the lungs can be bigger without any lobulation as a matter of fact they are what is uncertain at present is whether this simplicity is a primitive feature in the organization of these animals or whether it is a reduction following upon the alteration of other conditions it is exceedingly difficult to decide such matters 
But before we attempt to decide, another important feature of the structure of these aquatic mammals must be mentioned. In many parts of the body of whales, the blood vessels form to a very copious degree the anastomosing networks which are known technically as retia mirabilia. Erete mirabile is produced by the breaking up of an artery into a meshwork of minuter arterioles. The net physiological result, so far as concerns the mechanical effects of such a breaking up, is the slowing of the bloodstream at such spots and the increase of the surface of blood exposed to the surrounding organs and tissues. It seems to follow from this that the oxygen contained in the blood would be more fully utilized by the tissues through which the retia pass than in the case of a single tube. In fact, in the whale we have a state of affairs which in some degree suggests the respiratory conditions occurring in an insect, where the ramifying tracheae bring the air to the organs individually, instead of, as in the bulk of air-breathing animals, the air having to be extracted from the blood by the tissues. These large reservoirs of oxygen within the body, and in close relation to various organs which need abundant oxygen, then do away with the need for an increased lung surface in these diving animals. But not altogether. It looks as if the simpler condition of the lung had been retained for in reptiles, the lungs have the same simple, unlobulated structure, the increase being simply brought about by an increased length rendered possible by the greater obliquity of the diaphragm. The Whale's Stomach It is a highly characteristic feature of whales, and one which is absolutely universal, that they have an exceedingly complicated stomach. In man, the stomach is simply a bent, somewhat U-shaped, wide region of the gut, there is, however, a difference observable in the structure of the lining membrane between what is called the cardiac portion of the organ, so-called because it lies nearest the heart, and the distal pyloric region out of which opens the intestine. As a rare abnormality, however, the stomach of man is divided by constrictions into three chambers. Among rodents, it is common for the stomach to be divided into two or more less sharply marked off chambers by a median constriction. This chambering of the stomach is, however, carried out to a large extent only in the sirenia, manatee, the sloth, the ruminants, oxen, antelopes, deer, camels, and in the whales. It must not be at once concluded from this circumstance that the whales are related intimately to one or other or to all of these groups. We shall see presently that the divided stomach of the whales is essentially different from the divided stomach of the other animals. They simply have in common the bare fact that it is divided. But before proceeding to generalities, it will be convenient to lay before the reader some of the facts. We cannot give here a detailed account of the stomach in the entire order. Dr. Jungklaus, the most recent writer upon the subject, quotes no less than 63 memoirs apart from his own, which deal entirely, or more or less incidentally, with the cetacean stomach. To this memoir of Dr. Jungklaus's we must refer for additional details, and for this list of literature. The common porpoise may conveniently serve as a starting point. Its stomach is among the least complicated, and it is clearly the most accessible of whales for study. In that creature, the stomach has the form which is indicated in a diagrammatic form in the accompanying sketch. The esophagus opens into a wide blind sac near to the upper esophageal side of which opens out of this the second division of the stomach. At the lower end of this ladder, and in the thickness of its wall, is a small passage, regarded as the third division, which leads into a long and rather narrow division of the stomach. This is the fourth chamber. It is curved in an undulating fashion, and from it arises the commencement of the small intestine, which commencement is dilated and might be regarded by some as a fifth stomachal chamber were it not for the fact that into it opens the combined duct of the liver and of the pancreas. Beluga and the narwhal have stomachs which agree in many points with each other and differ slightly from the porpoise. Those whales, as will be seen later, form a well-defined group of dolphins, contrasting in other points with the remaining delphinidae. In both of them, the first division of the stomach is strongly divided into two separate chambers. The minute third chamber of the porpoise stomach simply in that animal an excavation in the thick wall of compartment two, is here larger and a distinct chamber visible before the stomach is dissected. Finally, there is a fifth chamber, separated off from the fourth and like it of an elongated intestiniform shape. Of the other dolphins, 
while Globocephalus and Grampus are most like Monodon, Orcella is most like the common porpoise, so too are Platanista and Pontiporia. The stomach of Balanoptera musculus, our example of a whalebone whale, is constructed upon the same plan as that of those dolphins that have been already considered. It has four chambers like that of the porpoise, but the proportions are a little different. This will be observed from the accompanying figure. It will be noted that the second chamber is larger than the first, and that the fourth is relatively small. A still greater reduction is seen, according to Sir William Turner, in the stomach of Balina mysticetus, at least in the fetus of that whale. The author just mentioned counted but three chambers in its stomach. The small intermediate chamber, three, appears to be absent. The stomach of the xiphioid whales is in one important respect different from that of the whale group that we have hitherto considered. The stomachs of the genera Hyperodon, Mesoplodon, and Xiphias have been carefully examined by more than one observer. Berardius alone is as yet unknown as regards its soft parts. As a general rule, the xiphioid whales differ from others in the very large number of compartments into which the stomach is divided. 9, 10, even 13 or 14 divisions have been recorded, and the varied statements which occur in the literature of the subject with respect to the exact number of compartments in the stomach of a given species are not, it is thought, evidence of inaccuracy on the part of one or more of the describers, but simply an expression of actual variability. This, however, is a detailed difference. The most important difference is that the first division of the stomach gives off the second at its posterior and not at its anterior end. In the stomachs of the whales that we have been considering, a cuttlefish or a herring, when swallowed, might, so far as anatomical arrangement is concerned, pass at once into the second compartment as well as into the first, as will at once be seen in division number two. That would be impossible in a xiphioid. The first compartment of their stomachs is large, and from it lead, from the opposite extremity, be it remembered, to that where the esophagus enters, six to thirteen smallish, round, orange-shaped cavities, of which the last, that immediately preceding the duodenum, is often the largest. It is so, for instance, in Musoplodon bidens. What, then, is the exact correspondence between the stomachs of these whales and those of the dolphins and whalebone whales? The inevitable conclusion is that the first compartment of the latter whales is missing in the stomach of the xiphioids. This conclusion is not only supported by a comparison of the actual structures concerned, as is so often the case, the solution of the problem is aided here by those occasional occurrences so useful to the morphologist of rudiments. In Hyperodon, Dr. Jungklaus has detected a small representative of the first stomach of other whales in the form of a slight cacal dilatation of the esophagus just before it opens into the normal first stomach of that whale. This rudiment seems obviously to have the significance that he suggests, and moreover it showed internally a characteristic meandering arrangement of the folds of mucous membrane, an arrangement which is universal, or nearly so, in the first division of the stomach of dolphins. It appears, therefore, that the stomach of the xiphioids is to be derived from that of dolphins and not vice versa. This is in harmony with other considerations, which point to the xiphioids as modified, not archaic, forms of whales. See below. We may now compare the complicated whale stomach with the complicated ruminant stomach. The latter, when typically developed, has the characters shown in the following description. The esophagus leads into a large paunch, the rumen. It equally leads into a smaller pouch, the reticulum. From this latter arises the salterium, so called from the leaf-like arrangement of its folds of mucous membrane. Finally, there is the abomasum, the truly digestive part of the stomach. In having four compartments, the stomach of a typical ruminant agrees with that of the porpoise. But at this point the agreement stops. The first three divisions of the ruminant stomach are clothed with esophageal epithelium. It is only the abomasum which is the truly digestive part of the stomach. Thus, in the ruminant, the stomach may be regarded as being primarily divided into two regions, the last of which only is the digestive portion. The first part is, again, sharply marked off into three regions. In the cetacea, on the other hand, the stomach, although like that of the ruminant divided primarily into two parts, shows a further subdivision of the digestive part which may be exceedingly complicated in the xiphioids, 
while the non-digestive region is generally not divided at all, and if it is, i.e. monodon, etc., the division is not of so marked a character as in the ruminants. Even in the manatee, the stomach is more ruminant than cetacean, for the true digestive stomach, apart from its two cacae, is not divided. Thus, the stomach of ruminant and cetacean have only this in common, that the stomach is primarily divisible into two parts, but that is a universal character, and is indeed seen in other vertebrates, for example in birds, sharks, etc. From such a simply divided stomach, as is seen in various rodents, and in other types of mammals, both the cetacean and the ruminant stomach may have arisen, and the resemblances between them will in this case be an example of that frequent phenomenon in the organic world, convergence. To account for this likeness by convergence is a matter of interesting inquiry. The other complicated stomachs which are found in mammals are invariably associated with a vegetarian diet. The sloth, the oxen and the sheep, and the manatee and dugong are all vegetable feeders. The whales are most distinctly carnivorous animals. It has been suggested, however, that whales ruminate like oxen. This process, in the ruminantia, consists of the following series of acts. The animal bites off and swallows an immense amount of herbage, leaves, etc., and swallows them hastily. The mass thus swallowed is permeated by the saliva and is then returned to the mouth, where it is thoroughly masticated at leisure and re-swallowed to be properly digested. It is held that the ruminantia, being as a rule timid creatures, who have to be on their guard against their numerous carnivorous foes, gain an advantage by this apparently complicated and even disadvantageously complicated act. They can lay in their store of food hastily and with rapidity, and then, at a more convenient season, when danger is not so pressing, remasticate and digest it at their leisure. Whales often feed among dense swarms of cuttlefish, crustaceans, etc., and it might seem that here, too, a kind of rumination might take place. The immense amount of food swallowed might be kept in the first division of the stomach and regurgitated for subsequent chewing. The fact that a large number of seals and porpoises perfectly whole and intact were found in the first division of the stomach of an orca seems to favor this hypothesis, as does also the statement of many that whales, when captured, generally allow some undigested, even unlacerated food to escape by the mouth. But on the contrary view, which is that usually accepted, we must consider the structure of the mouth, teeth, and tongue, all of which have an important bearing upon the existence or non-existence of prolonged mastication, such as characterizes ruminantia. The numerous and homodont teeth are not fitted for chewing. They are fitted simply for catching and retaining slippery fish and squid. The great length of the jaw in many forms does not permit of the essential lever action of the jaws in chewing. And finally, the immobile tongue is not of any use in aiding the performance of the function of mastication. A mobile tongue is obviously required to push back the food as it escapes from between the teeth. It is thus practically certain that whales do not ruminate. But in that case, of what use is the first stomach, devoid as it is of glands? In the ruminant is a large storehouse. In whales, this would seem to be needless. It is thought that the first stomach of the whale is a chamber in which the food is to some extent broken up and softened by mechanical means. It is analogous, in fact, on this view to the bird's gizzard. The muscular layers of its walls are thicker than in the thin-walled rumen of the ruminant. Often, too, this compartment has been found to contain sand and stones, just as does the bird's gizzard and for the matter of that, the stomach of the sea lion. This introduction of sand and stones may be accidental, but on the other hand, its presence may be explained as an accessory to the trituration of the food. It is obvious that a trituration of this kind and rumination are mutually exclusive. The balance of probability is in favor of the former action of the first stomach. But even now, we have not accounted for the complication of the true digestive stomach. It is to be noticed, however, that here, as already stated, we are free from any analogy with the herbiferous stomach. In the sirenia and ruminants, this part of the stomach is not complicated. It is only the first part associated with the non-digestive functions of the stomach. This problem, it is to be feared, we must leave unsolved. Finally, there is the fact of the absence of the first stomach in the xiphioids to explain physiologically. Dr. Jungklaus thinks that this is associated with their exclusive diet of cuttlefishes, 
which require no stomachal mastication. Their tissues are soft and are easily digested by the digestive part of the stomach, without any previous maceration and pressing. End of section 6. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 7 of The Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bettered. Chapter 2. Some Internal Structures. Part 3. Teeth. Whales are, as is well known, divisible into two groups, those with and those without teeth the Odontoceti and the Mysticoceti of various authors. The Mysticoceti, however, the whalebone whales, possess teeth in the young condition, while there are plenty of instances of the commencing disappearance of teeth among the Odontoceti. Thus, the line which separates the two divisions of existing whales is not so hard and fast as was stated before recent discoveries in the growth of the teeth of these animals. Before considering the growth of the teeth, however, it will be well to lay briefly before the reader the principal facts in the structure of the teeth of existing toothed whales. A very marked feature of their teeth is the characteristic homodonty. This term, it should be explained, is applied to teeth when the whole series is composed of teeth which are alike. In most mammals, there is what is known as heterodonty, i.e. the teeth are specialized in different directions. Thus, in man, there are the anterior incisors, cutting teeth, which are different in form and in function from the posterior cheek teeth, molars, or crushing teeth. The differentiation is more emphasized still in some other animals, less so again in others, but on the whole the mammals stand apart from all other vertebrate animals by the fact of their heterodonty. The teeth of a frog, of a snake, or of a lizard are all more or less alike. There is no possibility of speaking of incisors, canines, and molars. Another characteristic feature of mammalian dentition will be postponed until the actual dentition of adult whales has been described and compared with that of other mammals. Broadly speaking, it is correct to define the toothed whales as mammals in which there is no specialization of the teeth, but there are some slight exceptions which will be dealt with presently. The number, size, and position of the teeth of the odontocetes varies but the majority have a large number of smallish conical teeth embedded in both upper and lower jaws. The actual numbers vary much. The greatest number are seen in the genus Aenea, where no less than 221 are reckoned up. As will be seen in the account of the different kinds of whales, the number of the teeth is often made use of as a generic character. Among the Delphinidae there are a gradual series of genera in which the number of teeth gets reduced. It must not be imagined, however, that we can actually start from some such form as Aenea with abundant teeth, and derive from it the various genera in which the teeth are reduced, and arrange those genera in order of this reduction, but it will be convenient to take them in such an order. Through a gradual reduction in the number, we arrive at the genus Delphinapterus, the beluga, where there are but nine teeth on each side of the jaw. In Grampus, this dentition is still further reduced the teeth in the upper jaw have disappeared altogether, and there are only a few, three to seven, on each side of the lower jaw, arranged near to the symphysis of the mandibles. Another line culminates in the narwhal, monodon, where all the teeth have vanished in the adult animal save the well-known tusk, and the accompanying tusk of smaller size sometimes equally developed in the upper jaw. In this case, it is the lower jaw which has become edentulous. A second series of modifications is seen among the Physeteridae, the cachalot, and the Ziphioid whales. The cachalot has functional teeth only in the mandible, where they form a row of strong conical teeth, but in addition to these are a series of smaller teeth in the upper jaw, which are not to be seen in the dried skull, as they are not embedded in the bone but only in the gum, which naturally is stripped off or decays away in the course of preparation of the skull for museum purposes. This kind of reduction is still further exaggerated in the Ziphioid whales. In all of these, the number of teeth actually used is very limited, not more than two pairs, usually one pair, and those are limited to the lower jaw. But in addition to these, there are in most, if not in all, Ziphioid whales, a set of smaller teeth only in the upper jaw or in both jaws, which are, like the corresponding teeth of the cachalot, 
embedded only in the gum, and so are, as a rule, lost in skulls acquired by museums. These teeth are clearly on the wane, and as even the teeth of the lower jaw are sometimes not extruded, and in other cases lost before the animal dies, it is evident that these whales are not so very far removed from the whalebone whales, but it should be observed that they exhibit no trace of the compensating whalebone. So much, then, for the general modifications of the teeth as regards numbers, which are exhibited in the series of toothed whales. The question arises, are those whales with the most teeth the most primitive, and have they given rise to those with a reduced dentition? Or is the converse true? Or finally, is it safest to take the middle path and make two series, one ascending and one descending? Are, for instance, dolphins, with a moderate number of teeth, nearest to the ancestral form from which have arisen by multiplication on the one hand the Aenea, and by reduction the narwhal? This supposition agrees in some ways more nearly with what we know of mammalian dentition in general. It has been pointed out that the typical mammalian dentition is heterodont. It is also limited in numbers, and those numbers are definite. Apart from the marsupials, in which, moreover, 56 is the greatest number of teeth, and a very few other instances, no mammal has or had more than 44 teeth. Even here there is nothing like the abundance of teeth of Aenea or Platinista. Furthermore, the number of teeth of the many-toothed dolphins appears to be not exactly fixed to a tooth or two, whereas in the mammalia, as a rule, with but few exceptions, such as Priodon and Armadillo and the manatee, the number does not vary except, of course, on occasional abnormalities. On a priori grounds, therefore, dangerous grounds sometimes on which to build an argument intended to last, we should be rather disposed to regard the excessive dentition of the typical dolphins as not a primitive state of affairs, but one derived from something more nearly approaching to what is characteristic of mammals in general. In a number of skulls belonging to various genera of Delphinidae with numerous teeth, Professor Kukenthal found here and there that the regular arrangement of the relative positions of teeth in the upper and lower jaw was lost. The regular arrangement is that the teeth of the two jaws should alternate, an obvious convenient arrangement for the due prehension of the fish or octopuses upon which they feed. Alternating teeth would be better able to lay hold of this slippery food. When this accurate correspondence ceases, it is brought about by the intercalation of teeth, a proceeding which naturally increases the total number. If this process is going on now, there is nothing unreasonable in thinking that it has been going on in the past in correspondence, perhaps, with the increase in length of the jaws themselves. Thus, the number of teeth in dolphins is greater now than it has been. They are, therefore, to be derived from creatures with fewer teeth, so far more like the typical mammalia. Another argument pointing in the same direction is afforded by the ancient Zuglodonts, treated of more fully on another page. These cetaceans had a dentition conforming in number of teeth to the more typical mammalia. Their teeth were also more conformable to those of the mammalia generally in their heterodonty, but we shall recur to this after considering the traces of heterodonty still remaining in the group of whales. Having dealt generally with the number of teeth among existing cetacea, their shapes remain for consideration. As a rule, the teeth of whales are simple and conical in form, directed either upwards or rather forwards. They resemble, in fact, the canine teeth of other mammals, not only in this shape, but in their being implanted by a single root. There are, however, a few examples of some, though not a great deal of, specialization in the form of the teeth. In Aenea geophrensis, the posterior series of teeth have a distinct lateral cusp, so that they have ceased to be simply peg-like teeth. In the common porpoise, Phocaena communis, the teeth have broad divided crowns which are sharply marked off from the root. There is a reminiscence here of the more complicated teeth of ancestral forms such as the Zuglodonts. The extraordinary strap-shaped teeth of Mesoplodon laiardi and the tusks of the narwhal need not be referred to in the present connection. They appear to be simply exaggerations, perhaps originally pathological, of the simple conditions obtaining in other whales. They are probably not to be looked upon as an inheritance from terrestrial ancestors. Professor Kukenthal has a theory that the simple teeth of whales are to be derived from the splitting up of more complicated teeth. 
such as are found in other mammals. In Zeuglodonts, called so on this very account, each tooth is formed of two pieces, each with its separate root. By division of these, the more numerous teeth of a dolphin can be arrived at. But recent investigations into the manatee seem to negative this theory, for in that animal an indefinite succession of complicated teeth occurs. In almost all mammalia, the individual is provided with two sets of teeth. There is the dentition found in the young. This is later replaced by the dentition of the adult. The two sets of teeth are spoken of respectively as the milk and the permanent dentition. This is characteristic of the mammalia and distinguishes them from lower vertebrates where there is not this merely double dentition. New teeth in the lower vertebrates are formed as they are wanted. If a mammal loses one of the teeth of the second series, that tooth is not replaced. The relative importance of these two sets of teeth varies much. The milk teeth are sometimes only developed as rudiments, never of functional use, while in other cases the milk teeth persist for a long time and are very distinctly functional. It has been even attempted to be shown that in the marsupials it is the permanent dentition which is suppressed, and only represented by rudiments, while the teeth of the full-grown animal are the persistent milk teeth. This general character of the mammalia has been described as defiadont, and it was thought that by this the majority of mammals were to be distinguished from some that had but one set of teeth, and were accordingly to be termed monophyodont. In some of the edentata, the sloth, it is still believed that only one set of teeth is ever produced, and the same view was originally held about the toothed whales. There is, however, now not the least doubt that the dolphins are truly diphyodont mammals, thus conforming in a very important character to the terrestrial allies. But it is not quite settled which of the two dentitions it is that persists. It is held by Kukenthal that the dental series of whales belongs to the milk dentition. Thus the whales are clearly descendants of purely diphyodont mammals. We have now to consider the whalebone whales, which in the adult condition have no teeth, only the plates of baleen, which will be treated of on another page. As long ago as the year 1807, Geoffrey St. Hilaire discovered the rudiments of teeth in a fetus of the Greenland whale, Balena mysticetus, and this important discovery was afterwards confirmed by the great Cuvier, as well as by his less-known brother, Frederick Cuvier. Since then, the facts have been confirmed by others. The first discoverers of the facts contented themselves with little more than a statement of them. But later, Professor Julin laid great stress upon the additional fact that the teeth of Balanoptera rostrata, which he examined, were not merely simple conical teeth, but of a more complicated pattern. He found teeth with one cusp, like those of Cetacea generally, and two, and even with three cusps. The simple teeth, moreover, were those in the anterior part of the jaws the more complicated teeth further back. In fact, there is an obvious likeness to a set of incisors followed by the more complicated cheek teeth. This arrangement is typical of mammals and is found in the cetacean Zeuglodon. An addition of great weight has been made to these discoveries by Professor Kukenthal, who found besides the fairly well-developed rudiments of teeth very rudimentary traces of a second dentition thus showing that the whalebone whales, like their toothed allies, are diphyodont like other mammals. Furthermore, he has given reasons for believing that in them, as in the toothed whales, it is the milk dentition which persisted longest, as it is represented by the most fully developed rudiments. The brain. The brain of all whales presents a most unusual shape of that organ. It is very much compressed from before backwards, and is thus broader than it is long. It looks almost as if these creatures, rushing through the waves, had flattened their brains in the effort to oppose the weight of water. But though so much shortened and comparatively small in total bulk, the cerebral hemispheres of the cetacea make up to some extent by the highly developed convolutions of the brain surface. It used to be held, and the belief is often seen in popular books, i.e. books which deal loosely with the facts and inferences of science that the furrows of a brain corresponded with its thoughtfulness, that the higher the type, the more abundant these grooves and furrows upon the surface, which separate the complicated system of ridges of brain substance known as the convolutions. It is, of course, perfectly true that the brain of the highest animal of all, man, is markedly and abundantly convoluted. It cannot be said, however, that the titanic whale is largely superior in intelligence to the small and active marmoset, 
and yet, if the convolutions of the brain were to be alone considered, this would have to be the opinion. For the marmoset's brain is not far from being quite smooth, while we have already commented upon the markedly convoluted character of that of the whale. The real relationship appears to be between size of body and complication of the brain's surface, and this is more obvious when nearly related animals are compared with each other. The marmoset, for instance, has a smoother brain than the gorilla. The rhinoceros and the hippopotamus have much more furrowed brains than the smaller ungulates. Our whales are, curiously enough, an exception to this generalization. It cannot be said that the great rorqual or sperm whale has a brain which is at all definitely superior in the number of its convolutions to the brains of smaller whales. Can we in any way account for the curious shape and the great convolution of the brain surface in cetacea? In the first place, it is as well to be convinced that they do want accounting for. This can hardly be doubted. The singular shape of the hemispheres of the whale are so peculiar that they suffice to define the group. There is nothing like it elsewhere among mammals. Then again, there are some reasons for considering the whales to occupy a low position in the mammalian series reasons which will be dealt with on another page. We should expect, therefore, to find a lowish type of brain. Instead of this, we are confronted with the most specialized. Nothing is more difficult in zoology than to arrive at convenient generalizations, for the paradoxical reason that it is so easy to frame hypotheses. The expression simplex sigillum veri, not composed for the purpose for which it is used, and yet used with such frequency in zoological writing, especially in the newer developments of what is called sometimes Darwinism, has had a most deleterious effect upon speculation. A simple and obvious explanation often seems to such writers to settle the question at issue. And yet, in the long run, it seems to be plain that the processes of nature are not so simple. It is certain that the brains of some of the early and extinct forms of mammals were not only small but smooth, it is equally certain that their descendants, or at least allied forms subsequent in date, have not only larger but more rumpled brains. The whales, we can fairly assume, are an ancient stock, and may have started even as whales with small and smooth brains. The requisite increase was brought about by a more extensive crumpling of the surface, while the small frontal bones and the large development of the facial region of the skull prevented the extension of the brain cavity forwards its extension laterally being permitted partly by the non-union of the parietals above and by the feebly attached bony apparatus connected with the organ of hearing. It seems to follow further that the whales cannot be nearly related to any existing form of mammal as the brain development has pursued so different a path. Sir William Turner has pointed out that a large number of the smaller convolutions of the whale's brain are transverse to the long axis of that organ which suggests that there has been, as it were, a tendency to grow forward in the ordinary mammalian fashion, but a check to the same growth, which has naturally resulted in furrows having the direction referred to. In any case, the whale's brain is partly characterized by the features to which attention has been called. It is also remarkable for the fact that in the toothed whales, there is absolutely no vestige of these four parts of the brain which are connected with the sense of smell while in the whalebone whales the same region is only feebly visible. It is sometimes erroneously asserted that creatures living in the water cannot smell, owing to the suspension in the water of the odiferous particles, but this is at once negatived by the case of fishes, which have a well-developed olfactory apparatus. Anyhow, whales have not, but it is apparently not to be put down to their marine habitat, one of the very few structures indeed which cannot be correlated with that mode of life. Whalebone. The real nature of whalebone was frequently, like that of spermaceti, misunderstood in past times. Bilan, translated by Scammon, wrote upon the matter as follows, and that which is called whalebone, coast de baleine, literally whale's ribs, with which ladies nowadays make their corsets and stiffen out their dresses, and which the beetles of some churches carry as wands, these are certain pieces cut off and drawn out from that which serves as eyelids for the whale, and which covers his eyes, and which is furnished at its extremity with a kind of long, stiff hair. This is what the Latins call the pretentures, and which they say enables the animal to direct his course through the sea. 
This latter notion, as Sir William Flower points out, is probably connected with the old feudal law cited by Blackstone, that the tails of all whales belonged to the queen as a perquisite to furnish her majesty's wardrobe with whalebone. Scaliger, too, in his commentaries upon Aristotle, observes of whalebone, In supercilius lamellus habet que cum caput mergit atalantor ab aqua, aque ida vidende potestas sit, ubi vero ex aqua exerit, concident lamellae atque tigant oculos. Probably this and the former view is due in part to the tiny eye which escaped attention, and indeed seems on account of the peculiar development of the skull to have an abnormal situation. Nevertheless, at the same period in which Bellon wrote, the accurate location of whalebone was understood. For Oleus Magnus described in a stranded Rorqual the whalebone, of which he remarked, palato adherabant quasi laminae corneae, and proceeded to point out that these laminae were not all of the same size, a fact which is well known to be the case with the laminae of whalebone. Later still, whalebone was quite properly described by T. Johnson in 1634 as the fins that stand forth of their mouths, which are commonly called whalebones, being dried and polished, serve to make busks for women. Shakespeare, however, seems to have confused the true meaning of the term. He writes of teeth as white as whalebone, but it is believed that by whalebone in this case is meant the tusks of the walrus, an animal which was often and at many times confounded with whales. Indeed, it is not always easy to decide whether a given illustration refers to this animal or to some large toothed whale such as orca. There is, however, curiously enough, some justification for accepting Shakespeare's epithet of white in a perfectly literal fashion. For in many whales, the whalebone is white, or whitish in parts or altogether. The more celebrated Dr. Johnson, in the Dictionary edition of 1818, defines whalebone as the fin of a whale cut and used in making stays, thus reverting to earlier errors. It is, however, just possible that the stiff, tendinous tissue of the actual tail was made use of as a material for stiffening articles of wear. It is quite conceivable that when dried, it might form a cheaper substitute for real whalebone. The number of times that the expression fin is employed and the evident knowledge possessed by at any rate some persons who correctly located the true whalebone may perhaps point this way. Whalebone has, it need hardly perhaps be remarked, nothing to do with true teeth, but it is distinctly analogous to the horny so-called teeth of the ornithorhynchus, and it is an interesting fact that the whales show the same tendency observable in other groups of the animal kingdom to the replacement of teeth by horny structures. The horny teeth of the platypus have their forerunners in the shape of true teeth, which are shed early. In birds, the most archaic forms had true teeth, but the birds of today have developed in their place the horny beak which characterizes them. The whalebone whales start life with rudimentary teeth which ultimately disappear on the appearance of the whalebone. The general character of whalebone resembles that of horns or hair. The color is black or white or brown. The place where the whalebone is formed is the roof of the mouth, the palate. The plates of whalebone are triangular in shape, the base of attachment being broader than the lower free extremity. The plates are attached by the broad base to the roof of the mouth, and they may indeed be regarded as an exaggeration of the ridges, often horny in character, which are found upon the roof of the mouth of all mammals. The plates are arranged in a direction transverse to the long axis of the mouth, and are very numerous, as many as 370 having been counted. The blades are longest in the middle of this long series, and gradually diminish towards both ends of the mouth. The outside of the blades, that turned towards the lips, is straight and hard. The inner surface is frayed out into innumerable hair-like processes. Thus, an exceedingly efficient straining apparatus is formed. The fine hairs entangle the minute creatures upon which the Greenland whale feeds, and at the same time allows the water to escape through the sides of the mouth between the lips. A more detailed description of the mechanism of the whalebone in the Greenland whale will be found under the account of that whale. It has been suggested that certain transverse lines upon the plate of baleen are annual rings. In this event, the Greenland whale lives to an age of 900 years. The use of whalebone for ladies' stays, and formerly for the ribs of umbrellas, is well known 
but it may be one of those things not so generally known that certain rich silks which stand of themselves owe some of their firmness to very thin shreds of whalebone incorporated with the silk threads. Another little-known use of whalebone was its employment in the 13th century as plumes for helmets. This use is proved by two passages from William the Breton, where the Count of Boulogne is described as wearing upon his helmet the Branchia Bellini Bertici Ponti. This reference has been collected by M. Fisher in his careful account of the Biscayan whale, to which further reference will be made below when that species comes to be treated of. Whalebone is still a costly article. Mr. Southwell, in an article for the zoologist for 1897, upon the whale fishery of the previous year, observes that the value of the bone was 2,000 pounds per ton, as 12 right whales produce 135 and a quarter hundred weights of whalebone, the results of a successful whaling cruise are considerable. End of section 7. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 8 of the Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard, A Comparison of Whales with Other Aquatic Mammals Chapter 3 A Comparison of Whales with Other Aquatic Mammals Whales Compared to Seals In the preceding pages, a great deal has been said about the influence of environment upon structure, or to put the matter in a fairer way without prejudging the issue, of the connection between environment and structure. A study of other aquatic mammals, however, and a comparison of them with whales brings out very clearly the fact that the organism is not molded in precisely the same way in every case. It would be strange indeed if it were so, seeing that the material upon which the same influences have to work is different. The tribe of seals forms a very convenient starting point in such a series of comparisons, for there is no doubt at all about the affinities of these marine carnivora, and they show a series of stages of more and more perfect adaptation to an aquatic existence. It is easy, therefore, here to distinguish between structural features which are related to the aquatic life and those which are definite peculiarities of the group not so related. The seals unquestionably form a subdivision of the carnivora to which, on account of the fin-like character of the forelimbs, the name of pinniperia has been given. Further than this, it is possible to place them nearer to the bare division of the land carnivora than to other groups. The effects of a seafaring life are more plainly seen in the true seals than in the walrus or the sea lions. The latter group, in fact, is a stage leading towards the more completely aquatic seal. In the true seals, for Sidae, the form is more fish-like. The nostrils have come to lie upon the top of the head instead of terminally. The external ears have completely vanished, the auditory organ being marked externally by a hole only. The hind limbs are quite useless for progression on land, being quite bound up by the integuments with the tail. The sea lions can move with some rapidity upon dry land since the hind limbs have not so nearly lost their original functions. The external ears are present but much reduced. They vary, moreover, in the degree of reduction, being much larger in the Cape Sea Lion, Otaria pusilla, than in the Beast of Patagonia, Otaria jubata. In these external characters, there are certain obvious resemblances to whales. The fish-like form, the disappearance of the conch of the ear, the form of the fin, which is even falcate in form in both groups of aquatic mammals, the removal in the seals of the nostrils to the top of the skull, though not to a point so far back as in the whales. These are plain and obvious likenesses. There are others, which a closer study in comparison of the two groups bring to light. The flippers have no nails in the whales, though in the fetus traces of the structures have been discovered by Kukenthal. In the sea lions, the nails, though still recognizable, are exceedingly small and not of the faintest use for scratching or any other nail function. This is not always the case with the true seals. In Foca, the seals of our coasts, there are well-developed claws on the hand, but on the other side we have the Antarctic genus, Omatophoca with the four limbs furnished only with quite rudimentary nails. The nails, therefore, may be fairly said to be disappearing in all these animals. Another feature in which there is a functional resemblance between whales and seals is the hind limbs. Considering that the latter are merely represented by the tiny rudiments in the whales, the comparisons may seem at first sight to be a little ridiculous. But there is, as has been discovered, a functional likeness in spite of this obvious dissimilarity. The hind limbs of the seal tribe play the part of a tail, they are extended beside the tail and act precisely as to the flukes of the tail in a whale. 
It is by their means chiefly that the creature is propelled through the water. In the one group that unnecessary hind limbs have nearly disappeared altogether. In the other they have, as it were, become part of the tail. It is evident that an aquatic beast does not need the usual two pairs of limbs. The fact is shown also among fishes, but again in a different way from that which we see in whales and seals. In many fishes the hinder pair of limbs persists but is moved forward so as to lie in the same straight line or thereabouts with the anterior pairs of limbs. In primitive fishes, on the other hand, such as Ceratodus, the Australian mudfish, both limbs persist in what we have to consider as the normal position. It is exceedingly interesting to note that in the three groups cited, a practically similar result is obtained in a totally different manner. In the last mentioned character, therefore, as well as in others which will be dealt with presently, the seal tribe have pursued a different path towards complete adaptation to the aquatic life to that followed by the whale tribe. But there is still a point remaining among what are practically external features in which the seals resemble to a certain extent the whales. It is usual among terrestrial mammals for the humerus to be longer, sometimes much longer than the radius. On the other hand, with the sole exception of Inia, the whale's humerus is shorter than the radius. Dr. Mivart has given some measurements of these bones in representatives of the three kinds of aquatic carnivora, and his figures are as follows. In the common seal, Foca vitulina, the length of the humerus is 11 inches and that of the radius the same. In Otaria jubata, the Patagonian sea lion, the two bones measure respectively 23 and 24 inches. Finally, in the walrus, the proportions are 30 and 23. It is curious to observe that the sea lion is the most whale-like of the three types. Now, as to the external features in which the seal tribe differ from whales. In the first place, the former have completely retained their hairy covering. There is no hint of a commencing baldness whatever. Moreover, there is not here a case of the substitution of one organ for another that plays a similar part, for the seals have an abundant layer of fat and are pursued for purposes of oils as much as are whales. They have fur and blubber. Again, the extra length of digit required is not brought about in a cetacean fashion by the increase in the separate phalanges of the fingers, but by the formation of cartilaginous extensions of the fingers beyond the nails. That these are beyond the nails shows that they are not comparable to the extra phalanges of the whales, for the rudiments of nails which have been discovered in whales are terminally placed upon the hand. A peculiarity which the sea lion shares with the whales is the great breadth of the scapula. For some reason or other, this seems to be useful to an aquatic animal, for it is in these two types that the scapula seems to attain to its greatest diameter. It is true that in the edentis, the same bone is also very broad, and that it is relatively narrow in the manatee, but the breadth is most striking in the sea lion and in the whale. But on a close comparison of the blade bones of the two, it is to be noticed that, in spite of superficial likeness, there are fundamental differences. In the sea lion, it is in the front part of the bone, that which lies headwards of the spine, that is expanded most. In the whale, it is precisely the reverse. Hence, the same general result is brought about in a totally diverse way in the two orders of aquatic mammals. Whales and Sirenia The Sirenia form the third most important and the last group of aquatic mammalia. They are limited race today, though there are remains of more abundant genera in the past. Living now are only the two genera, Manatis and Helicor. The former are South American, West Indian and West African. They are coast-living and fluviatile animals, which browse along the bottom of the sea or of rivers upon algae. Thus is derived their name of sea cows. There seems to be four species of this genus. Helicor, the dugong, is an eastern creature apparently of only one species. Most persons are aware that quite recently there lived on the shores of Bering Straits a third variety of this group of mammals, the Rutina or Stellar Sea Cow. This has been extinct since about 1770, but as its external characters are unknown, it may come into the following comparison of Sirenia with whales. The general form of the body of these sea creatures is not especially whale-like. They offer, as it were, an intermediate, incomplete form, halfway between the purely terrestrial animal and the totally aquatic whale. Dr. Simon, who observed the dugong in Torres Straits, remarks of it that it appears to the eye more fish-like than seals and more mammal-like than whales. The dugong, however, and the retina are so far whale-like in that they possess a forked tail, set of course as in whales and not as in fish. 
In the manatee, the tail has another form, which, as has already been mentioned, it is not unsuggestive of the tail of the fetus of certain whales. It is interesting to note that here, as in some other points, the dugong and the retina are more whale-like, or at least more purely aquatic in their structural features, than is the manatee. There is one small point of possible comparison between the whales and the Sirenia which seems to have been overlooked. It is well known that the upper lip of the manatee is cleft vertically, and that the two halves of the upper lip thus divided act as a pair of grasping organs for the leaves upon which the animal feeds. Rudiments of the same structure which are more pronounced in the fetus also exist in the dugong. Now it has often been noticed that in the whales, between the two blow holes is a furrow. It seems to be just within the bounds of possibility that this group is a still further reduction of the same splitting of the lip which is so useful to the manatee. Apart from this, however, we may notice that in the Sirenia the nostrils are superior in position and that in the Halicore they are more so than in manatees. Another reason is to be seen here for regarding the dugong as the more perfectly modified animal of the two. The external ear of the Sirenia has vanished, leaving only a minute ear hole, as in the Cetacea. The body of the Sirenia is, however, more hairy than that of whales, yet the hair is scant and coarse. Dr. Kukenthal has discovered that formerly these animals possessed, in addition to the sparsely scattered strong hairs, a covering of finer hairs. In these animals, therefore, as in the whales, the aquatic life leads to the loss of the hairy covering of the body, so characteristic of land mammalia. It may be mentioned, moreover, that the hairs are especially strong upon the upper lip, thus recalling the only hairs that are left in the whales, which clothe, or rather, are found upon the same region. Sweat glands, moreover, fail entirely as in the whales. Only in Embryo of Manitus laterostris did Kukenthal find some, after all, rather doubtful traces of these glands. They are, of course, absent in whales. Finally, so far as concerns the skin, the sebaceous glands, such constant companions of the hairs in mammals generally, are beginning to vanish altogether in the Sirenia. They occur, however, though in a rudimentary shape in the fetus, while they are completely absent in the few hairs of the whales. As in the whales, the skin of the Sirenia is underlaid by a copious blubber which doubtless plays the part that should be performed by the hair of preserving the heat of the body. It has, however, been remarked that in the Sirenia the blubber is unlike that of the whales and that there is no free liquid oil compared to the spermacity of the sperm and other whales. The Sirenia have, like the whales, the forelimb of a fin-like form, but there are differences in the completeness with which this metamorphosis has progressed. The dugong has become more completely aquatic in this particular than the manatee. The latter, with the exception of the species Manatus inungus, has preserved the nails upon the extremities of the fingers, while these have entirely disappeared in the dugong. Moreover, in the latter genus the forearm no longer takes any part in the formation of this fin, a feature which, of course, is shared by the cetacea. Professor Kukenthal has, however, called attention to a curious similarity which exists between the hand of the Sirenians to that of the sea lions in the shape of numerous papillae and grooves upon the undersurface. This is associated in the Otaridae with a partial life upon land, and the existence of these structures in the Sirenia seems to indicate a more recent abandonment of the terrestrial life than has been the case with the cetacea, whose flippers are smooth. A reason for their retention, however, in the dugongs is perhaps to be found in the fact that these creatures graze upon beds of seaweed as a herbivorous mammal does upon a field of grass, and the rough papillae prevent the animal from slipping when thus engaged in cropping its food. In the skeletons of the forelimb there are no strong resemblances to the whales, for the joints between the bones are well developed and there are only slight beginnings of hyperphalange. So characteristic feature of the cetacea. When we turn to the internal structure of the sirenia, the resemblances which they exhibit to the cetacea by no means disappear. The bony framework of the head is perhaps the part of the skeleton which shows most unlikeness in the two groups, and this fact is not without significance, for it is precisely in that region that external influence would not play so strong a part as it might well be supposed to do elsewhere. The skull, remarks Professor Zittel, shows not the least resemblance to the cetaceans. Nevertheless, the nasal bones are much shortened, though that is a character found elsewhere. It is no use to give any detailed analysis of the skull in comparison with that of the whales. In the vertebral column, the fusion of the second and third vertebrae of the neck must not be looked upon as being really a strong point of likeness to whales, since in the edentata the same fusion occurs. 
More important, perhaps, as a likeness is the thin character of the centra of those vertebrae in retina. The reduction in number of the vertebrae of the lumbar region is parallel in Inia, which, as has been often remarked, would appear to be an early type of whale. The most striking as evidence of likeness between the Sirenia and the Cetacea is the shortened sternum and the fewness of the ribs attached thereto. But here again, we may have to do with the need of powerful respiratory movements in these diving animals. As to the hind limb, it is instructive to notice that a pair of hind limbs do not seem to be at all necessary to swimming and diving creatures. End of section 8. Section 9 of the Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Anderson. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 4 The Position of Whales in the System and Their Classification. In order to pursue matters in logical order, we must go back. First of all, to the question raised before, why is a whale not a fish? For the sake of those who are not well versed in the facts of comparative anatomy, it may be convenient to state briefly a few main reasons for placing the whale among the mammalia, and not only not among the fish, but also in a position remote from all other groups of vertebrate animals, that is, the amphibia, reptiles, and birds. A whale is a hot-blooded creature, breathing by means of lungs, which lie in the interior of the body in a definitive chest cavity shut off from the rest of the cavity of the body, that which contains the intestines, liver, etc. By a largely mu muscular partition, the diaphragm, it has, frequently, vestiges of the hairs which cover the body of other mam mammals in the presence of a few scattered hairs in the neighborhood of the mouth. It brings forth its young alive and suckles them with milk, the bones of the skull are precisely those of other mammals, and only differ slightly in their relative arrangement. These characters are quite sufficient for the present purpose. Many might be added to them, of course. No creature which has these characteristics is anything but a mammal. One or two of them may be wanting in those lowest of the mammalian tribe. Ornithorhychus and the echinda, they do not bring forth their young alive, but lay eggs. Still, when born, the young echinda and platypus are nourished by milk. Fishes, a very few of them, may have what are believed to be the representatives of lungs, and with which, indeed, they actually breathe. But they have, also, gills, and the vast bulk have no breathing organs except these gills. Lungs are found higher in the series, but no diaphragm like this of whales until we get to mammals. But to go further than this, and to decide whereabouts in the long series of mammals the whale tribe should be intercalated, is a matter which is at present beyond our knowledge. We may, however, discuss the matter for a little in order to show the grounds of our ignorance. From the sketch which has just been given of the outward form and the internal structure of whales, it will be apparent that the nature of the medium in which they live has profoundly affected the characters of the different organs. There is positively no part of the body, with the exception perhaps of the brain and the stomach, and one or two other points to be re referred to later, that has not been evidently altered in some way, more or less, in different cases, to meet the changed conditions of life, as we believe them to have been. There is, therefore, obviously some difficulty in ascertaining, or endeavoring to ascertain, what are the real dif differential characters of the group. To separate, that is to say, characters due to the environment and those which have been inherited from the long-extinct terrestrial ancestor. The current definitions of the group Cetaceae are obliged to be found on these, as we must assume them to be recently acquired characteristics, to take one or two as examples. Professor Ziddle defines them in the following terms, naked, smooth skin, fish-like water dwellers with cylindrical body head not separable from the body, nasal orifices on the upper side lying far back, interior limbs fin-like, hind limbs wanting, tail fin horizontal, milk glands abdominal in position. Messrs. Parker and Haswell use the following language, aquatic urethra with large head, fish-like, fusiform body, devoid of hair covering, 
with the pectoral limbs paddle-like, the pelvic limbs absent, and with a horizontal caudal fin. A vertical dorsal fin is usually present. There is a long snout and two nostrils open by two lateral external apertures, or a single medium one, situated in all recent forms far back towards the summit of the head. The cervical region of the spinal column is very short, and its vertebrae usually completely united together. Clavicles are absent. The humerus is freely movable at the shoulder, but all other articulations of the limbs are imperfect. The phalanges of the second and third digit always exceed in number the number three, normal in mammalia. The pelvis is represented by a pair of horizontal plated styliform, vestiges of the ischia. Teeth may be absent and their place taken by sheets of baleen or whalebone. When present, they may be numerous and homodont, or less numerous and heterodont, or reduced to a single pair. The epiglottis and the arytenoids are prolonged and embraced by the soft palate so as to form a continuous tube for the passage of air from the nasal cavities to the trachea. The brain is large and the cere cerebral hemispheres are richly convoluted. The testes are abdominal, the teats are two, and are posterior in position. The uterus is two-horned, the placenta diffuse and non-deciduated. This definition is more comprehensive, but it still does not state all those features in which whales differ from other animals, which are not clearly connected with the need for a fish-like form, and life at times in great depths of the ocean. It seems possible to extract from what has been said here as essential characteristics of the group in the following facts of structure. In the skull, the separation of the two parietals by the intervention of the supraoctipical, or their concealment by its overlapping, the overlapping of the muzzle generally by the premaxillae, the loose attachment between various bones surrounding or connecting with the organ of hearing, the absence or feeble development of the coronary process of the lower jaw, in the forelimb and girdle, the absence of clavicle, the greater number of the radius and the ulna than the humerus, the frequent presence of the typical number of bones in the wrist, the long and simple lungs, the unlobulated liver and complex stomach, the extraordinary shortened but much convoluted brain. This combination of characters is found nowhere else among the mammals, and, indeed, the bulk of the peculiarities are confined to the whales. I might also perhaps have added some few others, this, and certainly more than a, one characteristic feature might have been included in the list, had I not limited myself to those which occur both in whalebone and in toothed whales, as there is some idea to the effect that the two great divisions of the Cetaceae have had a separate descent, even from unlike ancestors this had, however, better be deferred until after we have seen what can be done with the broader facts in settling the affinities of this highly puzzling group of creatures. It is to be feared that nothing can be done except, and that vaguely, to suggest an undulate-like ancestor. In them, we have in some forms at least the ruminants, a highly complex stomach, and a rather simple liver. But there is really nothing else of first-rate importance to make the comparison stronger, as undoubted, whales occur back to the Eocene. They have possibly come off from earlier stock still, and Professor Albrecht has advanced and ingeniously supported the view that the cetaceae are the nearest thing now existing to the necessary but unfortunately hypothetical promammalia, the race which has given rise to all mammals. His arguments will be partially gone into here for at any rate they will give some color to a primitive ancestry of our whales, a result to which other considerations, chiefly the failure to tack them on, even with probability anywhere else, seem to drive us. Unfortunately, as a general rule, it is by no means easy to distinguish between simplicity which is in the effect of degeneration and simplicity which, which may be fairly interpreted. As a retention of earlier and simpler conditions of structure, sometimes it is to be obvious enough to which category to refer an apparently primitive state of affairs in an organ. For example, while everyone admits nowadays that the amphibia are close to the fishes, 
no one would probably suggest that the total absence of lungs in certain salamanders is due to the final disappearance of the air bladder of the fish-like ancestor, whose disappearance is commencing to be indicated by the loss of a connection with the esophagus in many fishes. It is a question of simplicity and degeneration within the tribe of newts themselves, and when Professor Albreach alleges the absence of a sacrum in the ventral column as a primitive character, it seems impossible to accept his view and to do otherwise than regard his simplification of the ventral column as due to the dwindling hind legs, and to the consequent absence of any need for strong support from the vertebral column. Again, whales have not only not an external ear in the adult conditions, but also no ear muscles, which are so highly developed in terrestrial mammals with mobile ears. In criticizing Professor Albrecht's statements and suggestions, Professor Max Weber points out that sometime since Professor Howes showed in the photal porpoise rudiments of external ears and of muscle, which can hardly be regarded as a beginning of these structures, so essential to an ear which plays an important part in the life of terrestrial mammals, for they are not only found in the embryo, if commencing structures they should be more apparent in the adult. Vestiges, remains of former structures, indicate their earlier existence by appearing for a brief time during development and then fading away as maturity is reached. Some other features in the organization of cetacea may perhaps be interpretive as really primitive. Among the whalebone whales, the two halves of the lower jaw are not only united by what is termed syndesmosis, a weak union by ligament than the strong bony union, and clisolis, which is prevalent in mammals generally. It may be urged, however, to do with the mode in which rorquals and right whales feet. The capacity for taking in enormous gulps of water containing the minute animals upon which the majority of these whales feed should be advantaged by a distensibility of the mouth and consequent increase of the mouth cavity. Of more importance in connection with the anatomy of the lower jaw is the discovery by Professor Albrecht of a separate superangular bone. It is a distinguishing feature of the mammals as contrasted with the reptiles lying beneath them in the series, that the lower jaw is almost entirely formed of dentary bone alone, a small chin bone sometimes occurring also. Now in reptiles, a large number of separate elements enter into its formation, so that at the occasional occurrence in Balloptera sibaldi of the superangular is so far an archaic feature. So too, possibly, is the marked separation of the sternum into two hemisterna. This is particularly apparent in the coccolot and in the siaphoids. Now the sternum is developed from the ends of the ribs on both sides, and in the embryo it is always double. Later the fusion of the two halves takes place, and the apparently median sternum arises. In lower vertebrates the double connection often survives. That there is often a seventh cervical rib in whales is a remnant of a former state of affairs, for in reptiles there are a series of ribs depending from the neck vertebrae. But after all such an additional rib has been often met with in other mammals, Professor Albrecht points out that the cetacean re resemble the fish and that the occipital bone joins the frontal. It is no doubt, as has already been pointed out, a very curious fact in their anatomy, but one not easily susceptible of an explanation. But to liken them to fishes for this reason seems to prove too much. For what we want on the promammalian theory is rather a likeness with lowly organized reptiles. It cannot, of course, be seriously maintained, as Professor Albert would have us believe, that the dorsal fin is an inheritance from a fish. Dr. Meary's comparison of it from to the hump of a camel is far better. Professor Weber has just dwelt upon the excessive complicated brain, and upon the mode of the attachment of the fetus to its mother, in support of the more orthodox view that the whales are not primitive mammalia at all. If we are to place them in this position, we must displace monotreous mammals, ornithorhynchus and echinda, whose organization in so many points places them unquestionably at the base of existing mammals. The general conclusion which best suits the facts at our disposal seems to be to look upon the cetaceae as an offshoot of an early group of the higher mammalia. This is unsatisfactory in its vagueness, no doubt. But it is difficult to see what more can be said, which is not entirely speculative and devoid of foundation in ascertained fact. Having then attempted, and it must be, candidly confessed, failed, to place the whales accurately in the system, it remains to arrange them with reference to each other. It is easier to do this than to solve the first problem. 
There is, however, an initial difficulty and the great superficial likeness which the various members of the whale tribe bear to each other. It needs no argument to prove that the Mammalia are essentially a land race other than those which have already been advanced. To inhibit the water is a mode of life entirely foreign to their organization. It is perhaps this which, in part at least, accounts for the uniformity of structure which the large group of whales exhibit. So little divergence from the suitable structure would be just the fatal straw. We find as a support of this way of looking at the matter, similar uniformities in groups which inhabit are usually medium. The groups of birds, for example, which contain as enormously large number of different species, and is yet characterized by so great a uniformity of organization that the task of classifying them has proved insuperable, is an example of a race which has probably been modified to the aerial life from a life among the branches of the trees. Here again, a certain organization is needed to live that life, and wide departures from the most fitting style of structure are not to be seen. A slight structural divergence might easily prove fatal to the perfect fulfillment of their functions as flying animals. Everyone is agreed that the orders of birds are separated from each other by characters of far less importance than those which separate many, if not all, of the orders of purely terrestrial mammalia. The Cetaceae, it is true, form but one group equivalent to Ungulata, Thrudentia, etc. But it would seem that they are more alike, one genus with another, an external build and internal conformation, than are either two groups sided. There are, for example, larger differences in the organs of digestion among the rodents and ungulates than are met with in the whales. The variability of external form it is hardly necessary to dwell upon. The teeth differ much more from one rodent genus to another or from one ungulate genius to another, than in the whales, generally speaking. Fish, on the other hand, are born and bred to the aquatic life, shown just as many, if not more, divergences of structure as do the mammals. The expression fish-like is, it is true, often used to describe a certain shape. But what would be more utterly different in shape than a skate and an eel, or a sunfish and a sole? Here we have the precise converse of the case afforded by whales, the whole organization being fitted into the marine or freshwater life. There is ample room for much variation without affecting the necessary essentials. Bearing in mind, then, the profound influence which the aquatic life seems to have had in molding the external as well as the internal form of whales, it is not surprising that several naturalists have arrived at the conclusion that those structural differences which do exist argue the justice of dividing the group into two great orders, the toothed and the whalebone whales, which have arisen from separate ancestors and have only come to resemble each other in various details owing to convergence, i.e. the likeness is superficial and due to similar conditions, not similar descent. This convergence is not an uncommon fact in nature. Such likenesses, as there are between the seals and whales and between the manatees and the whales, are examples. Flying rodents and flying marmosupials exhibit another instance of the same phenomenon. In technical zoological parlance, then, by those who believe the whales to be two groups originally distinct from each other, which have come to lie side by side, they would be spoken of as diphyletic that there do not appear to be any annectant forms between the toothed and the whalebone whales, is so far in favor of this view. But much more than is necessary to lend even a color of probability to the suggestion. It is perfectly true that the two great divisions of the Mystocosetae and the Odontocetae are, as will be seen from the definitions which follow, separated from each other by exceedingly trenchant characters. So, for the matter of that, are the Archaeocetae from both. But what appears fatal to us is the idea of a double origin as the exact correspondence in certain structures, which, so to speak, need not necessarily have been the same. Among these, the peculiar form of the scalpula stands preeminent. It is only in whales, and it is in all whales, that this shape of scalpula is met with. End of section 9. Section 10 of the Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Joseph Tabler. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bettered. The Hunting of Wales. The economic products of Wales are, not in order of importance, one, the flesh, two, the bones, three, the whalebone, and four, the oil derived from the blubber. It is for these substances that they are hunted. The first two need not detain us long. The flesh of the caying whale, as noticed on page 28, is utilized by the inhabitants of the Orkneys as food, and that of various other whales is eaten, but it is not an article of at all general consumption. The bones as well as the flesh can be and are utilized, in the case of stranded whales, for manure, and the ribs have been at various times and by different peoples used to build huts with. Nearchus relates how the natives of the Mediterranean built houses of these bones, and the structures of the same kind are illustrated by Oleus Magnus. The oil of whales is derived from the blubber, which, as already said, forms a thick coating immediately underlying the skin. Besides, there is in many whales, especially in the sperm whale, a certain amount of clear oil contained in the head, which is solid when cold and is known as spermaceti but you must first catch your whale and then extract the oil the use of whale oil seems to be very ancient m pouchet tells of a convent mentioned in the life of st philibert which had run short of oil in answer to the prayers of the inmates a large whale was found stranded the next day this was in the year six eighty four m pouchet thinks that whales were more frequently stranded in old times than now for that reason not being hunted they were necessarily more numerous. It seems to be hardly a matter for doubt that whales were first of all utilized only when stranded on the shore, and very numerous are the records of whales cast up upon our coasts and those of other European countries. A number of these events are collected together by Van Beneden in his Cetisees de Mers de Europe, and more recently Perona has described the whales of the Italian shores. There are numerous other scattered and more or less elaborate enumerations of the stranding of different species of whales. John Evelyn, in his diary, records a large whale which came ashore near to his house. It seems probably, from the size and other suggestions, to have been a roqual. Here is his description. A large whale was taken betwixt my land, butting on the Thames and Greenwich, which drew an infinite concourse to see it, by water, horse, coach, and on foot from london and all parts it appeared first below greenwich at low water for at high water it would have destroyed all the boats but lying now in shallow water encompassed with boats after a long conflict it was killed with a harping iron struck in the head out of which spouted blood and water by two tunnels and after a horrid groan it ran quite on shore and died its length was fifty eight foot height sixteen black skinned like coach leather very small eyes great tail only two small fins and picked snout and a mouth so wide that diverse men might have stood upright in it no teeth but sucked slime only as through a grate of that bone which we call whalebone the throat yet so narrow as would not have admitted the least of fishes the extremes of the cetaceous bones hung downwards from the upper jaw and was hairy towards the ends and bottom with inside all of it prodigious but in nothing more wonderful than that an animal of so great a bulk should be nourished only by slime through those grates in hollinshed's chronicle we read that in fifteen thirty one the five and twentieth of may between london and gravesend were taken two great fishes called whirlpools male and female these were presumably either balenoptera or perhaps more likely sperm whales the expression whirlpool for large whales was very common at that period earlier still and also in the thames we hear from fabian's chronicle that in the year fourteen seventy two were taken at erith within twelve miles of london four wonderful fishes whereof one was called moors marini the second a sword fish and the other two were whales which after some expositors were pronostications of war and trouble the moors marine of this description one would think could hardly be a walrus but it was very possibly an orca 
of which three individuals came up the Thames so lately as 1890. The notion of the appearance of these huge whales being a portent of dire trouble is common. In Stowe's London is recorded the standing in the Thames at Blackwall of a Parmaceti whale, the sperm whale, of course. A curious variant in the spelling of this word occurs in Baker's Chronicle, where the stranding of a sperm whale is recorded, and the writer goes on to remark the oil being boiled out of the head was Parmacita. For the following account of a whale hunt in olden times and also up the Thames, I am indebted to the Reverend William Hunt. The story comes from the Chronica Majora of Matthew Paris. The date is 1240. Ballinet surciter undicem praetor alias belluas marinas in litore maris angelie contermino mortue e quasi in aliquo certamine lesse sunt progette unde natu e senores maris confinia habitantes acerabant bella fuis in auditum inter paesis belluas e monstra marina cue sese ad in visem mordentia e colindentia alterno empertu entero morant unda mortua ex elis ad alitora sunt progetta decorum pisium numero unus monstrose immanitatis bellua in tamensam veniens vis inter pilas pontes ilesus patrantiere admenerium autum regio quod montelac mortlake dicitur in sequentibus multis navigatoribus cum funibus e balistas e arcubus perveniens ibidem jaculorum ictibus vis est peremptus no season passes without the record of a few whales stranded upon the shores of great britain and it is to this fortunate circumstance that our knowledge of whales is so largely due the discovery of the economic value of many parts of these huge monsters led naturally to their pursuit either from the shore or in the open sea as to the actual date of the first active hunting of whales there is dispute the real date of the origin of this pursuit being difficult to ascertain some say that the basques were the earliest race to engage in the pursuit of whales as a commercial enterprise others hold that the norwegians were the pioneers in this branch of industry probably whales were first of all hunted from the shore as indeed they are now in the case of the californian gray whale off the pacific shores of north america as to the norwegians the following passage may be quoted from j ross brown as early as eight eighty seven according to anderson in his historical and chronological deduction of the origin of commerce or as haklut thinks about eight ninety our excellent king alfred received from one okther a norwegian an account of his discoveries northward on the coast of norway a coast which appears to have been very little if at all known to the anglo-saxons there is one very remarkable thing in this account for he tells king alfred that he sailed along the norway coast so far north as commonly the whale hunters used to travel which shows the great antiquity of whale fishing though undoubtedly then and long after the use of what is usually called whalebone was not known so that they fished for whales merely on account of their fat or oil this story seems to show not merely a great antiquity for the pursuit of whales but that the fishery was carried on from the shore no doubt as soon as the value of stranded whales was ascertained they would be hunted in this fashion and then as the shore-coming whales got scarcer they would be pursued by the whalers further and further into the ocean anyhow whatever may be the actual date of the first practicing of whaling as an industry it is clear that it was known in this country as early as before the year one thousand for there is an interesting dialogue preserved written by one elfric abbot of ensham in which the subject of whaling is dealt with this is in the form of a conversation between the master and his pupils written in order to familiarize the pupils with latin conversation the master begins by inquiring what is to be caught in the sea the pupil then enumerates the following curious assortment of marketable marine fishes alices et isicios delphinos et sturias astreas 
et cancros musculos et torniculos neptigalos platerios et platesses et polypodes et multi alia then the master vis capere aliquem setum nic the reason is then demanded the youth is supposed to reply quia periculosum est capere setum tutius est mihim ire ad amnem cum nave mea quam ire cum multibus navibus in venationem balene et tamen the pastor goes on to say multi capiunt setus et evadant pericula it is plain therefore that whaling was practised presumably in this country at that date it should be explained that the word setus also means whale balena means a sea monster generally this is rather remarkable considering the derivation of setus from the homeric word which seems to mean a sea monster generally balena usually definitely means whale but the words hval and hranis seem to put the matter beyond doubt the american whale fishery began at any rate as early as the year sixteen fourteen at first the animals were pursued from the shore and the island of nantucket was the headquarters of the industry the whales were watched for from a tall spar and when the animal was seen to spout the boats immediately set out in pursuit the whale when captured was towed ashore and the flensing carried out on the beach shore whaling however was after no great a period abandoned for the reason that the whales had begun to get scarce ships were then fitted out for long voyages and in seventeen ninety a ship fitted out at new bedford doubled cape horn and really inaugurated the south pacific whale fishery the names of the ships are characteristic of the date captain scammon tells us that one of the first vessels to cross the atlantic in search of whales in the year seventeen seventy was named the no duty on tea the whale trade went on increasing for many years in leaps and bounds in seventeen seventy five there were as many as three hundred vessels engaged in the industry and by eighteen forty six the total number of ships had increased to about seven hundred thirty representing an aggregate tonnage of two hundred thirty three thousand one hundred eighty nine tons at this period the investments connected with the business are said to have been at least seventy million dollars and seventy thousand persons derived their chief support from the whaling interests that year according to the statistics given by captain scammon was apparently the culmination of the whale trade in america for we observe a gradual diminution of the number of vessels until the year in which the statistics end to wit eighteen seventy two in this year the number of ships was altogether only two hundred eighteen representing a tonnage of fifty two thousand seven hundred one that there should be this decrease is not surprising when we learn from the same table of statistics that during the years eighteen thirty five to eighteen seventy two about two hundred ninety two thousand seven hundred fourteen whales must have been either captured or destroyed to write an adequate account of the whaling industry would it need a volume to itself we can only give a few facts there is no doubt that here as in other countries the pursuit of whales has fallen off enormously in the last fifty years this is to be partly explained by the increasing rarity of the more valuable kinds and partly to the replacement of the substances for which whales are hunted by cheaper substitutes captain ewell harbour master of the port of dundee has been good enough to give me some valuable information with regard to the state of the whaling industry at that town for incorporation into the present volume writing to me in june eighteen ninety eight mr ewell stated that in that year the whaling vessels equipped at dundee had met with but scant success this fact coupled with the great fall in the price of oil and the enormous expense of the voyage has reduced the industry to such a point that only five vessels have left this season the following table also kindly supplied to me by captain ewell shows the number of ships and the number of whales caught in a series of years commencing with eighteen fifty nine the decrease of both sets of figures is most noteworthy moreover the heaviest decrease is in the number of whales whereas in eighteen sixty one eight vessels captured between them one hundred twenty one whales the same number of ships in eighteen ninety seven 
only secured nine whales this tells its own story for some further details of whale fisheries the reader is referred to the sections dealing with the greenland whale and the southern whalebone whale end of section ten section eleven of the book of whales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 6, Part 1. The Right Whales. The whalebone whales, Mista Cosetti, are separated by all naturalists from the toothed whales as a distinct division which is characterized by the possession of whalebone. This is not, however, the only feature which distinguishes the whalebone whales from the odontoceti. The skull is nearly symmetrical. In fact, it is not perceptibly asymmetrical. The nasal bones are equal or sub-equal in size, and in their characters more like those of a ordinary mammals. They are placed side by side, have truncated ends, and roof over the nasal passage to the extent of their length. The frontal bones are not overlapped by the maxillae as they are in toothed whales. There is a distinct lacrimal bone. The two rami of the mandible meet only at the very end and for a very short space. They are, moreover, as a rule, connected at their junction by ligament only. They are much bowed outwards and enclose a spoon-shaped area. The skull, as a whole, is more or less arched, most so, in the right whales. This structural peculiarity is obviously connected with the presence of whalebone and is less developed in the rorquals, where the whalebone is shortest. The ribs are never attached to the vertebrae by more than one head, which is the tubercular head, i.e., that articulating with the transverse process of the vertebrae. The sternum is always in one piece, and only a single pair of ribs articulate with it. It is always very small in proportion to the size of the body, and does not represent a fused sternum of several segments, but the manubrium only. It is usual, perhaps, to divide the Mista Cosetti into two families, the Balenidae and the Balenopteridae. This arrangement is that followed by Gray in his catalogue. It is the arrangement found in many textbooks of zoology. In his supplement, however, Gray laid still greater emphasis upon the structural divergences to be seen among the whalebone whales and arranged them thus suborder one balenoidea containing but a single family balenidae and suborder two balenopteridea containing the families agaphelidae megapteridae physalidae and balenopteridae. The other extreme is accepted by most writers who allow but a single family, balenidae. I am disposed to allow the two families, balenidae and balenopteridae, but there is something to be said for but a single family, chiefly on account of the characters of 
Rachia nectes and Neobalaena. It is rather curious that Dr. Gray, with his liberality in the manufacture of families, did not dignify the last named by creating a special family for it, especially as he divided the Rorquals into two families. Both Rachianectes and Neobalena to some extent interfere with the naturalness of the families Balenidae and Balenopteridae, and so does that less known genus Agaphelus, if really distinct, with which Cope at first united Rachianectes. Rachianectes has the general outline of a rorqual, but there is no dorsal fin and the throat plates of Baleonoptera are reduced to two. The baleen, however, is short as in the Rorquals. The skeletal characters are also to some extent intermediate. The cervical vertebrae are free as in Rorquals. The sternum is as in that group and so on the whole is the form of the skull but when the skull is seen from the side, the premaxillaries are as obvious as in the Greenland whale, and the forepart of the skull is narrow as in that cetacean. The scapula, moreover, is not so elongated as in the rorquals, but has more the shape of that in the genus Balena. Neobalena is placed by Gray among the Balenidae, but it has several balenopteroid characters. It is, however, a true balena in the length of the baleen and in the consequent arching of the skull. But the frontal bones are rather the processes of those bones which cover over the orbit are broad as in Balenoptera, and not so narrow as in the right whales. The skull, as a whole, is not so disproportionate to the body as in the genus Balena. It is more like a rorqual in this particular. Finally, the scapula is rorqual-like in its anteroposterior elongation. It is not nearly so high as in the right whale. On the other hand, the sternum marks affinities of Neobalena with Balena. I should be disposed to describe Neobalena as a Balena with affinities to Balenoptera and Rachianectes as a Balenoptera with affinities to Balena. Concerning Agaphelus, we have less information. Of the two genera just mentioned, there are skeletons in the British Museum which I have been able to study. Agaphelus has no dorsal fin and is said to be without throat plates, but this has been stated of Rachianectes, which is figured by Scammon as having two of those plates. On the other hand, the baleen is like that of Balenoptera in being short. The scapula is like that of the same genus. Further information is required before the genus can be placed with an approximation to accuracy. Family Balenidae. Skull very much arched and narrow anteriorly. Lower jaw without marked coronoid process. Cervical vertebrae fused. Baleen very long. Pectoral limbs short. No grooves on throat. The last character may prove to be not applicable to Neobalena, which is, as already explained, somewhat intermediate between the right whales and the rorquals. This family of whales contains but two genera, 
and these include between them probably not more than three species, of which two are referable to Balena. Genus Balena Size large, 50 to 60 feet No dorsal fin Head more than one-fourth of the length of the body Orbital process of frontal not wider than downward process of maxilla Scapula rather high 12 to 15 pairs of ribs hind limbs consisting of a pelvic bone, femur, and tibia. The right whales, as it is usual to term the Greenland whale and the southern whalebone whale, are so termed on account of the fact that they are the right kind of whale for the whaler to attack. Their whalebone is finer and longer than that of others, and the oil is more abundant and of a superior quality. These whales are characterized in addition to the characters given in the definition, which are not found in the allied genus Neobalena by the enormous head and the peculiar form of the mouth, which is shown in the accompanying illustration. The skull is mainly distinguishable from that of Neobalena by the characters of the frontal and maxilla given in the diagnosis. This character is very plain on an examination. It is an interesting fact to note from Professor Huxley's figure of a fetal southern right whale given in his Anatomy of Vertebrates that in the fetus the frontal in its proportions more approaches that of Neobalena and the Rorquals. This is so far confirmatory evidence of the view that this genus is the most modified of whalebone whales. On the other hand, it must be remembered that the greater perfection of the hind limb points to a less modified condition than that which is exhibited by Balenoptera, where the limb is still further reduced. And furthermore, the ribs point to a more primitive stage in Balena. In the Rorquals and Neobalena, very few have capitular processes. In a specimen of Balena biscayensis at the British Museum, of the 14 ribs present, the first two had no capitulum, but the ten following on each side were provided with capitular processes. There would seem to be some little vagueness about the number of ribs in this genus. Vagueness is, however, readily produced by deficient specimens, and this fact may easily account for some of the discrepancies but there would not seem to be any method by which a less number of ribs should be converted into a greater. The Greenland whale is characterized by Mr. Lydica as possessing but 12 ribs, and thus distinguished from its southern congeners, which has 15. The skeleton of Balena mysticetus at Brussels, is described by Sir W. Flower as having 14 pairs of ribs, though the usual number is stated as 13. The sternum of Balena is not cross-shaped as in Rorquals. It is oval, decreasing in diameter behind, or somewhat heart-shaped in contour. The scapula is high, thus contrasting with the more elongated scapula of the Rorquals. It is, or perhaps rather has been, a matter of dispute as to how many species of whale are embraced in the general expression right whale. It is the prevailing opinion at present that there are but two properly established forms, i.e. the Greenland whale and the southern right whale. Balena australis, but it may be that there are others.
Scoresby writes of tribes of whales inhabiting different regions which are to be distinguished by different proportions of head and trunk. Those inhabiting southern latitudes, he observes, have commonly long heads and bodies compared with their circumference, moderately thick blubber and long whalebone. Those of the mean fishing latitude, that is, 78 to 79 degrees, have more commonly short, broad heads compared with the size of the body. In some individuals, the head is at least one-third of the whole length of the body, but in others scarcely two-sevenths. Inasmuch as whalebone whales, undoubtedly belonging to this genus Balena, occur in all the ocean from north to south, from east to west, it is at least possible that there are different races. But on the other hand, the facts which have been gathered in support of such contention are not convincing. Certainly it does not appear justifiable to erect, as has been done, a large number of distinct genera for the inclusion of these right wells. Thus the late Dr. Gray allowed in his catalogue, besides Balena, Eubalena, Hunterius, Caperea, and Macleaius. Neobalena, on the other hand, which will be dealt with presently, is clearly entitled to generic rank. As to Macleaius, it appears to have been founded on a mistaken impression gathered from an imperfect photographic representation. At best, it depends entirely and only upon the cervical vertebrae of which the altus was at first thought by Gray to be distinct. This would be, if it were true, a difference. But though that character is dropped by Dr. Gray in his supplementary catalogue from further information received, the genus is valiantly retained. Hunterius Teminki was based upon a young and incomplete skeleton in the Leyden Museum, described also by Schlegel and Flower. Its chief character is that the first rib is very broad, with two heads attached to the transverse process of the first and second dorsal vertebrae. As a matter of fact, the statement itself is inaccurate, for Sir W. Flower pointed out that the attachment was in all probability to the last cervical and first dorsal, the apparent position being due to a mistake on the part of the articulator of the skeleton. This character may surely be dismissed as an abnormality, for in the figure which is given the rib is clearly two ankylosed ribs. It is bifid not only at the head, but at the other extreme. And moreover, the same state of affairs was found by Sir W. Flower in an example of the southern right whale B. australis. Furthermore, in the thinner Baleoptera rostrata, a similar double rib has been recorded, and in the British Museum the skeleton of Rachianectes shows an identical state of affairs. Van Beneden asserts the same as an occasional character of the porpoise and globicephalus. The only other character of importance mentioned in the diagnosis of the genus is the existence of 15 pairs of ribs, a character which exactly fits in with the assumption that this whale is nothing but a specimen of Balena australis. Caperia, the New Zealand whale, has even less claims, if possible, 
to be considered a valid genus. It is practically based upon a slight difference in the form of the tympanic bone. The slight development of the acromion is apparently a question of age and deficient ossification. Finally, there is Eubalena to be considered. The main characters of this are that it has 15 pairs of ribs, of which the first is not bifid. It seems to be merely a variation on the theme of Balena australis. As to the species of this genus Balena, there can be no question of the existence of two, the Greenland whale, B. mysticetus, and the southern right whale, B. australis. The former is extremely limited in range, being entirely confined to the polar seas. The latter is worldwide and probably includes all the whales already spoken of under the various generic names already criticized. Balena mysticetus. The species may be thus characterized. Length 50 to 65, rarely 70 feet. Head one third of the length of the body. Whalebone 10 to 11, rarely 13 feet in length. Color black. Under part of jaw white. 13 pairs of ribs, about 54 vertebrae. This is the Greenland whale, right whale or whalebone whale, is a purely polar species never descending as far as our coasts. The reputed occurrences of right whale in British seas seem to concern Balena australis. This great creature, bulky though it undoubtedly is, has been very much overrated as to its size. Scoresby, whose experience was large, says in his account of the Arctic regions that such dimensions as 80 or 100 feet are quite absurd. Of 322 individuals, in the capture of which Scoresby was himself concerned, not a single one exceeded 60 feet in length. The largest ever measured by himself was only 58 feet. An unusual specimen caught off Spitsbergen at the beginning of the century was barely 70 feet in length, though its whalebone was as long as 15 feet. Even the older observers, who had a tendency to exaggerate the size of these sea monsters, were not always unreliable upon this point. Edge, at the beginning of the 17th century, contended himself with describing the Greenland whale as a sea beast of huge bigness, about 65 foot long. The head of this whale is about a third of its total length. There is a slightly hairy covering in the form of a few scattered short white hairs at the extremity of both jaws. Though the whale is usually black, Scoresby relates that he has seen specimens that were piebald all over. An exaggeration of the occasional white tracts that are normal for the species. This whale has no voice, though they make a loud noise in spouting. It swims slowly, usually at the rate of four miles an hour, but when diving they reach a velocity of seven to nine miles an hour. This velocity is so great that whales have been found to dive to the bottom of the water a mile in depth and to break the lower jaw by the violence of the impact. The time which whales can remain under water has been also exaggerated. It has been asserted that they can endure submersion for many hours. 
As a general rule, five or ten minutes is the period, varied by two minutes' breathing space. But when feeding, fifteen or twenty minutes is not unusual. Scoresby mentions a harpooned whale as having dived for a period of forty minutes, and Scammon assigns one hour and twenty minutes as the limit of endurance. The Greenland whale produces a single foal, or a sucker, at birth. The young creature, when born, is ten to fourteen feet long. The mother does not desert it until the expiration of a year or so, and the amount of maternal affection exhibited has been often commented upon. Scoresby, who was compelled to mingle commercial enterprise with due regard to the sentimentality of the twenties, remarks that there is something extremely painful in the destruction of a whale when thus evincing a degree of affectionate regard for its offspring that would do honour to the superior intelligence of human beings. Yet the object of the adventure, the value of the prize, the joy of the capture, cannot be sacrificed to feelings of compassion. This whale is not really gregarious. When a number are seen together, it is an accident due to their having congregated at the same feeding spot. There are various thrilling stories of adventures with harpooned whales, but it seems that the dangers are not due to any ferocity on the part of the animal itself, which is one of the most timid of beasts, so much so, indeed, that a bird alighting upon its back sometimes sets it off in great agitation and terror. It is in this respect markedly unlike the fierce and malicious Californian whale. The accidents that have happened to the whalers are simply due to the struggles of the great beast when harpooned. They are not purposely directed at its enemies at all. But it is said that a Greenland whale cannot throw up into the air in the way that Scoresby depicts in an oft-copied picture a boat and its crew. Since a whale of 60 feet in length would weigh 100 tons, it is not at all surprising that the lashing of its tail and its terrified rushes may prove extremely dangerous. It has been mentioned that there are slight variations in the Greenland whale chiefly concerning the proportions of the head and trunk. Scammon distinguishes the bowhead or great polar whale from the right whale of the northwestern coast, Balena Sieboldi of Gray, but this latter whale is probably Balena australis, which will be dealt with on another page. This whale has the longest whalebone of all whalebone whales. In a whale of 47 feet long, the bone was as much as 10 feet 6 inches long. The length may even reach 12 feet, and the color is black, not piebald or white, which is met with other whales. There may be 350 or more of the laminae of whalebone on each side of the mouth, Scammon relates that 370 layers of whalebone is the largest number that he ever counted. The typical bowhead, which Scammon does not differentiate from the Balena mysticetus, occurs chiefly in the vicinity of Bering Strait. In the Sea of Okhotsk, there is to be found, in addition to the typical Greenland whale, a smaller variety called in the vernacular of the American whalers, Poggy. This creature yields but a small quantity of oil, as compared with its larger relatives. They yield per whale from 75 to 200 barrels. The Poggy only furnishes from 20 to 25 barrels. Many whalemen, proceeds Captain Scammon, 
are of the opinion that this is a different species. There is little doubt, however, of this being a young whale of the same species, as its blubber is close and fine, producing but little oil in proportion to size of body, as is the case with all calves or young whales of every description. Nevertheless, Scammon is of opinion that this sea does contain a distinct variety of the common Greenland whale, which he terms and figures as Roy's bunchback. Its most characteristic feature is a small hump, or bunch a little, in front of the tail, a structure which resembles the series of low humps found on the back of the sperm whale, and is no doubt the vanishing equivalent of the strongly marked dorsal fin of other whales. It is said that these whales yield a larger amount of bone in proportion to oil, and that the blowholes are situated higher up. End of section 11. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 12 of The Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 6, Part 2 The right whale, and the following statements apply, of course, to the southern as well as to the polar right whale, feeds, as is well known, upon minute pelagic creatures. The minuteness of the food led the ancients to the belief that they lived upon water only pteropods and crustacea form the bulk of its food which it has not therefore to laboriously collect the arctic seas are often dyed for acres with these small floating animals and thus as dryden accurately observes in the anus mirabilis the whales need to give no chase but swallow in the fry which, through their gaping jaws, mistake the way. But when engaged in feeding, the whale hardly lies behind some promontory, as another poet suggests, but as Scammon better puts it, moves through its native element, either below or near the surface, with considerable velocity, his jaws being open, whereby a body of water enters its capacious mouth, and along with it the animalculae, termed by the whalemen right whale feed or brit. The whale's mouth is enormous, and its capacity is enlarged by the outward sweep of the rami of the lower jaw which have together a spoon-like contour. The plates of whalebone act as strainers, and the method of their action has been elaborately described by the late Captain Gray. The following account, an abridgment of his, is borrowed from Sir William Flower. How these immensely long blades, depending vertically from the plate, were packed into a mouth the height of which has scarcely more than half their length, was a mystery not solved until a few years ago. Captain David Gray, of Peterhead, at my request, first gave us a clear idea of the arrangement of the baleen in the Greenland whale and showed that the purpose of its wonderful elasticity was not primarily, at least, 
the benefit of the corset and umbrella makers, but that it was essential for the correct performance of its functions. The length and delicate structure of the baleen provides an efficient strainer or hair sieve by which the water can be drained off. If the baleen were, as in the rorquals, short and rigid, and only of the length of the aperture between the upper and lower jaws when the mouth was shut, when the jaws were separated, a space would be left beneath it through which the water and the minute particles of food would escape together. But instead of this, the long, slender, brush-like ends of the whalebone blades, when the mouth is closed, fold back, the front ones passing below the hinder ones in a channel lying between the tongue and the bone of the lower jaw. When the mouth is opened, their elasticity causes them to straighten out like a bow that is unbent, so that at whatever distance the jaws are separated, the strainer remains in perfect action, filling the whole of the interval. The mechanical perfection of the arrangement is completed by the great development of the lower lip, which rises stiffly above the jawbone and prevents the long, slender, flexible ends of the baleen being carried outwards by the rush of water from the mouth when its cavity is being diminished by the closure of the jaws and raising of the tongue. The food thus filtered off by the action of the whalebone and the raising of the tongue is shutting off the jaws, is left stranded upon the gigantic tongue, and then swallowed down the narrow throat. It is accordingly not advantageous that this tongue should be mobile and muscular. It is, as a matter of fact, mainly formed of a mass of spongy fat intermixed with sinewy flesh. The second species, Balena australis, Demoulin, must probably include the following rather formidable list of synonyms. B. Biscayensis, gray. B. Siebaldi, gray. B. Japonica, gray. Hunterius teminki, gray. B. Antipodarum, gray. B. Antarctica, Schlegel. B. Mediterranea, gray. B. Angulata, gray. B. North Copper, gray. B. Capensis, gray. B. Cisarctica, cope. B. Eubalena, flower. Hunterus Swedenborgi, Liliaborg. Macleaius australiensis, grey. M. Britannicus, grey. B. Tarentina, Capellini. B. Alutiensis, Van Beneden. B. Culiomoc, Camiso. B. Culamaca, Camiso. It may be thus defined head relatively smaller than in B. mysticetus, two-sevenths minus two-eighths of body lengths, whale bone also shorter, ribs 15, 57 vertebrae. This list of synonyms includes the names given to the whales, which were probably at most no more than local races of but one species. But with all of them it is by no means easy to be certain of the justice of this view. Thus, since 
Macleayus britannicus is only known by its cervical vertebrae, it is conceivable, though not in the least likely, that it is a different form. But of those whales with different names, that much is known about. There seem to be but little doubt that they are all one and the same species. To believe in existence of 20 species of right whales, in addition to the Greenland right whale, is too large a draft upon credulity to be honoured at present. At every page in describing the natural history of whales, it is necessary to make statements with great care and to allow a due amount of qualification. It may be that the large number of synonyms which it appears to me to be necessary to include in the description of this species are really proper varieties at least, or even distinct forms. As has before been stated, there does not appear much reason to accept the numerous genera which Gray allowed. But as a species, the affair is different, since these whales do not live or at least are not common in the tropics, but prefer the temperate waters both north and south of the equator, it might be urged that the northern were distinct from the southern species, and this is and has been the opinion of many. On the other hand, Sir William Flower is inclined to believe in the existence of but a single balena beside the Greenland whale, and with this opinion I associate myself. The most marked characteristics of this whale has been given in the above diagnosis of Balena australis, but the number of ribs appear to be a character that is not absolutely fixed. As a rule, Balena mysticetus has but 13 ribs, while B. australis has as many as 15. Sir W. Flower, however, described some years since an undoubtedly Arctic whale with 14 ribs, the last being rudimentary and only 18 inches in length. Still, here are 14 ribs. With this fact must be compared the figure of Balena japonica, here regarded as synonym of B. australis, which, according to a Japanese artist, has also 14 pairs of ribs. The accuracy of the Japanese is so well known that we must hesitate before rejecting the fact. Neither, apparently, can the length of the plates of the baleen be absolutely relied upon as a character diagnostic of Balena australis. Generally, the baleen is coarser and shorter than that of Balena mysticetus. It is figured, for example, by Scammon as rather more than one-fourth less in length than that of its ally. Six feet is the length assigned by Gray to the baleen of Eubalena australis, but of Eubalena siebaldi, the baleen is stated by the same author to be nearly as long as the Greenland, varying from 7 to 12 feet long and slender. The difference, therefore, is in the latter instance not great. A very singular feature of balena, especially of the present species, is the so-called bonnet. This is a horny, irregular mass drawing on the snout. The irregular shape and pitted appearance of the bonnet gives one the impression that it is a pathological structure, a kind of corn perhaps produced by the animal rubbing itself against rocks, as this species has been observed to do in order to get rid of the barnacles which are apt to infest it. It is not large, 
eleven inches being about the length of a large one, and this was eight inches in width. It is spoken of as a rudimentary frontal horn by Gray, and a comparison with an ungulate horn, especially that of a rhinoceros, is highly interesting in view of the disputed affinities of whales. We cannot, however, press this comparison at present. As to the habits of this whale, they seem to be much those of its nearest ally. They go about singly, in pairs, or three together. Towards the end of the session, Scammon tells us that they congregate in herds, which are technically known as gams. This is previous to migration, and the whales of the southern hemisphere are also migratory. Balena australis has the same strong maternal affection that characterizes Balena mysticetus. This is illustrated by the recital of the capture of a whale in the Bay of St. Sebastian, quoted by M. Fisher, to whom science is indebted for a great deal of collected information about this and other whales. When the mother whale saw her young captured, instead of flying, she made unheard of attempts to free it, describing a circle round the boats without hurting them. Sometimes she pressed the cub under her great fins and tried to drag it away. Sometimes she dived with it, disappeared, and reappeared at some distance. But the enterprise was not easy. The ropes were strong and the three harpoons well embedded. Later on, the cub escaped through the mother breaking. By a stroke of her powerful tail, the ropes attached to the harpoons. But the young one died, and the mother followed and remained near his dead body, regardless of musket shots fired at her, and only went away on the following day. This whale, which was once more abundant on the coast of Europe than it appears to be now, has been much hunted, especially by the Basques, who have left their mark upon the whaling industry by the very word harpoon. Of this industry, a number of important observations on the spot and references to the literature have been collected by M. Fisher and the memoir just referred to, and nearly the same time by Mr. now Sir Clements Markham. It would seem that they were fished up on the shores of Flanders so long ago as the year 875. But in these remote periods, it is by no means always certain that whale is meant by the descriptive expression used. Even Balena itself does not always apply in these early records to the whalebone whale, and the term crassus piscis is clearly even more vague in its possible significances. We learn that in all times the habits and customs of the Basques resembled those of their not very distant neighbors, the Normans. They lived along the shores and, as a rule, picked up living there. When the fishery was not productive, they occupied themselves in pillaging inland. The whales were attacked when they approached the shore to bear their young. They were driven on the shore and dispatched there. The earliest document relative to this fishery is dated from the year 1150. It is in the shape of privileges granted by Sancho the Wise to the city of San Sebastian. A little later, in 1197, John Lackland, King of England, gave to 
Vital de Biole and his heirs to take 50 Angevin pounds on the two first whales captured each year at Biarritz in exchange for the fees which King Richard, his brother, had given him on account of the fishery of Guernsey. The pursuit of the Biscayan whale was at its height at this period, and for some time afterwards. Its importance is shown by the fact that a whale is incorporated into the coast of arms of many cities lying upon the Bay of Biscay. This charge, remarks Sir C. Markham, is in the arms of Fuentarabia, over the portal of the first old house in the steep street of Guetaria, there is a shield of arms consisting of whales amidst waves of the sea. At Motrico, the town arms consist of a whale in the sea harpooned and with a boat with men holding the line. The same device is carved on the wall of the town hall of Lequito. The arms of Bermeo and Castro Udiales also contain a whale. Other traces of the former prevalence of this industry are to be seen in the remains of Vigias or lookout towers, whence the whales were first espied and fleet of boats sent out in pursuit. In the 16th century, the trade was still important. We find Rondelecius, 1568, remarking upon Bayonne as a center of the trade and the flesh, especially the tongue, was eaten, being exposed in the markets of Bayonne, Biarritz, and other towns. A curious example is given by Sir Clements Markham in proof of the importance of the industry, even so late as 1712. In the records of a marriage at Lequito, the bride and bridegroom between them possessed all the necessary outfit for a whaling voyage. Ambroise Payer, quoted by Fisher, has given an elaborate account of whale fishing in the Bay of Biscay in the year 1564, a part of which we shall quote here as serving to illustrate how the Biscayan whale was hunted at that period. It is taken at certain times of winter in many places, including the coast of Bayonne, near a little village distant three leagues or about from the said town and named Biaris. Opposite that village there is a hill upon which, from a long time back, has been built a tower, one of the Vigias already referred to. Entirely for this pursuit, day and night, to discover the baleines, which pass, and perceiving them coming partly by the loud noise they make, and partly by the water which they throw out by a conduit which they possess in the middle of the forehead. And when they perceive them to come, they ring a bell, at the sound of which promptly all those in the village run with their apparatus, which is requisite to take these animals. They have several boats and skiffs, in some of which there are men whose only duty is to fish up those who may have fallen into the water. The others are used for the combat, and in each of them there are ten men, strong and capable of rowing well, and several others with barbed darts, which are marked with their mark to recognize them again, attached to cords, and which are thrown with all their force at the whales. After the whale is killed, the whalers feast, font godecere, and depart, each with his share, 
which is calculated by the harpoons already in the body and of course known to their possessors. This author, from whom we have just quoted remarks upon the affection of females for their young, and the comparative case, therefore, with which they are captured. After the beginning of the 18th century, the industry seems to have decayed, on account of the growing rarity of the whales. In the 19th century, but two or three records of this occurrence in the bay are to be found. The genus Neobalena may be thus characterized. Size small, 20 feet about. Head not large. No throat grooves. A small falcate dorsal fin. Frontals broad. 17 pairs of ribs very broad and flat. Vertebrae C7, fused D18, L2, CAU16. Whalebone long. Scapula broad, not high. This very remarkable genus of whalebone whales bears the same kind of relation to the great balena that Kogia does to its equally gigantic ally, Fisseter. In both cases, also the dwarf form is to some extent intermediate in its characters, thus illustrating a generalization applicable to a good many groups, that archaic characters are not usually coupled with extremes of size. To Dr. Gray may have been justly allowed some jubilation concerning this whale. He separated it as distinct on account of its whalebone and, as it has turned out very rightly, as Neobalena is represented by but a single species, it is clearly impossible to disentangle from each other the characters which belong to Neobalena as a genus from those which should be held to distinguish Neobalena marginata as a species. Indeed, the two skeletons of this whale in the fine collection of cetaceans in the British Museum shows certain differences which may be specific if they are not sexual. It is from an examination of those two skeletons that the following notes have been drawn up. Neobalena has a very short vertebral column, the total number of vertebrae being only 43. The complete fusion of the cervicals allies the genus to the right whales. The most noteworthy point that I observed concerning the dorsal vertebrae was the fact that the first dorsal apparently bears no rib. As this was the case in both specimens, it seems unlikely that it has dropped off. The number of the dorsal vertebrae is therefore one in excess of the number of ribs. This number was not constant in the two specimens. The larger had 18, the smaller whale 17 dorsal vertebrae. In any case, Neobalena has more dorsals than any other cetacean. It has also fewer lumbars. There are two in one and one in the smaller specimen. The only other cetacean in which anything like so small a series of lumbars occurs is Inia see page 297, and there the number is 3. The ribs of this cetacean are remarkable for many reasons. Their number, 17, is in excess of that known elsewhere. In one specimen, it is true, there are but 16, a number which occurs in the largest whalebone whale, Balenoptera sibaldi. As already observed, the first rib 
is attached to the second dorsal vertebra. A remarkable state of affairs upon which I have commented elsewhere. The ribs are attached only to the transverse processes of their vertebrae, and there apparently not very firmly. The second to the fifth ribs, however, have a neck and head produced beyond the tuberculum towards the centrum, which, however, they do not seem to reach. If Neobalena is an especially diving whale capable of longer submersion than some others, the lax attachment of the ribs may conceivably be explained as furthering this capability, for it would allow it of a greater expansion of the contained lungs. Another feature in which the ribs are remarkable is the great breadth and flatness. This brings them close together into a thick armature for the protection of the underlying viscera. The condition of the ribs is suggestive of the sirenia and of many ungulates. Neobalena marginata of Gray, perhaps Caperia antipodarum, Gray, IB, page 101, in part, is the only species of the genus. End of section 12. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 13 of The Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 7, Part 1. The Rorquals. Family Balenopteridae. This family may be distinguished from that of Balenidae by the following definition. Head less than quarter of the length of the body. Dorsal fin usually present. Throat with longitudinal plates more or fewer in number. Bones of skull, but slightly arched. Tympanic bones, more elongated. Coronoid process of mandible, more or less developed. Cervical vertebrae, usually free. Hand narrow and tetradactylous. Balin plates short. Cecum, present. This family of whales comprises at least three well-marked genera, the Rorquals, genus Balenoptera, the Humpbacks, genus Megaptera, and finally the recently known California grey whale, Rachianectes. We shall commence with a consideration of the Rorquals, which will be here included with a single genus. This is probably the prevailing opinion at present, though many naturalists, even Sir William Flower, in his earlier memoirs, have divided the existing Rorquals into three or even more genera. We shall clear the ground by defining the genus, of which, of course, the definition will be, in the opinion of some, applicable to a subfamily. Genus Balenoptera Dorsal fin present and falcate Throat plates numerous Scapula low and broad with long acromion and coracoid process In considering whether or not it is advisable to divide the only four really definable species into different genera we may at once discard Benedenia, founded upon an immature specimen, Rudolphius, which is the same as Sibaldius, the two names having been given to identical species, Sibaldius and 
flaverius again have both been applied to what we term here Balaenoptera borealis, so that one of them at least may be discarded, and that one must obviously be flaverius, as it is the newer name. Balena is clearly to be left out of consideration, as it is, or rather has been, in the hands of older authors of wide applicability, embracing all the whalebone whales. Physalus is an older name than Pterobalena, for the same species and the same applies to Ogmobalena. So we may in this way weed down the generic names of the Rorquals to Balenoptera, Sibaldius, and Physalus. These three genera were accepted by Flower in his paper on the skeletons of whales in the principal museums of Holland and Belgium, in Proc, Zoll, Sock, already referred to. If we add to these Cuvierus for the fourth species described in the present work as Balenoptera sibaldi, we shall have exhausted the possible generic names for the only four species known. But are they wanted? It seems to be a reasonable procedure in zoological nomenclature to invent generic names for the due pigeonholing of a group which embraces a large number of species. It facilitates memory and expresses a notion of classification. But when a group is so restricted, as is that of the Rorquals, this procedure seems to be superfluous, especially since the utmost differences between the recognized forms are so small. All these great creatures are so much alike that their confusion, one with another, is almost inextricable. When species has been so confounded and confused with species, it seems to be a deliberate sarcasm to attempt generic definitions. Besides, now that the group has emerged from the complexity in which the labours of Dr. Gray involved it, we are able to see clearly how slight are the anatomical differences which distinguish the different forms. We think, therefore, that the best plan will be to give some sketch of the external characters and osteology of the Rorquals, and to mention the differences which enable the different forms to be distinguished from each other. The number of vertebrae differs, and the following table shows the number for a series of individuals. B. musculus, C7, D15, L14 or 15, CA26. B. borealis, C7, D13 or 14, L13, 14 or 16, CA19. B. rostrata, C7, D11, L12, CA17, B. Sibaldi, C7, D15, L15, CA28. It is the rule for the whales of this genus to have all the cervical vertebrae free from each other, not ankylosed in the typical whale fashion, but occasionally two or three are partially fused. This is described by flower as occurring in B. rostrata. Nor is this occasional peculiarity confined to the species rostrata. It has been mentioned as occurring in B. borealis. As to the number of vertebrae, it is noteworthy that it bears some relation to the size of the creatures. Thus, the smallest species... B. rostrata 
has the smallest number of vertebrae, and the largest species, B. sibaldi, the largest number of vertebrae. It is a feature of this genus for the first rib to be bifid. This structural feature, as has been pointed out, occurs in other cetacea and has been made use of for systematic purposes. The late Professor van Beneden, however, observes that it is wrongly that zoologists have thought it their duty to attach a certain importance to this arrangement, which is purely individual. But it is very general. Thus, van Beneden remarks that it has been found to characterize all the examples of B. borealis that have been examined from this point of view, with the exception of a specimen studied by Sir W. Turner in 1882. This state of affairs characterizes the two specimens in the British Museum, and therefore the number of ribs allowed in the table on page 147 must be increased by one, for there can be no doubt that this two-headed rib represents two as it is articulated with the transverse process of the two vertebrae. As is the case with all Mystacoceti except Rachia nectus, the first few ribs have capitular processes, but these processes do not articulate directly with the centra of their respective vertebrae. In B. musculus, the first three ribs have these processes. In B. borealis, I noticed four. In B. sibaldi, there were again only three, the last two of which were so much longer that they may perhaps articulate directly with the centra. Professor Delage has directed attention to the fact that the only rib, the first, which articulates with the sternum, does so by two heads. It is, first of all, attached by an articular surface, and then by a pseudo-articular fibrous surface. This double attachment is, it seems, paralleled in edentates. The sternum of Balenoptera is usually somewhat cruciform bone, such as is displayed in the figure on page 44. The cross-like outline is not always so well marked, and differences in the proportions of the limbs of the cross are evident, and are certainly in some cases due to varying condition of maturity. Thus Sir W. Flower has figured the sternum of B. borealis, in which the ossified portion consisted only of a roundish piece of bone, the cruciform shape of the entire sternum being, however, shown in the surrounding cartilaginous regions. As to the number of phalanges in the hand of various species of Balenoptera, the following table from Kukenthal gives the ascertained facts. B. Sibaldi, 1, 1, 2, 5, 3, 7, 4, 7, 5, 4. B. Borealis, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 7, 4, 7, 5, 4. B. Musculus, 1, 1, 2, 4, 3, 7, 4, 6, 5, 4. B. Musculus, 1, 0, 2, 5, 3, 6, 4, 7, 5, 4. B. Musculus, 1, 1, 2, 4. 3, 6, 4, 6, 5, 5, B. rostrata, 1, 1, 
two, four, three, eight, four, seven, five, four. B. rostrata. One, zero, two, four, three, seven, four, six, five, three. But these tables, according to Kukenthal, have to be corrected by his discovery of a rudimentary finger, figure 2, page 9, lying between the third and the fourth of the above enumeration. This consisted in an embryo of Balenoptera musculus of three slender phalanges lying at the upper, free, end of the interspace between the digits already mentioned. In this case, the reputed thumb will be a prepolex, and the missing digit will be number three. An obvious conclusion with regard to this rudiment is to regard it as a division of a digit, such as has been described in the beluga. But certain considerations derived from the distribution of the nerves in the hand of this whale seem to negative this view and to establish the theory that it is really digit three which has thus nearly disappeared. The whales of the genus Balenoptera have a much more elongated form than those of the genus Balena. They are also to be distinguished by the presence of a dorsal fin not large in proportion to the body, which is situated quite at the posterior end of the body. The elongated form conduces towards a greater swiftness of movement, and for this, among other reasons, the finners, as these whales are termed, are not such profitable creatures to pursue as are the more lethargic right whales. Besides, the whalebone is short and the blubber less in amount and inferior in quality. Some two feet is the average of length of the whalebone, which contrasts with the 12 or 13 feet in length of the bone of the Greenland whale. More accurate measurements of the whalebone of the rorquals is given under the definitions of the four species below. Nevertheless, the rorquals are hunted, particularly from the coast of Norway, and an interesting account of some facts in the fishery has been recently communicated to the Zoological Society of London by Professor Collett. It is a curious thing that these whales are sometimes pursued with poisoned harpoons. The poison consists in the decaying flesh of a dead whale, and its effect is to set up septicemia. The simplicity of this mode of poisoning the prey is curiously paralleled by the poisoned arrows of certain African tribes who use the decaying mud of marshes, the effect in this case being tetanus. The rorquals are among those whales that have preserved a trace of the primitive hairy covering. There are a few hairs present in the adults of these whales and in an embryo of B. sibaldi, van Beneden figures, 11 hairs on each side of the upper jaw and 4 on each side of the lower. A highly characteristic feature of the rorquals is the series of longitudinal folds in the throat region. They share these with the genera Rachianectes and Megaptera alone among whalebone whales, but the Ziphioids have a few folds in the same region, which are possibly comparable. The number of these folds in species of Balenoptera varies somewhat. B. rostrata has been stated to possess 54 to 60. In B. sibaldi, Turner counted 60. 
A larger number, according to Murie, characterizes B. musculus, for in a specimen of that whale he estimated the total number at about a hundred. These folds, although spoken of as throat folds, really reach back then the throat region indeed to a point considerably behind the attachment of the pectoral fin. Kukenthal as well, long before him, Esricht, have pointed out that these folds are not found in the youngest embryos, a fact which renders their comparison with the apparently corresponding folds of the Ziphioid whales unlikely. In B. musculus, they were first visible in an embryo of more than 60 centimeters long. The meaning, from a physiological point of view, of these folds is to be sought from the fashion in which the whales take in its food. Like the genus Balena, Balenoptera takes in huge masses of crustacea and other minute organisms, which are swallowed after the accompanying water is strained off through the whalebone. But in Balena, the mouth is especially huge, owing to the arched form of the skull, a feature so characteristic of that genus and one which distinguishes it from Balenoptera. To make up for the reduced size of the mouth cavity, the equally colossal Balenoptera can expand this cavity by means of the said folds, which then enable the skin to be puffed out when the need for the increase in mouth capacity is past the folds form again. A Balenoptera without throat grooves has been mentioned by Olafsen and Povelsen, quoted by F. Cuvier, but the veracity, or at least powers of observation, of these two writers is discounted by the fact that they assign a length of 200 feet to the right whale and speak of the marmenil or marine man as an extinct fact. But perhaps, after all, they had seen Rachianectes, unknown, of course, to Cuvier. As to the different species of Balenoptera, there are, as it appears, certainly four. We shall, therefore, deal with these four, and then say a few words about finners, which have got different names. Dr. Collett, in a paper already alluded to in relation to the fishery of the whales, has in a convenient way summed up the specific characters of these four northern whales. We say northern, though, as will be pointed out, it is probable that the southern forms are really of the same species. Balenoptera sibaldi, grey, equals B. latirostris, flower, and has probably other synonyms, has a length of 70 to 85 feet. Robust in form for a rorqual, Proportions of height and length being as one, five and a half. Color dark bluish gray. Dorsal fin at commencement of last quarter of the body. Vent situated in front of vertical line from anterior margin of dorsal fin. Pectoral fins large, one seventh of the total length of the body. Baleen and bristles black. Number of plates up to 400. Their length 930 mm. This, the greatest of whales, and indeed of all animals living or extinct, is named in honor of Sir Robert Sibbald, author of the Phalenologia Nova and inventor question mark, of the high-finned cachalot. 
It is to be distinguished from other Rorquals by its superior size and by the various other characters given in the above description of its essential features. The whalers know it by its large size and by the height to which it spouts. Its speed, too, when going rapidly, is great. Something like 12 miles an hour are accomplished by a Balenoptera sibaldii when putting its best foot foremost. It is a species that feeds upon crustacea, mainly it appears upon a species of Euphogia, known to the Scandinavian whalers as krill. These crustacea have been discovered in vast numbers in the stomach of captured whales. Balenoptera sibaldi is a species that lives mainly in pairs, and reproduction seems to take place every three years more slowly than in the case of the smaller species of Balenoptera. Balenoptera borealis, lesson, equals B. rostrata, Rudolphi, B. laticeps, gray, is in length 40 to 50 feet, height to length as 1 to 5.5, color bluish black above, below white. Upper surface with oblong light spots. Dorsal fin high, a little in advance of last third of the body. Vent exactly below hinder edge of dorsal fin. Pectoral fins small, one eleventh of the total length of the body. Baleen black with white bristles. Number of plates, 330. Greatest length, 650 millimeters. See figure 22. Of these species, known as Rudolfi Rorqual, and by the Norwegians as Seival, a very complete account of external characters and habits is given by Professor Collett. As will be seen from the dimensions given, in the above definition, this is a moderately sized Rorqual. It seems clear, therefore, that even allowing for the inevitable exaggeration that seems to have accompanied most descriptions of whales, at any rate in the past, it cannot be identical with the Ostend whale, referred by Gray under this specific heading. For the latter, measured 102 feet, two exclamation marks. It is probably a B. sibaldi. As to color, I give Professor Collette's statements under this head as part of the specific definition. But Sir William Flower, in describing a specimen stranded near the mouth of the river Crouch in Essex, quotes Mr. Carrington, to the effect that the whale within two days of its capture was a rich glossy black which shaded into a brilliant white on the underparts. But little of this whale was known until the establishment of a whale factory at Sorveur near Hammerfest in 1882. The main object of this establishment was the capture of the great Balenoptera sibaldi, which, as the largest, is the most valuable of the Rorquals. But the present species proved to be the commoner of the two. It had been thought to be a rare whale, up to and including 1884, but nine individuals had been stranded on the European coasts. When the actual fishery began, as many as 40 whales were taken in 1883 and 44 in 1885. The intervening year produced but three. This whale goes about in shoals. Colette mentions 13 and 5 as numbers of individuals in such companies. 
but it appears that as many as 50 is the limit in size of these shoals. Balenoptera borealis is inoffensive in character, and accidents are the result of accident, as is generally the case with whalebone whales, excepting only the fierce Rachianectes. Under the description of the right whale, the time that it can remain under water is given as a little over one hour at most. But as to the present species, and the remarks appear to fit all the species of Balenoptera, Professor Collett says, All the whalers are unanimous in opinion that B. borealis, as well as B. musculus and B. sibaldi, can remain under water for a far greater time than is generally supposed. The duration of this time is estimated to be from 8 to 12 hours. This is, if true, a most extraordinary fact. The whales are fished from the shore, and the best period is from the 24th of June to the 8th of July. After this, they leave the shore on the advent of B. musculus and B. sibaldi. B. borealis seems to feed entirely on crustaceans, chiefly the little cope pod Calanus funmarchicus. This species may be recognized by its very high dorsal fin. The two sexes show no difference in size. The furrows on the throat are about 38 to 58 in number. The adult female has 26 hairs on each side of the lower jaw. In the fetus there are more, 34 or counted on the lower and 11 on the upper jaw. The baleen plates are usually black and the bristles white. But there is something a mottling or even a few of the foremost plates may be white. The blowholes lie in the two long furrows between which is a shorter furrow. Balenoptera rostrata, gray. Length 25 to 33 feet. Proportion of the height to length as 1 to 5. Color grayish black above white below. Dorsal fin high at commencement of last third of the body. Vent below hind edge of dorsal fin. Pectoral fin one eighth of the total length of the body. Plates of baleen about 325. Greatest length 200 millimeters. This is much the smallest of the rorquals. It is particularly to be distinguished from other rorquals by the white band which crosses the pectoral limb and by the sharp snout, hence the specific name of rostrata. The bone, too, is always of a pale color, and there are but eleven ribs. Hence, this species of Balenoptera is exceedingly easy to characterize. This whale, which appears to have a liking for the society of the larger Balenoptera, pursues fishes. And Hunter noted the discovery of dog fishes in the stomach of an individual which he dissected. It has been noted, too, that the stomach contains pebbles. This is curious. For in the other whales and in sea lions, the same observation has been made. Possibly in both cases, the stones were taken up accidentally while in pursuit of fish. One can hardly believe that any idea of ballast entered into the mind of the cetacean. Balenoptera musculus, Linnaeus, known also as B. Fisalus, Fabricius, B. Rorquel, Lacepede, 
physalus antiquorum, Gray, is in length 60 to 70 feet. Height as to length as 1 to 6 and 3 quarters. Color, gray slate above, white below. Dorsal fin, low, with straight margins, placed slightly in front of last fourth of the body. Vent corresponding in position with its anterior margin. Pectoral fin, one ninth of the total length of the body. Plates of baleen, dark bluish black, also bristles. Number of plates up to 370. Length 950 millimeters. This is perhaps, speaking from standard examples, the commonest species of Rorqual. Specimens are stranded, remarks Mr. Lidecker, on the British coasts, more especially those of the southern parts of England. Almost every year, generally after stormy weather and very frequently during the winter. Dr. Murray, who described many points in the structure of a 60-foot-long individual which was killed at Gravesend in 1859, describes the number of throat plates as somewhere about 100. In this individual, the dorsal fin measured only 15 inches in height. A curious asymmetry in the coloration of this species has been noted by more than one observer. A sort of pleuronectism, Van Beneden terms it. The body is sometimes paler upon one side than upon the other. Apparently there is no constancy as to which side is the paler or the darker. This Balenoptera devours fish and as many as 800 individuals of Osmerus arcticus have been found in the stomach of a whale. It is chiefly herrings that it pursues on the coasts of Norway and Great Britain. The four species just characterized are the only species that are really known to exist. But the genus is by no means confined to the northern hemisphere whence the individuals have been found whose study has allowed of the compilation of the above diagnosis. There are plenty of Balenoptera in the southern hemisphere, of the coast of Patagonia, Kerguelen, in the Indian Ocean and elsewhere. These whales have been placed in different species by Gray and others. It may be that such a placing is correct, and at any rate we have before us an instance of a large whale which has an extremely restricted range in the true Greenland whale. Possibly, also, Rachianectus is another. But notwithstanding this a priori consideration, there seem to be no substantial grounds for retaining such species as B. indica, B. pataconica, B. sclegeli, etc. As to external characters, the bulk of these extra-European Balenoptera are not known, and it is always possible that there may be such characters which would justify their separation specifically. But as to such parts of the skeleton as are known, there is no such justification. Sir W. Turner, in his account of the cetacean, remains collected by the challenger, had no hesitation in referring these bones to some of the four known species of rorquals. Two Pacific whales are known by different names and as observation upon some of their characteristics are mentioned by Scammon, some little account will be given here. But it is probably that B. 
sufureus is nothing more than B. sibaldi, while the white band upon the flipper of B. davidsoni seems to show its identity with B. rostrata. End of section 13. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 14 of The Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 7, Part 2. Balenoptera davidsoni of Scammon, the sharp headed finner whale, is a small species of which only one example, measuring 27 feet, was examined. It was full grown, as is evinced by the fact that from it was withdrawn a fetus of 5 feet 6 inches in length. It had very pointed pectorals, with a white band above and near the bases. The baleen is pure white, 270, lamina on each side of the mouth, the longest lamina measuring 10 inches. The color of the animal was dull black above, white below, and the underside of both pectoral and caudal fins was also white. The throat had 70 longitudinal folds. The blubber of this whale averaged 3 inches in thickness, and the yield of oil was about 300 gallons. This whale goes about singly, and when it spouts it makes a quick, faint spout, like that of a calf, which accounts for its having been considered to be the young of some other species. The sulphur bottom whale, Balenoptera sibaldius sufureus, cope, is a huge creature of which an example has been measured and found to be 95 feet in length with a girth of 39. In this individual, the baleen was 4 feet in length and the yield of oil 110 barrels. The animal weighed 147 tons. It derives its name from the yellowish color of the underparts. The back is lighter in color than is usual and is sometimes very light brown, approaching to white. This whale occurs in the Atlantic as well as in the Pacific. As other whales are wont to do, the sulphur bottom will often follow ships. Dr. Stillman relates how a whale of this species followed the ship in which he was a passenger for no less than 24 consecutive days. In spite of volley after volley of rifle shots and missiles of all kinds, the whale adhered to the ship, which caused some anxiety, as it was feared that he might unship the rudder or do other damage. The only harm that happened was that the whale rose to blow almost into the cabin windows. Balenoptera australis, the sulphur bottom of Antarctic whalers, is, according to von Haast, nothing more than B. musculus. A specimen, which he describes, was thrown up about five miles from Christchurch, New Zealand, and 67 feet in length. As the creature was much injured by sharks, the external characters could not be given with even an approach to precision. But the skeleton seemed to show clearly that there were no recognizable differences from Balenoptera musculus. But then, as already said, two quite different species might 
conceivably have a quite similar skeleton, showing their specific difference only in colour and other outward features. The genus Megaptera is distinguished by the following assemblage of characters. Dorsal fin not very prominent. Throat plates very numerous. Scapula with no marked acromion or coracoid process. Pectoral fin very elongate. Megaptera is not widely removed in its structural characters from Balenoptera. Externally, it is to be distinguished by its more ungainly form, its very long pectoral limbs, which are fringed along the anterior margin, and by the low dorsal fin. The tail is also fringed with numerous serrations, but they are unconnected with deeper lying parts. In the case of the flipper, the rounded processes of the margin are the outward expression of the bulging of the interphalangeal cartilages. The skeleton of Megaptera has been described by many. The most elaborate account of it, with which I am acquainted, is contained in a paper by Sir John Struthers. Generally speaking, the differences from Balenoptera are neither numerous nor important. The seven cervical vertebrae are not united. There are 14 dorsals, 10 lumbar, and 21 caudals. The sternum of Megaptera is not widely different from that of Balenoptera. It has a somewhat cruciform shape. The first rib, and that only, is attached to it by a single continuous ligamentous connection. There are not two distinct attachments as in Balenoptera musculus, as described by Struthers and Delage. The scapula is peculiar in the practical absence of both acromion and coracoid process. It is moreover higher and not so long as in Balenoptera, having more the shape so far of a sternum of balena. The differing proportions of greatest length and height of the sterna of Megaptera and Balenoptera can be appreciated from the following measurements. Megaptera, length 42 inches, height 30 inches. Balenoptera musculus, length 39 inches, height 22.5 inches. The pelvic bone is provided with a small femur, a feature in which the present genus resembles certain species of Balenoptera. There is, however, apparently no trace of tibia, such as occurs in the Greenland whale. The head is often studded with tubercles, and so is the margin of the flipper. The throat has the longitudinal grooves so characteristic of the family Balenopteridae. These, however, vary in number considerably, and species seem to have been partly characterized by their numbers. Some of the numbers given by Scammon and the sex and total length of the whales in question are as follows. Number 1. Male. Length 49 feet 7 inches. Guler folds 26. Number 2. Female. Length 48 feet. Guler folds 21. Number 3. Female. Length 48 feet. Guler folds 18. Number 4. Female. Length 52 feet. Guler folds? Question mark. They are never so numerous, it will be noted, as in Balenoptera. Scammon has found that this whale varies more than others in the production of oil, a circumstance which would seem to be dependent on the condition of the animal at the time of capture. 
It also depends upon sex and the period of breeding for the female, when, accompanied by a cub to whom she is giving suck, has less blubber than at other times. The baleen on the whale, as in the case of rorquals, is no longer than two to three feet. The only species of the genus that can be safely allowed at present is Megaptera longimana, Rudolfi, of which the following must then be regarded as merely synonyms. Balena bops, Fabricius, B. Pescop, Demoulin, B. Lalandi, Fischer, Balenoptera capensis, Smith, Balenoptera leucopteron, Lesson, Megaptera nove zelandiae, Gray, Megaptera barmeisteri, Gray, Megaptera americana, Gray, Balena antarctica, Temenc, M. Cusira, Gray, M. Versabilis, Cope, M. Osphia, Cope. Notwithstanding the immense variety of names given in the above synonyms, Sir W. Flower and most others think that there is but a single humpbacked whale of universal range. As to a goodly number of the late Dr. Gray's species, Captain Scammons observes, We have frequently recognized upon the California coast every species here described, and even in the same school or gram. Moreover, we have experienced the greatest difficulty in finding any two of these strange animals externally alike or possessing any marked, generic, or specific differences. If there are differences of color, Scammon goes on to remark, the number of species must be quite indefinite, as every combination and permutation of black, white, and gray are to be found in their color. It is pointed out, however, by M. M. Van Beneden and Gervais, in their Osteographie de Cetacé, that the southern form of Megaptera, which has been termed M. lalandii, differs from the northern by certain features in the scapula. In the former animal, there is a distinct, though small, projection from the margin of the blade bone in front, which occupies the place of an acromion and what is more remarkable, an acromion like that of platanista, that is, arising from the edge of the scapula. Of this process, there is no trace in the northern megaptera, but, on the other hand, the faint process, not so well marked and lying lower down on the bone, occupying, in fact, rather the position of a rudimentary coracoid process. The name humpbacked applied to this cetacean is due to the low dorsal fin, in the relative size of which, however, there seems from the various figures published to be some differences. It is, however, to be distinguished from the rorquals proper by its ungainly form and the great length of the pectoral fins, 13 feet or so. Its color is usually black, pure white on the under surface of the tail and flipper. In disposition, observes Mr. Lidiker, it is neither very timorous nor very fierce and is consequently easy to capture. It seems thus to have an intuitive knowledge of the poorness of its oil and the shortness of its bone. Acting upon this, it will swim fearlessly round boats, and when these whales are in herds, as is sometimes the case, 
some caution has to be exercised to avoid collision with them. The humpback is much addicted, remarks Captain Scammon, to breaching, bolting, and finning, which vices mean, it should be explained, leaping out of the water, shooting out diagonally, and striking the water with its flukes. During the breeding season, Megaptera is remarkable for its amorous antics. At such times, their caresses are of the most amusing and novel character, and these performances have doubtless given rise to the fabulous tales of the swordfish and thrasher attacking whales. When lying side by side of each other, the Megapteras frequently administer alternate blows with their long fins, which love pats may, on a still day, be heard at a distance of miles. They may also be seen to roll about in the water and beat themselves with their long flippers, but this seems to be due to an anxiety to rid themselves of the parasites which infest them. These whales, like others, are also to be noted for their affection towards their young. The fact that they will leap clean out of the water appears to distinguish the whales of this genus from any other whalebone whales. Goldberg states that this whale carries its young for 10 to 12 months. Only one, rarely two, are produced at a time. There is some relation between size and time of gestation. For Balenoptera sibaldi, a larger species, carries its young over a year. Other Balenopteras have the same period of gestation as Megaptera. The foal, as in whales generally, is born one-third to one-quarter of the length of the mother. Dr. Gray thinks that Balenoptera jubartes of Lacipidae equal Balena bobs of Linnaeus is the same whale as the common Rorqual, Balenoptera musculus. It seems, however, to be likely from the figure, bad enough, it is true, that Lacipidae gives of it especially on account of the warts upon the face that the animal is really the humpback. It is related by Lacipidae that the animal was in his time let alone by the Icelanders. Probably the real reason is that which protects it at the present time, i.e. the inferiority of its valuable productions. But the author, whom we quote, observes that the whale was held to be the friend of man, like the Amazonian dolphin referred to on page 271. It is related that when the frail barks of the natives are surrounded by the ferocious and carnivorous cetacea of the north, which threatens danger, the Megaptera will endeavor to rescue its friends from the danger which environs them and will accompany them until they arrive close to shore and have escaped the sperm whales, of whose real ferocity, lascivity, is fully convinced. The genus Rachianectus may be thus defined. Dorsal fin, non. Throat plates, reduced to two. Scapula, high. This genus was described some years since by Cope. I am able to write the following brief notice of the principal characters of the skeleton after examining a complete skeleton in the British Museum. The skull of the whale is, on the whole, Rorqual-like. It is, however, narrower anteriorly than in Rorquals, and this is accounted for on a lateral view by the fact that 
the premaxillaries are, as it were, pinched up in the middle line by the maxillaries and are quite visible from the side. In this feature, the skull of Rachianectes resembles that of right whale. In Balenoptera, those bones are hardly visible on a lateral view of the skull. In other respects, the skull of Rachianectes differs but slightly from that of Balenoptera. In the vertebral column, the atlas was missing. The remaining vertebrae are quite independent of each other, as in the rorquals, and they have the wide lateral foramina formed by the transverse processes, which is so conspicuous a feature of those vertebrae in Balenoptera and Megaptera. I counted 14 dorsal vertebrae, 14 lumbar, and 21 caudals. The ribs are also 14, and the first two are incompletely soldered together, not so completely as in the Hunterius Temenici, figured by Gray in his catalogue. The mode of fusion was different on the two sides of the body, but as this feature is probably a mere variation and not distinctive of species or of genus, it is not worthwhile to give a detailed description of the arrangement. The sternum is like that of a rorqual. It is cross-shaped, but the arms of the cross are very short, and the posterior termination is almost a fine point. The pelvis consisted of but a single bone, but a rudimentary femur may have disappeared. The one species is Rachianectus glaucus, cope, question mark, equals Agaphelus. As is the case with so many whales, this species varies somewhat in color. It varies from a mottled gray to black. The length of a full-grown example is from 40 to 44 feet, but individuals somewhat larger than this have been met with. Such individuals would yield some 20 barrels of oil, but as many as 70 barrels have been obtained from a larger specimen. The baleen reaches a length of 14 to 16 inches and is light in color, sometimes nearly white. The gray whale is limited so far as is known to the Pacific coast of North America. In the summer it is found in the Arctic regions. In the winter it descends to warmer latitudes, but does not migrate below 20 degrees north. It is essentially a coast species, frequenting shoal waters and has been observed to lie and play among the breakers in water no more than 13 feet deep. During the season of gestation, they will even lie in water of 2 feet, waiting aground until the rising tide floated them off. Alien also stated that the whales bask on the shore in the rays of the sun. The pursuit of this whale is distinctly dangerous, for the animal will, if her young be injured, pursue the boat and overturn it or stave it in with a stroke of the flukes. Apart from such danger, owing to the deliberate attacks of the whale, the whalers undergo much risk on account of the fact that the whales are pursued in shallow water which naturally gets turbid through the struggles and the rapid movements of the whale, and thus renders it difficult to see the exact position of the creature, and to escape from its rushes or strokes of its ponderous tail. The pursuit of this whale only dates from the year 1846, and from that year to 1874 or 1875, Scammon thinks that about 
10,800 must have been destroyed. Extinct Balanides There are three important facts with regard to the extinct representatives of the whalebone whales. Firstly, none are known from an earlier period than the Miocene. Secondly, the earliest forms appear to be balenopterids. And lastly, the more ancient whales are not longer than existing forms. On the contrary, this is a group which has increased considerably in size. One of the best known forms, as it is represented by a nearly complete skeleton, is the Miocene and Pliocene Plesiocetus. P. Cuvieri was a smallish whale, not more than 21 feet long, and distinctly belongs to the Balenopterid type. The chief interest attaching to this whale is the length of the frontal, so very abbreviated in other recent whales, and the share which the parietals take in the formation of the roof of the skull. In the living whalebone whales, these bones are covered in by the supraoccipital. Like the modern Balenoptera, this genus comprises both large and small species. Cope states that Plesiocetus brialmonti was some 60 feet in length. Mesoteras of Cope was thought by him to be somewhat intermediate between Balenoptera and Balena. It was the characters of the thinner whales, Balenoptera, with the narrow maxillary bones of the true Balena. It is a large species with a skull of 18 feet long, evidently so far a Balena. There is an enormous thickening of the superciliary part of the frontal bone. The existing genera are also known as fossils. End of section 14. Recording by Mike Botes. Section 15 of the Book of the Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nuria. The Book of the Whales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 8, Part 1. The Toothed Whales or Odontoceti. This group contains by far the largest number of whales. It embraces all the dolphins, sperm whales, beak whales, etc. It contrasts markedly with the Mr. Coqueti, the differences being so great that more than one naturalist, as already said, is disposed to give the two a different line of descent. The most characteristic feature of the Odon Toqueti, and the one which has given to it its name, is the possession of functional teeth. These are never totally absent in any member of this group, though they may be, as in the narwhal, among the true dolphins, and in the Siphiot whales, greatly reduced in number. Correlated with the presence of teeth is the absence of baleen. The skull is always more or less asymmetrical, and this asymmetry is often greatly exaggerated, especially in sperm whales. The maxillae overlap the frontal bones. The nasals share in the asymmetry of the skull, and one only is sometimes developed. In connection with this is the single Begin footnote, it is said to be double in the Kogiapotzi, but the left spiracle is ten times larger. End footnote, blowhole, either median in position, or sperm whale on the left side may be mentioned. The ribs have always either bony or cartilaginous sternal moieties, which articulate with the usually composite sternum. A fair number, moreover, thus articulate. The ribs too. More or fewer of them have both a capitular and a tubercular head, articulating respectively with the transverse process and with the centrum of the vertebrae. The two rami of the mandible unite by a longer or shorter, but always definite, symphysis, not a mere fibrous union, such as is met with in the whalebone whales. 
so sharply defined are the odontoceti from the mr coceti that intermediate types are so sadly to seek and both divisions in fact have each specialized on their account in the same kind of direction and parallel lines we have great-headed kitakians in both groups the cachalot responds to the right whale and there are giants and pygmies among the families of each the small kogia is a near ally of the bulky cachalot the somewhat dwarfish neobalana is not far off from the leviathan of the greenland seas there are otodonchetes without a dorsal fin and otodonchetes with that fin the rockels respond to the latter the greenland whale to the former the pectoral fin is large in megaptera and globicephalus small in neobalana and physeta the throat is grooved for extensile purposes in balaenopteridae and in the cephiidae all these are parallelisms and not evidence of affinity so at least it seems to us broadly speaking it would seem that the mr coceti were to be derived from the odontoceti and not vice versa if only on account of the teeth visible in the embryos of the toothless whales on this view we might look upon those toothed whales in which the teeth are diminishing as the nearest approach among the otodonchetes to a mr coquete in this case it is clear that the siphioids would occupy that position for it is in that group that the teeth are the poorest in their development but there is no hint in any of them of appearing whalebone neither can any other definite structures be laid hold of which support considerations derived from the dwindling teeth it seems too trivial a matter to raise the question of the nearly perfect symmetry of the skull of beradius and of the distinct lacrimal and malar bones in the siphioids as well as the right whales the fact seems to be that the meeting point between the two great divisions of the whale tribe if there is such a meeting point and the group is not diphylactic is to be sought for no nearer than the eocene period among the zeuglodons and yet there are other considerations which seem to suggest that a renewed search for affinities between the two groups among more recent forms should produce some result in contradistinction to the otodonchetes the whalebone whales are a limited group which as pointed out here page one hundred and nineteen are so closely related to one genus with another that it is really difficult to form them into more than one family this suggests a recent origin for in groups which there is a reason to regard as ancient there is often greater difference between the component genera gaps having arisen through the extinction of certain forms the problem may therefore be approached by endeavouring to ascertain which of existing otodonchetes is the older group or genus as the case may be mr lydica has recently described an exceedingly interesting fossil from the eocene of the caucasus under the name of inuropsis caucasia the scitacean is represented only by the hinder portion of a cranium and also by some fragments of jaws and several vertebrae but these remains though not abundant seem to fix the systematic position of the animal of which they give such an incomplete idea and to prove that it should be relegated as its name denotes to the neighboring of inia the freshwater dolphin of south america in this extinct animal and in pontistus of the tertiaries of argentine and the maxillary bones are more deeply excavated than in dolphins and their posterior border is squarely marked off and extends further back the lower jaw too of inorpsis seems to have been slender and to have possessed very numerous teeth as in the existing platanistidae these facts though few seem to point to the great age of whales most nearly allied to the existing platanistidae no whalebone whales do not get back so far in time it will be seen from what immediately follows that in some respect the platanistidae are the most primitive of existing otodonticus it will be seen from what immediately follows that in some respects the platanistidae are the most primitive of existing otodonchetes the mode of attachment of the ribs to the dorsal vertebrae has been used in the classification of the otodonchetes as a matter of fact there is an interesting series of modifications in these attachments which does away with any hard and fast lines of classifications 
though to some extent the groups can be defined from the facts. What we may consider in the meantime to be the typical arrangement occurs in dolphins, in Orca gladiator, for example. The first group has both capitulum and tuberculum. The former is attached to the centrum of the last cervical, the latter to the transverse process of the first dorsal vertebra. The next six ribs are similarly attached by two heads to the transverse process of each vertebra and to the centrum of the vertebra behind. The last five have but one head, the tubercular, which is of course attached to the transverse process of its vertebra. Kogia, though a sperm whale, has many definite characters, upon which we shall comment later. The first eight ribs have a double attachment, the capitulum is inserted onto the centrum of each vertebra, and the tuberculum to transverse process of vertebra behind. The next five are attached to process of centrum only, each to a longish process of the centrum. But there is no real difference from what we find in dolphins, for the process to which the last ribs are attached gradually moves down the transverse process until it comes to arise from the centrum instead of from the neural arch. Kogia belongs to the same division as Physeta. But there are apparent differences between the two whales and the fact now under consideration. The first rib has only the tubercular attachment, the next eight have the double articulation of Kogia, but the capitular head in the latter ribs of the series is partly intercentral. It articulates with both centra, the one that bears its tuberculum, and the one behind. In case of the ninth dorsal vertebra, the facet upon the centrum is raised, in the tenth it is more prominent, and the transverse process, to which the tuberculum should be attached, has become rudimentary and joins the raised facet already mentioned. But not so as to receive any part of the rib, which thus articulates only with the centrum. In the last rib, the tubercular process has entirely disappeared, and the capitular head of the now one-headed rib is alone left. The difference between Physeta and Kogia seems to be great, and as a consequence between Physeta and the dolphins. But the very interesting condition, which Sir William Flower has described in Inia, bridge over the apparent gap, and, as I shall attempt to show presently, so does Kogia. In the Inia, the first seven ribs have the usual two attachments, but the capitular head, at first intercentral, comes to be upon the same vertebra, as which bears the tubercular head. Moreover, the facet upon the centrum becomes raised. The two articular facets upon the eighth dorsal vertebra approach near together, and in the next become completely fused. Hereafter, the ribs are attached by but one head, which is really be it observed, produced by a fusion between the capitulum and the tuberculum, not by a disappearance of one or the other. Now in the Fuseta, we have a trace of this arrangement in the case of the tenth rib, for there the transverse process is still present and fuses with the central facet, though it takes no actual share in the formation of the surface for the articulation of the rib. In Kogia, the facet on the centrum of vertebra 7, and still more on vertebra 8, is a little raised, so that here is left a trace of the arrangement obtaining in Inia. In the dolphins, it has totally vanished, so that the fact that in the posterior ribs of the dolphins the tubercular head alone, and in Kogia the capitular head alone, remains is not really a fundamental difference, but only one of degree. There are two extremes united by such intermediate forms as Physeta and the Scyphioids, both springing from some such original form as is exemplified by Enya. We arrive therefore at the conclusion that the transverse process of the lumbar vertebrae of these whales are compound structures partly belonging to the neural arch and partly to the centrum, but that as a rule one of these elements preponderates or is even the one which enters into their formation. This series of facts obviously leads to the interference that in Inia we have a primitive form of otodonchete. At any rate, the different disposition of the ribs in existing otodonchetes can be derived from such original form. There are other facts which point in the same direction. Not merely is the freedom from any trace of fusion a character in which the cervical region of the vertebra column may be considered to be present primitive characters, 
for the mere freedom of these vertebrae is found in other whales both toothed and whalebone e g monodon balanoptera but the great length of this region of the body is important there is in this cetacean and in the platanista a distinct neck the atlas vertebra too is more typically mammalian looking than in other whales and the second vertebra has a better autonomic process than is found elsewhere but inia is very far from being an ideal basal form with which to commence the autodonchieta series its teeth are extremely numerous though possessing indeed an additional cusp the sternum may be like that one of the manatee but it is not typically mammalian it has been pointed out that the sirenia are not ancestral whales the reduced lumbar region is against the present view of the position of the inia there are moreover other facts which will be found referred to under the description of this whale still one cannot at any rate in the present state of our knowledge get much nearer to the basal otodonchete but this seems to bring us near to the origin of whalebone whales the most primitive type of the latter seems to be the little neobalana see page one hundred forty one but neobalana offers no hints in the structure of its skeleton of a toothed whale ancestry neither does inia or any platanistid show a leaning however slight towards neobalana it seems therefore that this question is one that will have to be deferred until we come to deal with the zuglodonts as to the origin of the remaining groups of toothed whales from the platanistidae that one does not offer so many difficulties the family itself it may be remarked is not a very natural one this comes from the fact of its age and the consequent number of extinct genera which have caused gaps sir william flower thus defined it in eighteen sixty six begin quote costal cartilages not ossified the tubercular and capitular articulations of the ribs blending together posteriorly cervical vertebra all free pterygoid bones thin not conforming in their mode of arrangement with either of the other sections jaws very long and narrow both with numerous teeth having compound fangs symphys of mandible very long exceeding half the length of the entire ramus orbit very small lacrimal bones not distinct from the jugal pectoral limbs large dorsal fin rudimentary End of quote. at the time that this was written but little of pontoporia or stenodelphus as it should really be called was known but with the exception of the vertebral characters the ossified costal cartilages and the presence of a back fin it corresponds to the definition in fact we may still fairly accept the family as does flower in his most recent expressions of opinion and as does kuckenthal in several ways pontoporia points towards the true dolphins as delphinidae of the present volume the attachment of the ribs is purely delphinoid the curious double attachments of the genera platanista and inia not being preserved there are also five lumbar vertebrae instead of the reduced lumbar region of the genus inia the prominent dorsal fin is moreover a characteristic of the dolphins as indeed of other groups all the autodonchetes have at least a trace of the elevation laterally of the maxilla this is carried to an extraordinary pitch in the full-grown male of hyperodon platanista too has a pair of thin plates which arch over the front of the head at the base of the snout which are extensions of the maxilla and may be referred to the same category this genus moreover and inia agrees with the sperm whales and the ziphioids in the permanently collagenous ribs in the dolphins the sternal ribs are ossified the length both of the lower jaws themselves and of their symphysis has led to their being described as miniatures of the lower jaw of the cachalot in fact there are many resemblances between the platanistidae and the physeteridae the connection of both seems to be plain. End of section 15. Section 16 of the Book of Whales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 8, Part 2. Family Fisateridae. This family may be thus characterized. All or most of the cervicals ankylosed. Coastal cartilages not ossified. Pterygoids thick and meeting in the middle line. Lacrimal bones distinct and large. Symphysis of mandible long. Teeth found in both jaws but those of lower jaw alone functional, often very reduced in number. Pectoral limb smallish, throat furrowed by two or more furrows. These whales form a small assemblage of forms which are again divided by Sir William Flower into the sperm whales and the ziphides. Van Beneden is in favor of uniting them rather more closely. The chief anatomical characters which ally the sperm whales to the ziphides and the fewer characters which separate them are given below on page 213. The whales of this group are for the most part, if not altogether, social, the solitary and stranded individuals being as a rule males. Probably these males are like rogue elephants, fierce bulls which have been expelled from the herd. All the members of this division of toothed whales range widely. None are really restricted in range except the Berardius. They are equally at home in the calm seas of the tropics amidst the ice flows of the north and in the stormy waters of the Antarctic Ocean. They all possess functional teeth in the lower jaw, and there only. Their food seems to be chiefly, if not invariably, cuttlefish, and this circumstance accounts for their greater abundance in the tropics, for those animals more abound in those latitudes. Van Beneden reminds us that all, or at any rate most, of the Fisateridae produce spermaceti. Originally known and once solely obtained from the sperm whale itself, the late Captain Gray commenced at one time to pursue Hyperodon for the same substance. He found it to be by no means inferior in quality to that of Fisiter and to be of the same composition. From Berardius, spermaceti has been also obtained. The grooving of the throat, which characterizes, indeed appears to be universal in these whales, may have some relation to the extensility of the gorge required by the enormous quantity of cuttlefish devoured. It may be, in fact, a structure developed by similar needs to those which have produced grooves upon the Balaenoptera, and to be therefore no evidence of affinity. Ten thousand beaks of the mollusks were obtained from the stomach of a hyperodon. We may associate the sperm whales sensu stricto in the subfamily Fisiterinae, which is quite as far as they ought to be separated from the Ziphides. This subfamily will contain two genera, vis a vis Fisiter and Kogia. These two genera agree to differ from what may be termed the Ziphinae by two characters of some little importance. These are the presence of numerous teeth in the lower jaw and the existence of only a lacrimal bone. There is at any rate only one bone, which may, of course, conceivably represent a fused lacrimal and malar. 
there are two in Ziphioids. To those two characters which Sir William Flower uses to ally the sperm whales, giant and pygmy, we may add the single lateral left blowhole. Sir R. Owen at least figures a single blowhole in Cogia simus, which is longitudinal as in Physeter, but not S shaped as in that creature. Of the two genera of Physeterines, Cogia is in many ways the least specialized form. It has the blowhole in what is, for a whale, a more normal position. We cannot, it seems reasonable to suppose, regard the terminal blowhole of the cachalot as primitive because it is so far away from the shrunken nasal bones. It must be at most a return to a primitive state of affairs. The falcate dorsal fin of Cogia may be considered in the same light and also generally the more delphinoid form of the head and body. The form of the cachalot with its disproportionate head is surely a secondary acquisition. In the skull too there are features which seem to point to the same conclusion. The elongated rostrum of the cachalot contrasts with the short snout of the pygmy sperm whale and it has been shown that the fetal cachalot is far more like the cogia. In the fetal cachalot it has been pointed out by Sir R. Owen that the lacrimal is only united to the squamoso by ligament. The bone is thus independent of the squamoso as is the case in the adult cogia. In cogia the pteroids are not so completely united in the middle line as they are in Physeter, a character in which the former genus seems to be at a lower level than Physeter. Cogia seems to have, at any rate in the species K. simus, a pair of functional teeth in the upper jaw. In Physeter there are small teeth apparently non-functional, in the upper jaw, as in Ziphites generally, there is one feature in the vertebral column which seems to point to the more basal position of Cogia in the series. The posterior dorsal vertebrae are not supported by special outgrowths of the centra to which they are attached. In Physeter, such processes exist in the case of the last two ribs as has been explained in detail already. On the whole, then, these various considerations drawn from the different organs of the body lead us to consider Cogia to be the most primitive of the sperm whales. It is the most dolphin-like of those aberrant cetacea. For this reason we shall commence the survey of the subfamily with a description of Kogia and its species. This genus, Kogia, consists of at most three species, all of which are small whales, 9 to 13 feet in length. Dorsal fin, falcate. Form, delphinoid. Cervical vertebrae, ankylosed. Juggle, not joining squamosal. Snout, short. Blowhole, at forehead. This genus of pygmy sperm whales comprises a number of varieties from very various parts of the world, which have been much divided up into species and even genera. Allowing for the present that there is but one genus, a conclusion which it will be attempted to justify later, we may begin by contrasting it with the giant sperm whale Physeter. As to outward form, the present whale has a delphinoid aspect produced by the small head and a backwardly situated blowhole, the well-developed and falcate dorsal fin, and the small size. 
a peculiarity of the genus more strongly marked than in its ally Physeter is the inferior position of the mouth. This gives to the creature, as seen in the figure of Owen, a curiously shark-like aspect. Some little time since a marine monster was stranded on the Welsh coast, and the newspapers reported that it was undecided by the local zoologists or their own reporter whether the beast was a shark or a whale. In spite of the superficial resemblance which the ventral mouth of a cogia gives it to a whale, it would be probably only a newspaper reporter who would be in doubt on the matter. The skull is short and has not the prolonged anterior portion so characteristic of the sperm whale. It is, however, very asymmetrical. The pre-maxillary bones are shorter than in Physeter and diverge anteriorly on account of the vomer. The lacrimal bone is not in contact with the squamosal. Indeed, a very considerable gap is left between the two. The cervical vertebrae are all ankylosed together. The ribs vary in number between 12 and 14. The sternum is in three pieces, and at any rate four ribs are attached to it. The scapula has not the concave outer face that it has in Physeter. The vertebrae are rather more numerous, but not much more so. The phalanges also are more numerous than are those of the manus of Physeter. The above are the principal generic characters of Kogia, and they are clearly sufficient to distinguish it generically from Physeter. But the question of species is not so easy a one to decide in view of the small amount of material that can be and has been examined. The greatest possible number is six, which, adding the recently described Kogia pozzi to those enumerated by Gill, are K. previceps, K. grey, K. macleai, K. flowery, K. simus. The latter is elevated by Gill into a distinct genus, Calignatus, on account of the form of the lower jaw mainly, and the presence of two teeth in the upper jaw, in addition to the series in the lower jaw. I believe that this is a distinct specific form from the others, but see no advantage in retaining generic rank for it. The whales of this genus are found all over the world, but especially abound in the Antarctic half of the globe. Kogia previceps of the Blainville, probably the same as Euphysitis maclei craft, has 13 pairs of ribs, teeth confined to lower jaw, 14 or 15 on each side, not long. There is a complete skeleton of this whale at the British Museum. The vertebral formula is C7, D13, L9, CA25. The first rib articulates with the last cervical vertebra and the first dorsal. There are seven pairs of ribs which have both capitulum and tuberculum. The capitulum, it may be remarked, is not situated between two adjacent centra, but is entirely confined to the vertebra lying in front of that which bears the tuberculum. I found four ribs to join the sternum. The sternum is composed of three pieces, not divided at all longitudinally. The first sternal rib articulates with the expanded front of the manubrium, which is rather cross-shaped, the two arms being anterior. The second rib is attached between the first and second pieces of the sternum, the third between this and the next, while the last 
of the sternal ribs articulates at the end of the terminal piece of the sternum. The scapula is not so high as in that of Physeter, but more fan-shaped as in the dolphins. It is not concave externally. It is practically flat. The number of phalanges is as follows. I, 2, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4, 8, V, 7. The skull appears to agree with the Blainville's figure. The V-shaped lacrimal was especially plain and characteristic as compared with Owen's figure of Physeter simus. Gray suggests that this species is perhaps the same as Euphysites maclei of Kreft. I think that this determination is correct. Kreft gives the same number of vertebrae, save for the addition of a 26 caudal, a difference obviously of no importance, but it must be admitted that the number of phalanges in the hand are not the same. But the figure illustrating this point in his whale is of a young whale, a fact which may account for some discrepancies. Koja simus, Owen, has nine teeth on each half of lower jaw, two in upper jaw. Vertebral formula C7, D14, L5, CA24 equals 50. This species, which inhabits the Indian Ocean, where it was first observed by Sir Walter Elliot, has been by Dr. Gill relegated to a distinct genus, largely on account of the peculiar swollen appearance of the mandibles. The name which he proposed for this genus is Calignatus. This does not seem to be at all necessary, as the whale is so definitely a cogia, and as the genus contains at the most so very few species. However, it seems to be a distinct species and cannot, I think, be confounded with K. Gray, with which species Dr. Gray united it. Sir R. Owen pointed out that it is even shorter snouted than that species. The outline of the occipital behind is, if anything, convex, while the same outline in K. breviceps is concave. The occipital condyle, too, stands out more in K. simus. The peculiar upturned snout suggested the name. Furthermore, the fewer teeth in the lower jaw, and perhaps the two teeth in the upper jaw, are marks of specific distinction which cannot be overlooked. As to the latter, it is possibly not a valid specific character. Physeter itself has a series of somewhat rudimentary teeth in the upper jaw, and it is therefore possible that its near ally, Kogia, has the same structural feature. However, in any case, the vertebral formula is quite different. The small number of lumbars distinguishes the present form from all others. As in K. breviceps, the first rib articulates with the last cervical, but by ligament only, and the first dorsal. After this come seven ribs, which similarly are possessed of both capitulum and tuberculum. The capitulum, it should be noted, lies between the centra and adjacent vertebrae. Four ribs reach the sternum, which is made up of three pieces, partially divided in the middle line. The phalangeal formula is as follows. I2, I5, 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, 2. Mr. Gill created a species, Kogia flowery, for a pygmy sperm whale 
from the shores of California. It was an individual of some nine feet in length, with a very low dorsal fin. Nothing of its osteology is known except a portion of the lower jaw. The teeth in this are rather long and curved back, but it would be rash to allow the species to be a certainly settled one in the absence of further information. It seems to be very doubtful whether Kogia grey can be regarded as a distinct species. It is identified by Gray with K. Simus of Owen, an identification with which I cannot agree, assuming, of course, that the description of Maclay and of Owen are to be depended upon. It seems to be much more likely that the supposed K. Gray is merely K. Breviceps. Dr. Gray made a great point of the marked ridge which divides the postnarial region of the skull, utilizing its marked or less marked character to separate the two genera, Kogia and Euphysites. The difference does not seem to exist between K. breviceps and K. grey. There might appear at first sight to be one more rib in K. grey than in K. breviceps, but that this is actually the case does not seem to be perfectly clear. After mentioning dorsal vertebrae 14, Maclay goes on to write the following effect. The first rib, etc., the seven following, etc., the next five. This looks as if 13 were the total number, as in K. breviceps. The fact that in Kogia grey the first rib is only attached to the first dorsal and not the last cervical also may be perhaps explained by the existence of a ligamentous connection and by youth. The smaller number of phalanges, too, is not a difference of importance as these bones are known to vary in other whales. A small species, Kogia potsi, has been recorded by von Haast from the shores of New Zealand, which only measured 7 feet 2 inches in total length. Its color was black with a grayish-white belly. The chief reason for distinguishing it from K. grey is the vertebral formula, C7, D12, L11, CA20. There are thus two pairs of ribs less, and besides this there are only eight chevron bones. The genus Fisiter may be thus defined. Head enormous, blowhole single on the left side, dorsal fin represented by a series of low humps, atlas separate from rest of cervicals which are fused, snout long, juggle joining squamosal. In no mammal, remarks Sir W. Flower, does the cranium depart from the ordinary type to such an extent as in the cachalot. The expansion, elongation, flattening and distortion of many of the cranial bones met with in certain degree in all cetaceans is here carried so far as to render it by no means easy, at least in the adult animal, to recognize their homologies. In the first place, the skull is enormously large in proportion to the rest of the body, larger than in any whale, and a fartiori than in any mammal. The Greenland whale does not really form an exception. It is certainly rather longer in proportion, but it is not so massive. The skull is raised into a great crest behind the vertex, being occupied by the maxilla and frontals. 
The asymmetry is chiefly shown in the pre maxillae and the nasals. The right pre maxilla is very much the larger ; the left nasal alone is present. The parietal bone, if not suppressed, is represented merely by a wedge shaped piece of the supra occipital. The orbit has unusually solid margins, more so than in any other toothed whale. This is due to the large size and solidarity of the jugal, which, however, is not as it is in the Ziphioids, divided into two pieces. The entire bone apparently represents the separate malar and lacrimal of the Ziphioids. The pterygoids meet for a considerable distance in the middle line. The vomer is entirely exposed in front of the palatines. The two rami of the lower jaw do not appear to be united at the symphysis by ankylosis. The length of the symphysis recalls the platanistidae. The vertebral formula of the sperm whale is C7, D11, L8, CA24 equals 50. The atlas alone is distinct, the other cervicals being united with each other and even sometimes with the first dorsal. In the freedom of the atlas and the fusion of the remaining six Physitor is unique among whales. Another characteristic feature of the atlas is its quadrangular outline. As to the dorsal vertebrae, 11 in number if we include the one at the end of the series, much resembling the lumbars but bearing a rudimentary rib. The first nine have somewhat rudimentary post zygapophysis, rough processes which can be hardly called articular surfaces. The pre zygapophysis are smooth surfaced. The heads for the articulation of the ribs are highly characteristic of the sperm whale and differ in detail from those of other whales. The first vertebra bears a strong transverse process of the neural arch for the articulation of the first rib, and also a small facet on the hinder edge of the centrum where articulates the head of the second rib. The eight following vertebrae have similar processes arising from their neural arches for the articulation of the tubercula of their respective ribs but the corresponding articular facets upon the centra for the capitula of the ribs are not arranged in so uniform a fashion, but vary as follows. The first four vertebrae have facets upon their centra posteriorly for the reception of the heads of ribs 2 to 5. The fifth vertebra has, in addition to the posterior facet, one small one upon the anterior edge of the centrum, so that the capitulum of the fifth rib is intercentral, articulating, as it does, with two centra. In the sixth vertebra, it is the anterior of the two centrum facets which is the larger. In the case of the next vertebra, the posterior facet is still further reduced, while the anterior facet is borne upon a tubercle. The characters of the eighth vertebra are an exaggeration of those of the seventh, and in the ninth there is no trace at all of the posterior facet. The tenth vertebra is peculiar by reason of the fact that the large tubercle which arises from the centrum and carries the capitular head of the rib, bends back above and nearly joins the transverse process of the neural arch, a canal nearly complete being formed between the two.
The rib of this vertebra is in consequence only provided with a capitulum. The last dorsal vertebra has a very long lateral process, arising from the centrum, bearing at its extremity the rudimentary eleventh rib. The transverse process has completely disappeared. The eight lumbar vertebrae are killed below. There are fourteen chevron bones. A curious matter concerning the ribs was asserted by Wall. He stated that the ribs of the left side are of larger dimensions than those of the right. The asymmetry of the head is thus alleged to be extended to the trunk. Sir W. Flower so far supported this view by stating that the total weight of the ribs of the right side was 163 pounds 9.5 ounces as against 164 pounds 5.5 ounces for those of the left side. The sternum of the cachalot is a roughly triangular bone made up of three pieces. Two of these are paired and anterior, and enclose in the dried skeleton a foramen between them. The third piece is posterior and smaller, and shows some indications of a longitudinal division into two. Four cartilaginous ribs seem to be attached to the sternum. The scapula is higher in proportion to its breadth than any other cetacean. It is remarkably concave on the outer and convex on the inner side. There are six separate carpals. If we include the pisiform and the phalangeal formula is as follows. 1, 1, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4, 4, 5, 3. End of section 16. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 17 of the Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 8, Part 3. Ambergris. Ambergris is a well-known product of this whale. Though the name has obviously no connection with this quality, ambergris is a somewhat greasy substance found floating in the sea or more generally washed ashore. It is a secretion of the intestine of the cachalot, comparable apparently to bezoar stones. The fact that the substance was found to contain the beaks of cuttlefish suggested its origin, which was confirmed by finding it actually in the alimentary canal of a cachalot. When taken from the alimentary canal, the substance is greasy and of a disagreeable smell. After exposure, it hardens and acquires its peculiar sweet, earthy odor. From certain chemical facts, it has been inferred that ambergris is a biliary concretion closely resembling cholesterol, but its appearance in the whales is pathological and not natural. For those individuals in which it is found were dead or in a sickly condition. Ambergris has been used as a medicine, even as an aphrodisiac. It is now solely used in perfumery. It is mainly used as a vehicle for various perfumes, and it's worth from 15 shilling to 25 shilling per ounce. A piece of ambergris 
has been found worth no less than 500 pounds. It weighed 130 pounds. A larger piece even than that has been stated to have been in possession of the Dutch East India Company. It weighed 982 pounds. The origin of ambergris was known more or less definitely so long ago as the middle of the 16th century. That is to say, it was known to be the product of a whale, though not known to be confined to the sperm whale. A section of Olaus Magnus, Historia de Gentibus Septentrionalibus, is headed De spermate ceti quod ambra dicitur et ejus medicinis. He describes it as found floating in the sea as being of the blue color with a whitish tinge, i.e. gray. It is held to be the sperm of the whale and is set down as an excellent remedy for syncope and epilepsy. But in 1672, the Honorable Robert Boyle transcribed the contents of a manuscript found on board a Dutch vessel, which asserted that this substance is not the scum or excrement of the whale, but issues out of the root of a tree, which tree, howsoever it stands on the land, always shoots forth its roots towards the sea, seeking the warmth of it thereby to deliver the fattest gum that comes out of it, which tree otherwise by its copious fatness might be burnt and destroyed. A curious mingling of truth with inaccuracy is shown in the views upon this substance of Sir Thomas Brown. He describes in the Philosophical Transactions, volume 13, page 193, a sperm whale cast up on the shore of Norfolk. In vain, he writes, it was to rake for ambergris in the paunch of this leviathan as Greenland discoverers, and attests of experience dictate that they sometimes swallow great lumps thereof in the sea, insufferable fetter denying that inquiry. It appears, therefore, that the author of Religio Medici knew that ambergris was found in the alimentary canal of the sperm whale, but thought that it was swallowed by the creature. From this, perhaps, we were derived two alternatives views of the nature of ambergris given in Johnson's Dictionary, edition of 1818. It is described as the excrement of birds washed off rocks and swallowed by birds or honeycombs that have fallen into the sea. Physitor macrocephalus lineus, with probable synonyms P. cotodon, Fabricius, P. gibosus, Schreber, P. trampo, Gerard, P. polyclitus, Couch, Cotodon australis, Maclei, C. Colnetti, Gray, P. Polycephus, Quay, and Gaymard, is really the only species that can be satisfactorily allowed. The above list of synonyms shows that there were held to be several species of sperm whales, but we may safely follow Sir William Flower in holding that there is but one species properly definable, which is of wide range and may be also of certain variability of outward form. The mysterious high-finned cachalot will be considered a few pages further on. This single species ranges from China to Peru. In fact, it is a denizen of all the oceans and as a rule it is found far from land, preferring the deeper waters. This whale cannot be confounded with any other. Its thick blunt head, a third of the length of the body, distinguishes it at once. 
The muzzle, however, is not so abruptly truncated as is often figured, e.g., by Scammon. It slopes forward two metres beyond the front end of the jaw. The skull, however, does not correspond in form to the head. The whole upper surface of the head is occupied by the case in which lies the spermaceti fluid during the life of the animal. The males of the whale are considerably larger than the females. The size of the former appears, however, to have been exaggerated. Bill gives from actual measurements 84 feet as the length, but Sir W. Flower thinks that this measurement and similar ones are not always trustworthy, from the fact that there is no indication whether they refer to actual length or are taken along the curves of the body. From a comparison of various skeletons of old animals, it seems that 55 feet, possibly 60, is the outside total length of a male sperm whale. The color of the whale is black, getting gray beneath. The blowhole is single and is described as being of the shape of an italic F. It is placed near the front end of the snout. Underneath the blowhole is a longitudinal groove, the nature of which is obscure. This whale has no defined dorsal fin, but a series of lowish humps, of which the first is the most prominent. The throat has two grooves like those of Ziphide's whales. The tail is very deeply cleft terminally, and one flap lies over the other. The sperm whale feeds mainly upon cuttlefish, but fishes have been found to be also eaten. It is said to feed by dropping the huge lower jaw, thereby exhibiting its polished white teeth, which attract within its reach the swimming food while the creature moves along through the ocean's depth. Its food is never apparently composed of larger creatures than bonitos and albicores, but the throat is said to be large enough to swallow a man, and naturally the cachalot has been identified with the whale of Jonah and also with the leviathan of Job. The pectoral fins are not large, measuring about six feet in a full-grown whale. The cachalot will remain under water from 50 minutes to an hour and a quarter. When it spouts, it does so for space of about three seconds, and the column of vapor ejected can be seen from the masthead at a distance of three to five miles. The spouting of the sperm whale can be readily distinguished from that of other whales from the fact that the blowhole is single and the column of breath condensed is also a single fountain, not a double jet as in other whales. Moreover, as the blowhole is situated further forward than in other whales, the jet is not directed upwards but forwards. These characters serve the spouting of a sperm whale to be clearly distinguished. This whale is intertropical in range and is only an accidental visitor to the Arctic regions. It travels in schools. When solitary individuals are seen, such as those which have been rarely cast up on our shores, they seem to be generally old males. This great sea-shouldering whale indulges in a variety of antics. It will leap completely out of the water, coming down with a heavy splash that can be seen from the masthead of a distance of 10 miles. These active leaps are said to be indulged in by the whale for the purpose of ridding itself of certain external parasites. The whale will also poke its head out of the water to look or listen, assuming then a perfectly upright position. The great strength of the whale 
is indicated by its capability of throwing itself out of the water. Mr. Aflalo relates the circumstance of having seen an individual hurl itself out three or four times running. This great strength is sometimes disastrous to the whale fishes. It has been the general belief, remarks Captain Scammon, that the sperm whale is excessively timid. But if this is the general character, there are many exceptions among the larger males, for when attacked they have in repeated instances turned upon their pursuers in the most defiant manner, and their own disfigured jaws, which are their principal weapons of defense, prove that they either engage in desperate contentions with their kind or with some unknown leviathan inhabiting the deep. Moreover, it is, we believe, a well-established fact that ships have been sunk by the deliberate assaults of vicious, grey-headed old cachalots. Captain Scammon gives several instances of such assaults. The creatures butt at the vessel with their massive forehead and have been known to stave a vessel in, but it does not always seem clear whether this is accidental or due to mere confusion on the part of the whale where is a deliberate attack. But there is one instance related where the whale attacked one after another a number of boats which had left the vessel for its capture, giving chase to each. Captain Scammon thinks that in some cases vessels which have been mysteriously lost at sea have been sunk by cachalots. The at least occasional ferocity of cachalots is emphasized by a name given to such whales. They are spoken of as eating whales. It may be that the males, as in so many other kinds of animals, fight for the females, and that the black bulk of a whaling vessel may be mistaken for one of their own kind. The solitary males, which are thus ferocious, may further be comparable to rogue elephants, driven out of the herd by their companions. A species called by Dr. Gray Physitor Tursio, and with many other names, must be mentioned as an appendix to our account of Physitor macrocephalus. Considering that there is not a bone, nor even a fragment of a bone, that can be proved to have belonged to a specimen of this gigantic animal to be seen in any museum in Europe, it may seem somewhat unnecessary to devote any space to its consideration. Yet so much has been written about this mysterious creature that it cannot be passed by in silence. The species was established on the good faith of Sibald, who was certainly accurate in his accounts of other whales. Thus, there would be a prima facie reason for accepting his dicta improbable though they may sound. This creature, according to him, is a great whale not inferior in size to the cachalot, but differing from it in the presence of a large falcate dorsal fin, and also apparently by the presence of numerous teeth in the both jaws of equal size. One view is that Sibald was deceived by a killer whale into forming this new variety. But though Orca grows to a larger size, none have been recorded of the length of over 50 feet, which is the length assigned to Physitor Tursio. The high-finned cachalot, as this dubious whale has been named, is a native of our coasts if of anywhere, and an example was stated to have been thrown ashore in Orkney in 1687. And other observers have increased the mystery by saying that it often comes ashore in those localities. 
since so good a naturalist as the late Mr. Thomas Bell admits this whale into his book of British mammals, we shall allow it a place in the present book. As to this fin, it has been described as presenting the appearance of the mast of a ship, so long and straight it is. In addition to this fin, there are said to be a few low bosses or humps. This, perhaps, is the secret of the mystery. In a stranded cachalot, which I saw at Birchington some months since it appeared to me that the commencement of the dorsal fin was rather higher than is generally represented. A little exaggeration and we have the high finned cachalot at once. As to its ferocity, etc., that is just as suitable according to many to the ordinary cachalot. La Cepede prefers to call it Fisiter mular and says that it grows to a length of 33 meters. He further remarks that it travels in herds with a leader, the largest of the gamma. This beast leads to the attack or retreat and, according to a sailor quoted by Anderson, it gives the signal by a terrible cry of which the echo travels far along the surface of the water, of victory or of precipitate fight. Under the name of Fisiter microbes, Lacepid has described a whale no doubt really identical with a cachalot, but which Dr. Gray regards as a high-finned cachalot. It is, remarks Count Lacepid, one of the largest most cruel and most dangerous inhabitants of the sea. The suggestion is made that the story of Perseus and Andromeda is based upon a ferocious cachalot and that the orca described by Ariosto, which was to devour Angelica, chained to a rock upon the coast of Brittany, is referable to this creature. There is a story told of the Emperor Claudius, who engaged in battle with his Praetorian guards, a monster of this species at the port of Ostia. It can hardly be right to refer this animal to anything but the species Physeter macrocephalus, for there is no suggestion, except by native Greenlanders, that there are teeth in the upper jaw, and probably these teeth are the rudimentary ones so common in the sperm and ziphides whales. Still, it is alleged to possess the hypothetical dorsal fin of the mysterious species to be described later. Of this whale in December 1723, 17 examples were thrown up on the shores of the Elbe. A more remarkable stranding of cachalots occurred on the coast of France in the year 1784. On the 13th of March, writes Lacepede, were seen with great surprise a quantity of fishes throwing themselves out of the water onto the shore, and a great number of purposes enter the harbour of Andierne. The 14th, at 6 o'clock in the morning, the sea was high, and the wind blew from the southwest with violence. Extraordinary bellowings were heard towards Cape Estain, which were audible in the country at a distance of more than four kilometers. Two men, who were coasting along the shore, were seized with a terror when they saw at a little distance some enormous animals, which were struggling with violence and attempted to resist the foaming waves which rolled them over and hurled them towards the shore. The fright of the spectators increased when the first of these cetaceans, struggling uselessly with the waves, were thrown on the land. The terror redoubled when they saw them followed by a very large number of these colossal and living cetaceans. There were altogether 32 of the monsters stranded on that occasion. It is a curious fact that the majority of these individuals were females. 
They had probably sought the shore for breeding purposes. This whale, as is related of so many others, is said to possess a great tenderness for its offspring. As with other whales, but one is born at a time, but occasionally there are two. Extinct Odontocetes. We shall refer here to two extinct cetaceans from the Miocene of Patagonia, of which one at any rate, Physodon, is apparently a physeterid, as to other its systematic position is not so plain. Physodon, when it is more fully known, will probably have to be placed in a distinct family, Physodontidae. The general outline of the skull is so much like that of Physeter. It is crested, as in that whale, but the rostrum is shorter, and so comes to resemble that of Kogia. As Kogia appears to be a more ancient type of Physeterid than Physeter, this likeliness is perhaps of some significance. Its most salient feature is the existence of teeth in both upper and lower jaws. In the upper there are some 22 teeth on each side and 24 on each ramus of the mandible. A noteworthy point is that some of the upper jaw teeth are implanted in the pre-maxillae. The total length of the skull is about 10 feet, so that it falls short of that of a sperm whale. Argyrocetus patagonicus is mainly known from a skull. This shows that the animals were about as big as the dolphin genus Steno. It shows several archaic characters. In the first place, the occipital condyles, whereon articulates the first vertebra, are in shape more like those of terrestrial mammals, instead of being adpressed to the skull, as in the Cetacea generally. The nasal bones, too, are large and well developed. The rostrum is long and slender. The skull generally is bilaterally symmetrical. It has been pointed out by Mr. Lydica that the fossae upon the maxillary bones are squared and flattened like those of Pontopria. As in the Platanistids, moreover, the cervical vertebrae, or at any rate cervicals, found in association with the skull, are all free and longer than is the rule among more modified cetacea. The end of the mandible is upturned, smooth and without teeth, and is unlike that of any existing cetacean. End of section 17. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 18 of the Book of Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. The Book of Wales by Frank Evers Bedard. Chapter 9, Part 1. Beaked Whales, Family, Ziphiidae. Another group is formed by the Ziphiids whales, which should perhaps be only regarded as a subfamily of Ziphiinae. The whales of this subfamily or family are of moderate size, not exceeding, so far as we know from actual measurement, a little over 30 feet. They are also fairly rare and seem for the most part to live singly, so that their bodies have been but rarely thrown up upon the shore. Moreover, they seem to be most prevalent in the southern hemisphere, hence their occurrences would be far likelier upon the great stretches of desolate coasts which abound in the southern half of the globe 
to go unnoticed. Their rarity at present contrasts with the relative abundance which one obtained on the surface of the earth. This leads, remarks Sir W. Flower, to the belief that the existing Ziphides are the survivors of an ancient family which once played a far more important part than now among the cetacean inhabitants of the ocean, but which have been gradually replaced by other forms, and are themselves probably destined ere long to share the fate of their once numerous allies or progenitors. Since the words just quoted were written in the year 1871, more has been discovered and written about this group of cetaceans, but they still remain a group or family that requires much further study before they are as well known as some other families of cetaceans. Their rarity is emphasized by the fact that almost every individual seen or captured has received a different name. Berardius is only known by three specimens, Mesoplodon grei by two or three. The late Mr. P. H. Goss thus wrote of a mysterious Delphinorhynchus equals Mesoplodon, observed by himself in the Atlantic. During my voyage to Jamaica, when in latitude 19 north and longitude from 46 to 48 west, the ship was surrounded for 17 continuous hours with a troop of whales of a species which is certainly undescribed. I had ample opportunity for examination and found that it was a Delphinorhynchus, 30 feet in length, black above and white beneath, with the swimming paws white on the under surface and isolated by the surrounding black of the upper parts, a very remarkable character. This could not have been the toothless whale of Havre, and there is no other with which it can be confounded. Here, then, in a whale of large size occurring in the great numbers in North Atlantic, which on no other occasion has fallen under scientific observation. The toothless whale of Havre, it may be remarked, named Aodon Dalei, seems to be merely a toothless, probably aged example of Mesoplodon bidens. Apart from Hyperodon, which has been long known, and which is fairly abundant, the Ziphides whales were entirely unknown to science until the beginning of the present century, and up to the year 1871 only some 30 individuals had been caught or stranded. The Ziphides whales agree in the following assemblage of characters. 1. The functional teeth are limited to one or two pairs which are only developed in the mandible. In addition to these, there are a number of small teeth in both jaws, which are not recognizable in skulls, as they come away with the gums and are hidden by them during life. 2. The skull is characterized by the marked prominence behind the nares, by an elevation of the maxillae, exceedingly developed in hyperodon, by the long rostrum, by the large solid pterygoids which meet in the middle line and by a distinct and separate malar bone. 3. The vertebrae are not more than 50 in number. Their spines in the dorsal and lumbar regions are very long. The transverse processes of the neural arches of the dorsal vertebrae as a rule cease abruptly near to the end of the series and are replaced upon the succeeding vertebrae by similar processes which arise from the bodies of the vertebrae. Hyperodon is exceptional. 4. The ribs are not more than 10 pairs. 
The sternal ribs are permanently cartilaginous. 5. The blowhole is crescentic, with the concavity forwards. 6. The pectoral fin is rounded and not large. The phalanges are not numerous. 7. There is a dorsal fin falcate in form. 8. The throat is marked by at least one pair, question mark, as to Berardius, of gular grooves similar to those of Balaenoptera and Physeter. All the Ziphide whales present these characters. They agree with the Physeterine in having no functional teeth in the upper jaw in the general form of the skull. In the characters of the transverse processes of the dorsal vertebrae, in the cartilaginous sternal ribs, and in the throat grooves. But the Ziphide whales differ from the cachalots in the fewness of their functional teeth and in the existence of a distinct malar bone. In the latter point, they agree with the Mistacoseti. It is possible that the Ziphides also agree to differ from other whales in a small character, which has been noticed at any rate in Hyperodon, in Mesoplodon, and Ziphius, by Scott and Parker. That is, in the rounded projection between the flukes of the tail. The genus Mesoplodon consists of moderately sized whales, 15 to 17 feet or so in length. Skull with mesethmoid ossified. The nasals are sunk between the upper ends of the premaxillae. Single pair of larger or smaller functional teeth in lower jaw, embedded in mandible at or near middle. Vertebral formula C7, D9 or 10, L10 or 11, CA 19 or 20 equals 46 or 48. Atlas and axis fused, sometimes also third. Sternum of four or five pieces. Eight ribs, two headed. Phalanges, one, one. Two, six, three, six, four, three, five, two. The most elaborate account of the skeleton of Mesoplodon is contained in Sir W. Flower's description of the osteology of most of the species. The skull agrees with that of Ziphius and differs from that of Hyperodon and Berardius in the thorough ossification of the mesethmoid and its coalescence with surrounding bones to form the very solid rostrum, which in the adult has a density of ivory. The tympanic bone of this genus differs from that of Ziphius in having a well-marked groove at the posterior end between the lobes. In this matter, Mesoplodon agrees with Berardius and differs from Hyperodon, which in its turn agrees with Ziphius. Ziphius and Hyperodon are nearer in this particular to Physeter and the two other Ziphied genera to the dolphins. In these beaked whales, the breadth of the base of the rostrum and the relative positions of the two foramina for the exit of the two branches of the second division of the fifth nerve offer characters which are made use of following Sir W. Flower in the characterization of the species of the genus. The maxillae have the characteristic ridges of the Ziphide whales, especially in M. hectori. The nasals are sunk between the extremities of the premaxillae. The relations of the palatines and pterygoids differ somewhat and are made use of to distinguish the species M. australis and M. densirostris. 
the vertebral formulae of several individuals are as follows : M. grayi, C. 7, D. 10, L. 11, Ca. 20 = 48, M. australis, C. 7, D. 9, L. 11, Ca. 20 = 47. M. bidens, C. 7, D. 10, L. 10, Ca. 19 = 46. Another individual of M. bidens, C. 7, D. 10, L. 9, Ca. 20 = 46. M. layardi, C. 7, D. 10, L. 10, Ca. 19 equals 46. There are thus no specific characters at all obvious to be deduced from the numbers of the vertebrae. In both M. australis and M. grayi, the atlas and axis alone were united. The least amount of union existing in any Ziphioids whale, and one of the skeletons was that of an adult animal. The same amount of union has been observed in two sp specimens of M. bidens. In M. layardi, the first three vertebrae were united, the rest free. The high spines of the dorsal and lumbar vertebrae and the absence of a slope backwards in those vertebral spines allies the present genus to Ziphius and Hyperodon and distinguishes it from Berardius. Zygopophyses extend to about the sixth vertebrae, dorsal, in M. australis, further back to the tenth in M. grayi. The lumbar vertebrae are strongly carinate below. There are eleven chevron bones judging from the presence of articular facets. The sternum has five distinct pieces in the immature M. grayi, only four in the adult M. australis. In both there are notches between the successive elements which are naturally converted into foramina. While there is great uncertainty about the species of Ziphius, more is known, thanks to the studies of Sir W. Flower, concerning the species of this genus, Mesoplodon. Eight species, at any rate, can be clearly recognized, mainly by the position and the characters of the teeth. These eight species, with their synonymi, are as follows. Mesoplodon bidens sour b equals delphinus heterodon sour biensis blainville d sour b demare delphinorhynchus micropterus cuvier mesoplodon sour biensis van beneden micropteron bidens malm awadon dale lesson. This, the first species of the genus, is Atlantic and North Sea range. It is thus to be characterized. Rostrum broad at base. No basirostral groove. Foramina for exit of two branches of second division of fifth nerve on a level. Tooth near hinder edge of mandibular Synthesis, its apex directed forwards. This species is the only one that has ever been stranded on the shores of this country, and not very many examples have been thus seen or acquired. Mr. Lydica in British Mammals in Allen's Naturalists series records ten individuals. Of these, the first is the one from which the species was originally described. It was stranded on the shores of Elgenshire 
and its skeleton is now in the Oxford Museum. The very last specimen, which the present writer had the pleasure of seeing in flesh, is now at Tring in the Honourable Walter Rothschild's Museum. This whale reaches a length of from 15 to 18 feet. A specimen of this whale was captured at Havre in August 1828 and lived for two days out of the water. It was offered soaked bread and other alimentary substances. It emitted a low cavernous sound like the lowing of a cow. This specimen had no teeth and was named in consequence Aodon. Mesoplodon europeus, Gervais, equals D. Gervaisi, de Longchamp. Rostrum broad at base, no basirotral groove. Foramina of the second division of fifth nerve, as in M. Bidens. Tooth at middle of mandibular symphysis. This species is not to be regarded as certainly distinct from the last. The only point it will be observed in the above definition relates to the position of the teeth. Dr. Gray, however, erected it into a separate genus, Neoziphius. It is based upon a single individual found floating in the sea at the entrance of the British Channel about 1840. The skull is now in the museum at Cannes. There is really nothing more to be said about this animal. Mesoplodon densirostris, Blainville. Zephyus secellensis, Gray. Rostrum narrow at base, basirostral groove present, foramina for fifth nerve one behind the other, tooth with vertical apex near hinder edge of mandibular symphysis. This species has been taken at the Seychelles, on the coast of South Africa, and at Lord Howe's Island. The species is based upon a skull and the skeleton of another animal. Mesoplodon grey, hast, rostrum narrow at base, basirostral groove present, foramina of fifth nerve, one behind the other, tooth vertical near hinder end of jaw symphysis. This whale was placed in a separate genus, Ulodon, by von Haast, on account of the fact that the upper jaw is provided, as are the jaws of other Ziphyids whales, with a row, 19 on each side, of small teeth entirely unconnected with bone and without any traces of sockets on the bone of the jaw. It is doubtful, however, whether this character can be used to distinguish a genus, since in M. bidens there are similar teeth in both jaws, and the same may be the case with other species of the genus, although there is, according to Sir W. Flower, no evidence of the presence of any such teeth in M. australis or M. hectori. In Mesoplodon australis of flower, which is the same as M. hectori in part, the rostrum is narrow at the base, basirostral groove present, foramina of the fifth nerve one behind the other, tooth near hinder edge of symphysis. This species was founded by Sir W. Flower upon a skeleton which Dr. Hector had referred to M. Hectori. It would appear from the above definition to be nearer to M. densirostris, but there are points which serve to separate it from that species. The most obvious is the fact that in M. densirostris, the palatines completely surround the anterior ends of the pterygoids. In M. australis, the former lie altogether outside the latter. 
Mesoplodon layardi, Gray, with synonyms Calidon gantheri, Gray, Dolichodon traversi, Gray, Mesoplodon flowery, Hast, is provided with a rostrum narrow at base, basirostral grooves present, two foramina of fifth nerve on a level. Tooth very large near hinder edge of mandibular symphysis. This mesoplodon is remarkable on account of the singular growth of the strap shaped teeth. These finally grow round the jaw so as to prevent their opening to the full extent. At first, this singular arrangement was naturally regarded as an abnormality but later it was found to characterize the species, which is in this peculiar feature of its organization comparable to the saber-toothed taiga. It is like the last a southern species. Mesoplodon hectori, gray, equals Berardius arnuxi, hector. Mesoplodon noxi, Hector. In this species, the rostrum is broad at the base. The basirostral grooves are absent. Foramina of fifth nerve on a level. Tooth close to apex of mandible. Of this species, Sir W. Flower wrote that it does certainly present some transitional characters between Mesoplodon and Berardius, but as it is only known by the skull of a very young animal, it is scarcely safe to decide its position, except provisionally. It is, of course, the apical position of the mandibular teeth that has led to its confusion with Berardius. Mesoplodon hasti, flower. Rostrum narrow at base. Basirostral grooves present foramina of fifth nerve one behind the other tooth very large near middle of jaw this species is only known from a rostrum and a mandible but the peculiar form triangular with a conical point and large size of teeth seem to mark it out finally there is the species mesoplodon Steinagery of true, which has an unusually large brain case, half of the length of the skull, no basirotral grooves, and the two foramina, one behind the other. This skull, which came from Bering Straits, has no lower jaw. The genus Hyperodon may be distinguished by the following features. Skull with enormous maxillary crests in adult males. Mesethmoid, not fully ossified. A single tooth on each ramus of lower jaw. Also numerous small teeth as Ziphius. Vertebral formula C7, D9, L9, CA. 18 equals 43. Cervicals fused into one mass, the last sometimes three. Sternum consisting of three pieces, the last of which is bifid posteriorly. In more than one feature, Hyperodon, of all Ziphides, comes nearest to Physeter. The great maxillary crests, figure 29, are paralleled in Physeter, where, however, owing to their relative thinness, they bound, instead of diminishing, through blocking up the cavity for the spermaceti. In the vertebral column, too, is a striking point of likeness. The first six ribs, as in the Ziphides, are two-headed, the capitular and tubercular attachments being in two successive vertebrae. 
The seventh rib, however, is exactly like the tenth rib of the Cachalot. It is attached to two processes of the seventh dorsal vertebra, which nearly join each other before they receive the rib. Physeter, therefore, in this particular, is more like Hyperodon than it is to its nearest ally, Kogia, and both genera retain a trace of the arrangement characteristic of Inia. This genus comprises apparently but two species, one with many aliases, e.g. H. Butzkoff, H. Borealis, is the northern H. rostratum, the other, which seems to be perfectly distinct, though only known from a single water and pebble-worn skull, comes from Australian seas and was described by Sir W. Flower as H. planifrons. Thus, like so many other genera of cetaceans, Hyperodon is of very wide range. Dr. Gray's species, Latifrons, made the type of a separate genus, Lagenocetus, was undoubtedly based upon an old example of Hyperodon rostratum. It has been shown that the forehead increases in squareness with the age of the animal, as the accompanying figures derived from Captain Gray's paper on the whale show. It is interesting to note that it is the males which show this peculiar form. The females nearly always remain in the condition of young males. The square appearance of the head in front is produced by an increase in thickness of the crests of the maxillae, which this whale has in common with Berardius, only more developed even in the young. End of section 18. Recording by Mike Botez.